This is Audible. Elixir of Strife Stolen Hearts Book 2 Written by Nazri Noor Narrated by John Solo 1. Leon A single bead of sweat trickled down the bridge of my nose, tickling a perfect, irritating line down to the tip. I licked my lips, waiting for it to dribble off, too tense to use my hands to move a single muscle. The wall was cold against my back, but I was sweltering. Fucking sweltering. Infiltrations weren't supposed to be this hard. The equally sweaty man panting just inches away from me was making it even harder. In more ways than one. How come I had to hold his stupid leather jacket while he pretended to be a super spy action hero? How was I supposed to focus on keeping quiet and stealthy when his biceps and delts were right there under my nose, gleaming and glazed and <laughs> bulging? Very unprofessional. Very unfair. Maximilian Drake could wear the hell out of a plain white tank top, ribbed for my pleasure, the better to hug the ridiculous curves and tight edges of his torso. I, I'd seen the man topless, and what a sight that was, but somehow the skin-tight sweatiness of Max poured into a regular old tank top seemed obscene, <laughs> pornographic. He placed a finger by his ear, indicating with some esoteric gesture I was certain he'd picked up from a movie. He pointed at me, then at his face, then down the corridor. I rolled my eyes. On my signal, he whispered, we make a move. My contrarian reflex kicked in, because half the fun of existing around Max involved annoying the living hell out of him, even in dire straits. Why, on your signal? His jaw clenched, the powerful muscle in his neck tautening with irritation. Oh, there was that, too. Part of the fun of annoying Max was how incredibly sexy he looked when he got all hot and bothered. Uh, uh, sorry, I meant angry. We could get this done in half the time if you'd just stop being such a chatterbox about it. I frowned. I'll stop bickering with you the moment you admit you don't love it so much. Fine, Leon, he said through gritted teeth. Do you want to do the honors of giving the signal? Nah, I don't really care. You go ahead and do it. Max's teeth and jaw clenched so hard that he might have been imagining chomping down on my neck. He repeated his weird finger gestures again, deeply mundane and unmagical, nothing cool like the diamond thing he did once, then took a sideward step down the hallway, back pressed against the wall. I only wished the damn place had better circulation. I mean, who the hell could work in these conditions with such a well, terrible air conditioning? Still, this wasn't so bad as far as infiltrations went. All part of being a relic finder, right? Creeping down corridors, keeping quiet and stealthy so we could slip in, retrieve the target, and slip right out again. The setting? An office in Dos Lunas. Fortunately, not one of those horrible open floor setups. This one still had actual cubicles for privacy. Perfect for us to use as cover. There, Max muttered. That must be it. A single gray filing cabinet sitting at the end of the corridor. Innocuous enough. No nearby signs of danger unless we counted the potted plant next to it. Max's diamond dust spell had frazzled the security cameras, too. We were clear to approach. I crept along slowly behind him, almost wary of how easy this all felt. He stopped just short of the metal cabinet, glancing at me with a wrinkled nose and an expression of disgust. And then it hit me. Ooh, oh God, this must be the smelliest filing cabinet in the world. And what do they file in here? Dead bodies? Feet? Max grimaced. Just shut up and open it already. You know what? I'll do it. No, no, I said, holding my hand out. Let's do this properly, keep the noise level down. What if it's old and noisy, squeaky hinges and all? We might end up alerting someone. <sighs> Good thinking. He stood back and folded his arms, watching, waiting. I fished something out of my pocket, a single brass altar bell. Not unlike the ones used in church, this differed in two ways. First, 
It was a gift, an old tool of the Alcantara witches, my many mothers. Second, there was no clapper. It kind of looked like that candle snuffer Max kept in his living room, but it still rang when I shook it, very, very faintly, like the chime was coming from another room. Silencio, I whispered, a request, a plaintive sigh. A wave of quiet magic rippled outward from the bell in my hand, the brass handle vibrating with a surge of gentle power. As a kid, I liked to use the bell to sneak snacks after midnight, the creaky hinges of the kitchen cupboard always betraying me. Mom didn't actually ever mind. She knew the growing bodies came with growling stomachs and bigger appetites. I just didn't want to wake her up. Funny how some of the Alcantara magic I learned for the sake of love sleeping salt to make her eyelids heavy when she couldn't sleep, the bell to make sure I didn't disturb her when she finally did. And now, here I was, using our proud and ancient bruja magic to deaden the potentially squeaky hinges on this alarmingly stinky filing cabinet. I clucked my tongue, pursed my lips, and risked a whistle. Nothing. The spell had worked, taking the ambient silence of the office stretching it into a pall to keep the quiet, quiet. Safely out of range of the little sphere of silence, Max grinned and clapped me on the shoulder. Nicely done, witch boy. The response I mouthed was swallowed by the magic, but he could read my lips anyway. Max frowned as my lips silently formed the shape of the words. You're welcome, rich boy, I told him. I slipped the bell back into my pocket, counting on the brief duration of the spell to cover the worst of the noise. I placed my hand on the door, steadying my breath. I pulled the cabinet open. An angry circular buzzsaw came screaming out of the cabinet, shrieking at an upward angle, flying at a slant toward the ceiling. My heart dropped into my stomach. Locks of my hair moved in the breeze that accompanied this spinning murder plate, this discus of death. Any lower and that thing could have instantly decapitated me. I covered my head and hit the floor, my reflexes and desperate self-preservation forcing my knees to fold underneath me. Strong hands were yanking me down, too. Max's hands, pulling me to the ground, tugging on the edge of my jacket. I, we could bicker all we wanted, but the boy definitely had only the best intentions in mind for me. Besides, I was reasonably sure that he'd grown quite fond of kissing me, and he couldn't very well do that if I didn't have a head anymore. Well, he could technically, but how grotesque. Metal struck stones, scraping and clanging. I shook as I turned my head. Sparks flew as the buzzsaw struck the wall, vicious teeth biting into brick before it rebounded again. Enough, Max shouted from somewhere on the ground beside me. That's enough already. I'm calling it. We're done. The air wavered, the cubicles and plain white walls of the office transforming into the brick walls of a shady but no less steaming back alley. The relatively softer generic carpet underneath melted away, revealing gritty concrete, and in place of the filing cabinet was a dumpster. Fuck's sake, I muttered, picking myself up off the ground, offering Max a helping hand. A buzzsaw and a filing cabinet? <laughs> now I've seen everything. You never know, said a voice from farther down the alley. It was Guillotina Hernandez, Max's childhood best friend and bodyguard, back from a time when he was still valued by the sinister Brillante clan. She was responsible for arming the quote-unquote filing cabinet, clearly. The rest of the illusion was generated by Roscoe Stone, one half of the team behind Unholy Grounds, what had quickly become my favorite Dos Lunas hangout. This was the same alley where Guillotina and I first met, back when she almost chopped my head off with a... bustle. <laughs> same shit, different day. Roscoe was in one of his ultra-comfy hoodie and sweatpant combos, while Guillotina wore her standard uniform of a leather jacket, fitted jeans, and combat boots. How could they dress like that without sweating their butts off? Then again, neither of them had spent the morning creeping and sneaking around an imaginary illusory office. Ross, I shouted down the alley. Serious question, why is this dumpster so damn smelly? You don't actually throw dead bodies in here, do you? Very cute, he answered, approaching us with Tina at his side. It's a hot day, okay? 
really didn't work for the simulation, unfortunately, unless you imagine the office with busted air conditioning. Max shook his head, wiping the sweat from his brow. Tell me about it. I need a drink. Damn. Why did you have to wear a leather jacket today anyway? I grumbled, handing it back to him. The implication, of course, being that he should have worn only the tank top. For my benefit, I wouldn't have had to hold it like a cheerleader with a varsity jacket while he got to play ball and show off to the rest of the school. Eh, janky metaphor, maybe, and it wasn't like we were actually dating. Wait, were we? Max grudgingly took the jacket. Hey, neither of us knew that we were going to do some weirdo mission simulation in a boiling hot back alley today. And I'd like to point out that I only took it off halfway through the infiltration. You would have been way more distracted if I was working with bare arms the entire time. Couldn't take your eyes off me. I stood there with my mouth open, unable to utter anything apart from an indignant, horrified gasp. I mean, well, he was right. But how dare he throw it in my face? Couldn't a guy objectify another guy in peace? Roscoe laughed. <laughs> Very funny, Max. And you couldn't keep your eyes off Leon either, especially when he leaned over to cast that charm on the filing cabinet. Dumpster, Gelatina corrected. Filing dumpster, and Ross is right. I was there. You kept staring at his cute little ass. I shot her an approving grin, fighting back the flush of heat threatening to turn my cheeks red. Max was checking out my butt, huh? <laughs> Couldn't blame him. Thank you, Tina, Max snapped. But we're not taking feedback from insane booby trappers right now. Who the hell puts buzzsaws in a filing cabinet? Guillotina's eyes went wide as she jabbed a finger at her chest. I would. I would put buzzsaws and razor blades in everything if I had to. You know there are even more dangerous people out there, Maximo. You're lucky the cabinet wasn't full of explosives or snakes. Snakes would be terrible. I agreed, nodding, then shaking my head. See, Max... This wouldn't be a problem if you just leverage your insanely wealthy family resources to rent us a proper office, give Roscoe some space to work out a really good obstacle course. Roscoe sniffed. An even better obstacle course, I added. Roscoe smiled. Seriously, though, I continued. The illusion was very nicely done. Would have worked really well if our pretend filing cabinet didn't turn out to be a dumpster filled with buzzsaws. You were right, Ross. This seems like a cool way to test out different infiltration scenarios. Now, if only someone could tap into their infinite riches and get us some office space, you know, even like a plain warehouse, Max stamped his foot. No, absolutely not. And I told you anyway, I don't have access to infinite riches. The family disowned me, okay? but only because I walked away first. Tina shook her head and tutted. But the Brillantes are never far behind you, Maximo. Always remember that. Always keep an eye out. He glanced over his shoulder, squinting at her. There's one right now. She sniffed. I told you how many times now? I may still work for the Brillantes here and there, but my loyalty lies with you. And yet another figure entered through the mouth of the alley, a strapping gentleman in a waistcoat, arms festooned with tattoos, a very stylish waiter, a hipster barista. Only we weren't allowed to call him that because <laughs> he'd punch us in the mouth. Johnny, Max called down the alley. Good old Johnny Slivers, come to deliver us some drinks. Oh, sure, Johnny replied, his hands decidedly and disappointingly empty. I just came out here to bring you kids some lemonade on a tray, didn't I? Get fucked, Max. I clucked my tongue as Johnny drew nearer. Gotta admit, very sad that you didn't come out here with drinkies. Not even a bottle of water. Johnny shrugged as he leaned against the brick wall. Butler service cost extra, on top of the beverages. Maybe if Maxie here would kick in some spare scratch for refreshments, eh? Ask the rich boy, which boy. Max pinched the bridge of his nose, eyes crinkled shut in frustration. I stifled a laugh. Johnny was joking, of course. It was really, really cool how the guys had basically made a spot for me in their circle of friends, down to Johnny, repeatedly calling me by that silly nickname. Truthfully, I couldn't decide if I preferred Witch Boy or Little Lion. I knew that Tiamat mainly used that second one to flatter me, 
tickling at the most impressionable parts of my lizard brain that longed for status, significance, importance. I hadn't heard it in a little while, though. No sudden visitations from the slinky dragon goddess. Maybe she only turned up in times of trouble. I wasn't sure if I was more intrigued or frightened by the possibilities. I flexed my fingers, sensing the heat of phantom flames, of the bluish-green dragon fire of Tiamat's gift. I curled my hand into a talon, grasping at... <sighs> nothing. I had to confess, I missed the surge of power. But the main reason I'm here... Johnny continued, fishing inside his pockets. Ah, oh, there they are. You left your phones with me while you did your fun little obstacle course. They wouldn't stop going off. I bet it's the Jade Spider. Max and I practically dove at Johnny. He yelped as we snatched our phones back. For all our differences and quirks, that was the thing that tied us together, this love of adventure, of discovering something new. Another infiltration, another relic to find, another heist. Okay, job. Max really didn't like the H word. My eyes scanned the Jade Spider's messages, but I found myself reading and rereading the words all over again, hardly able to absorb anything in my excitement. Another job, another adventure, which almost definitely meant more shenanigans on the way, more danger, more trouble. The very kind of thing that might rouse the curiosity of a certain goddess. And didn't she say something about introducing me to other dragons? Two. Max. A brisk, cool breeze graced my skin as I stepped out of my car. The morning had given us a rougher, warmer start, but the weather seemed to be settling in Dos Lunas, or maybe it was just the environment. The Jade Spider had asked to meet us at a plant shop of all places, but what a plant shop it was. I adjusted my sunglasses, whistling at the sight. You'd think they were selling luxury handbags out of there. Damn. Leon shut the passenger door and trotted over to join me, hand above his eyes to shield them from the sun. Super fancy for sure. Maybe they sell rare high-end plants, you know? Like, um, <laughs> you know, I've got nothing. Plants are cool, though. Wish I had the patience or the talent for taking care of them. I held back a smirk, secretly enjoying how much of a chatterbox Leon could be. It was cute how he could take an active interest in anything and everything, like so much of what we saw and did together was a new experience for him, even when it wasn't. But I didn't blame him for coming up empty on expensive plant exotica. From everything I knew of his magical heritage, his witch clan relied on ingredients and reagents that were most readily available. A kitchen knife doubled as a ritual dagger. A lump of coal could be a nondescript arcane time bomb. I don't know much about pricey plants myself, I said, leading the way to the shop. As for rare magical plants, though, that's a whole different can of worms. But first, we have to see if this place is even magical to begin with. I suppose we're about to find out. Leon kept pace with me, then nudged me with his elbow. Hey, you might want to take off the shades when we get in there. It's a little douchey, you know, walking around indoors with sunglasses on, especially since we're about to meet a client. Oh, come on, big deal. I scoffed as I folded and hung them on the opening of my shirt. It's all part of my look. You know, bad boy with a good heart. <laughs> That's funny. Tell another one. It's better when people can see your eyes. Makes you more trustworthy. And it's only polite. Trust me, I've got this down to a science. I'm incredibly charming. Why don't you just admit that you want to look at these beautiful peepers? I shoved him playfully in the shoulder, chuckling as he teetered off balance. Same way you were admiring all of that beautiful beefcake earlier. He glowered, face scrunched up, a kind of dour, pouting expression that I would love to kiss away. One of these days, Maximilian, that cockiness is going to get you into trouble. Oh, please. I ran my fingers through my hair, pushing it up and back toward the crown of my head. The only place my cockiness has gotten me is straight into your pants. Even without looking directly, I could see that Leon had gone tomato red. Furious and embarrassed. Fucking adorable. More importantly, I'd gotten the last laugh. Victory. 
Succulence was the name given to this mecca of potted plant life, this thing of air and beauty. A box made of glass and bare wood, plenty of open space, the planters and pots lovingly arranged in neat rows. A minimalist, wet dream, really. A cubicle terrarium filled with lush leaves and sunlight. Everything smelled fresh and green and vibrant. A few shoppers and staffers stood among the aisles, perusing the assortment, but none stood out as much as the jade spider herself. She could blend in among the wares if she chose, dressed in a sleek olive pant suit, her glossy black hair falling to her waist. Oh, and she was wearing a colossal pair of sunglasses, indoors, no less. I already knew that Leon wouldn't say a word against it, might even compliment her look. The dark bulbous lenses gave the jade spider the appearance of a praying mantis, waiting and hiding among the foliage for her victims. Leon, most of all, who buzzed excitedly in my ear as he pushed through the door and made a beeline for Vera. He gave her a hug, because of course he did, slickly bypassing the aura of power and excess that the jade spider wore about herself like a cloud of perfume. His candor took her by surprise, but she laughed as she patted him on the back, amused, if not impressed. <laughs> what a sweet boy you are, Leon. She reached for his hair, stroked a lock away from his brow. Now just you watch. Grumpy old Maximus here won't even greet poor old Auntie Vera with a smile. Maximus, <laughs> that was a new one. I rolled my eyes as I laid a kiss against her cheek, grumbling something predictable and indistinct. She smelled like pressed powder and blush, a familiar glamorous scent of clean cosmetics. For some reason, it reminded me of my own mother. Leon rubbed his hands together. Can't wait to see what you have in store for us, Vera. She quirked her eyebrow, a twist of a smile on her lips. We couldn't see her eyes, of course. And damn Leon for being right all the time. That only made me even more suspicious. Two unusual details here, actually. One, we hardly ever saw the jade spider in the daytime. Vera Long struck me as the type of woman who felt most at home in hotel lounges and smoky bars, back when smoking in bars was still a thing, of course. And two, actually having Vera present to mediate between finders and clients was unheard of. The spiders all had different ways of conducting their business, but they were intermediaries first and foremost. I had to imagine that it was much more efficient to have finders contact clients themselves. There had to be a catch. So kind of you to be on time, Vera said, her hands clasped in delight. I've been dying to introduce you to our client, or rather, clients. Daniel, darling. I hadn't noticed the man fussing with one of the bigger plants, a little spray bottle in his hand. A mister with a mister. <laughs> Only one mister, which immediately had me questioning Vera's statement. Didn't she say clients? The man's blonde hair fell in a soft fringe across his forehead, framing an angular face that I'd almost describe as sweet, if his features didn't seem so edgy and sharp. The blocky black glasses he wore matched the severe lines of his clothing. All black, of course, very practical, very chic. Pleasure to meet you, he said, shaking Leon's hand and then mine. His grip was firm, but his hand was as soft as his voice. I should have noticed him earlier because of the dark outfit, but something about his demeanor helped him fade into the background, a sort of quiet, nervous energy. I could say the same for the entire shop, really. I drove by this area fairly often, but I'd never noticed succulents before, almost like it had sprouted overnight. I tried not to let any of my suspicion show on my face. Better to let the client speak and fill in the details. More efficient. Very new place, succulents, Vera said, touching my arm. Very modern. But the shop, I should say, has all the makings of becoming an overnight success. Daniel set his mister down and smiled. Very kind of you, Vera. Business has been brisk, yes. Our plants are imbued with a very small amount of arcane energy designed to deliver a dose of calm to any room. A small way to improve quality of life, you know? Vera and Leon muttered approvingly, glancing around the shop at all the plants. I did the same, though I couldn't say that I felt any more serene than when I'd first walked into succulents. Good to know we were dealing with a magical client, though. That was always important to establish up front. Maybe the plants worked better in small spaces, diffusing their peacemaking vibes after being properly displayed and watered. Not unusual for enchanted items, really.
How anything from a wand to a magical ring might become more synchronized with its owner the longer it stayed in touch. But we didn't bring you here to brag about my shop's soft launch, Daniel continued. If you'll please follow me, I'd like to introduce you to my partner. Leon tagged along enthusiastically as Daniel led the way to the shop's back rooms. I walked slower, lingering so I could grill Vera for a quick minute. So just to make sure this isn't another quartz spider situation, is it? You're not withholding useful information that could get me and Leon into all sorts of trouble? Vera held a hand to her chest and gasped. Uh, how could you ask me such a thing? I told you already, you don't have to worry about that sort of business any longer. She glanced to either side, then leaned closer. But between you and me, I'm very curious about this partner. Let's just say they aren't someone you might typically meet about town. Daniel stopped short of the door, one hand on the knob as he scanned the shop, looking to either side. What was he hiding back there? Explosives? He opened the door a crack and nodded, ushering us in. No strange smells or sights, really, apart from the fact that the back room resembled more of a laboratory than a storage area. A couple of work tables with bottles bubbling merrily away, for example. Possibly an alchemical setup to help brew special fertilizers or soil treatments for Daniel's plants. A little further in, boy, these back rooms went deep. We finally reached an area that seemed to be more botanical garden than botanical shop. Seriously, practically a jungle. Ado, Daniel called out. Ado, are you in there? Our guests are here. Someone, well, nearly something, in fact, came shambling out from among the plants. A figure dressed in coarse brown robes, long white hair falling down past the shoulders. It was an old woman, sinister smile as crooked as the jagged ridges of her long fingernails. Bottles of brightly colored liquid dangled from the rope that served as her belt, among sprigs of dried herbs and bunches of dead flowers. The old woman chuckled as she shuffled closer, as if amused by some private joke. I didn't want a stereotype, but the word witch blinked on the inside of my head in flashing neon letters. So nice to meet you, Leon said, extending his hand, never missing a beat. He was right about before, boundlessly charming, <laughs> to a fault. The woman cackled in that witchy way of hers, taking Leon's hand in both of her crimson-tipped talons. Not an exaggeration either. They were blood red from the tips of the nails all the way up to her elbows. I tried not to wince when I saw her teeth similarly tipped in crimson, but the redness wasn't wet. It didn't seem like fresh blood, the ends of her teeth only resembling it in color. Everyone, Daniel said, I'd like you to meet my business partner, Adel. She specializes in the creation of truly unique flora. Very impressive work. She's quite the hag. This time I actually flinched. I knew that I was in sort of the right territory when I thought of the woman as a witch, but calling the lady a hag wasn't entirely appropriate, was it? A hagriculturist, <laughs> Daniel continued, laughing nervously, perhaps detecting the discomfort in our silence. Oh, a demon gardener, Vera swept in, gathering Edel's hands into hers. Oh, I've only heard rumors about your profession, and what an eclectic and noble one it is. The jade spider's eyes sparkled as she took it all in. I thought I saw the gleam of something eldritch and green in her pupils, almost as if she was feeding off the information, growing stronger with every new secret she consumed. No wonder she wanted to meet the client in person. Rumors and gossip really did seem to give Vera life. Literally. Adel, the agriculturist, flapped her hands and cackled again, flattered by all the attention. I used to work in one of the prime hells, but I said to myself, I said to myself, Edelweiss, you're not getting any younger. Decided to seek out greener pastures up here on the surface. Wasn't long before I met young Daniel de Lyon here. Couldn't have asked for a better partner. <laughs> and then it all clicked together. The Lyons were one of the larger arcane families, though not nearly as notorious as the others. The clan mostly stuck to research in the area of rare and exotic herbs and magical plant life, none of the thuggery that the Brillantes were known for. Of course, that didn't mean that the lions didn't have skeletons in their closets, or more appropriately, corpses under their lawns. The great families didn't rise to prominence solely on foundations of good and honest work. 
It also explained Daniel's slightly shifty nature. Almost relatable, really, living under the shadows of the names of our dynasties, even though we were just trying to do our own thing. Those insecurities never went away. I'd drive myself crazy figuring out whether my plant business was actually thriving, pun intended, because of my entrepreneurial acumen, and not just because the brand was attached to my locally famous family reputation. Also, Edelweiss and Dandelion, <laughs> a match made in heaven, or hell, as it were. She might have been a demon, but despite the little cackles and waggles of her eyebrows, I couldn't truly sense anything malicious about Adel. She was a jovial, demonic witch, as far as I could tell, just happy to be there and participate. She's taught me quite a few interesting new things, Daniel said. But now we're taking our craft to the next level. Succulence is nice and all, but what it mainly offers us is a private space to work on projects away from the prying eyes of, well, of others who might have interests in arcane gardening. Like my family, for example. Adel stepped to one side, gesturing at a plant that stood about shoulder height, little black oblongs hanging from its branches. And here it is, our budding masterpiece, the evil olive. Three pairs of eyebrows went up, me, Leon, and Vera all exchanging dubious glances. Maybe I was being too hasty when I described Edelweiss as mostly happy and inoffensive. But Daniel slipped smoothly into the conversation, chuckling anxiously. <laughs> it's only a name. Technically, it isn't evil. More of the fact that it could very well be the modern forbidden fruit, something that, when consumed, could reveal hidden stores of knowledge, cosmic truths. A supplement for secrets, Vera gasped. Brain food of the highest order. This stuff was custom made for her. I could tell from looking alone that she was beyond glad she'd bothered to roll out of bed today. Adel grunted. You're leaving out the best part. The name reads the same both ways. Evil Olive. You're absolutely right, and I apologize. Daniel reached for the olive tree, cradling its fruit gently in his hand. It's a palindrome. An evil olive remains an evil olive inspected from either end. Part of the philosophy of it all, the clarity that consuming it can provide, theoretically unlocking untold intelligence. Hold up. Leon pressed the tips of his fingers against his temples. This is breaking my brain a little bit. Daniel DeLion sighed. <sighs> yes. Sadly, that's exactly what happened when we fed one to our last intern. Three. Leon. The key to my apartment was warm in my hand from being pressed there for a good portion of the car ride home. I was squeezing it like a touchstone throughout the drive, something physical, hard, and concrete to anchor me to reality, considering the bizarre questions the concept of this witchy forbidden fruit was raising. I flinched when I laid a hand on the knob of my apartment's door, so cold in contrast to the key. I mean, I liked olives as much as the next guy, but an evil olive? Well, something that could alter my perception of reality if I happen to enjoy it as part of a nice Greek salad or as toppings on a delicious pizza? Again, Max had grumpily explained, it's not like magic mushrooms, I think. The point is, we should be focusing on what the client wants. I let myself into the apartment, immediately shot a longing look at my bed. I sure didn't wake up that morning expecting to be assigned to go hunt down some fancy bottled water. An aqueous elixir, or so the partners at Succulent said. I kicked off my shoes and stumbled over myself as I removed each of my ankle socks with only my feet. <laughs> Max hated when I did that, or so he claimed. He'd seen me do it a couple of times when I would sleep over at his place. And yes, fully sleep over, to sleep with him, in both senses of the word. We hadn't yet decided to name this thing that we were doing together, except to acknowledge that it was fun. A hell of a lot of fun. I placed my backpack on the kitchen table, sighing as I gave my arms a good stretch. Yes, my apartment was a shabby crap sack, but it was still home. I pressed two fingers against my lips, then pressed them against the framed picture of my mother on the nightstand. Hi, Mom.
I whispered, smiling. It's good to be back home. Oh, how touching. The voice came from behind me, something I'd anticipated, and yet it still sent a chill down my spine. I recovered from the initial jolt of surprise quite quickly. But then again, was I really surprised at all? I knew that the promise of danger would lure out my favorite scary sea dragon goddess. Hello, Tiamat, I said, a smile already on my face as I turned to greet her. Lovely to see you so sopping wet on my floors again. I was right about taking my socks off, after all. The goddess chuckled, skin glistening and damp, hair dripping with seawater. <laughs> I'd caution you to respect your elders, little lion, but it seems you have a habit of doing so already. I only wish my ungrateful children were as courteous. I shrugged. It's the Filipino in me kind of our thing. It really was, a whole system of showing respect to parents and grandparents, to anyone who was older. We peppered specific words in the regular conversation to indicate that, a sort of honorific. We had mano, the practice of taking an elder's hand and pressing it against your forehead, a distant analog of kissing someone on the knuckles, and seriously, the whole kit and caboodle, showing affection to the framed picture of the mom that I missed, well, <laughs> Well, that was probably more of a universal thing. Tiamat crossed her arms and grinned. Curious how you make mention of your heritage now. Because it is, in fact, relevant to our little meeting today. Do you recall when I told you that others of my kind might be interested in expressing themselves through your craft? Further candidates for the delightful art of draconic emanation. I fucking knew it. I kept my smile to myself, trying to play it cool. Brother, Tiamat whispered, waving her hand across the room. Come forth. The air, the ground, reality itself rippled, the world making way for the arrival of something great, of someone powerful. More than before, than my first meeting with Tiamat, the apartment smelled strongly of seawater, a blistering afternoon at the beach. I had no windows open, but a hot breeze blew through the room regardless, almost as warm as my morning in the alley. I swiped at my hair, wiped at beads of sweat that had already formed on my forehead. This was different. Tiamat's first visitation had been heralded by cold air. The sound of waves crashed at the very edge of my hearing, the wind whistling softly in my ears. And then he appeared, a statuesque man wielding a wicked blade, wearing a loincloth and no, well, really nothing else. Sleek black hair fell down to his shoulders, muscles bulging from training and use. I recognized this form he was wearing, the striking figure of a Philippine warrior from the olden days. This was a man who defended his land with ferocity and the sharpness of both his blade and his spirit. His loincloth shimmered like the momentary glimpse of a rainbow cast on sea spray, except it wasn't only the colors that shimmered, but the patterns as well. I recognized some of them, the signature weaves of indigenous tribes of the islands, their patterns as ancient as the hands that wove them. Oh, I know you, I breathed. Bakunawa, the sea serpent. The man's stony features broke as he offered the slightest hint of a smile. You recognize me then? Do you remember the stories? Good. I'd always been fascinated by mythology, but especially by how similar legends reverberated through cultures scattered all across the world. And think about it. Bloodsuckers everywhere. Count Dracula. Elizabeth Bathory. The Chupacabra. A vampire in every flavor. Well, everybody had their own version of flatbread. And whether it was Southeast Asia or old Scandinavia, everybody had their own sea dragons, too. That was what Tiamat and Bakunawa had in common. Bakunawa wasn't quite a god in a true sense of the word, but he was still a powerful entity in his own right, known in legends for his supposed command of storms, eclipses, 
the fury of the sea. No huge surprise then that it was Tiamat who first approached me. She knew I had a deep liking for her kind. I was a fanboy. I'd conjure a sea dragon each time I used my fear hex to scare the crap out of some hapless victim, after all. The question was, why did she hold the grudging equivalent of affection for me? I suppose this should be quite obvious, Tiamat said. But Bakunawa here has expressed much interest in, shall we say, integrating with your essence. He wishes to emanate on one or two pleasurable occasions, manifest in this reality once more. The man nodded. Not to be ridden by humans, but to ride the currents of your spirit, to feel the sting of air on my scales, feel the salt water trickle from between my talons. Oh, good, I said. More water, so like a garden hose. The room shook violently from a single stamp of Bakunawa's foot. My heart pounded as I crouched closer to the floor, scanning the room for somewhere safe to hide. But there were no signs of an actual earthquake, no shouts of alarm from my neighbors, who were uniformly very, very vocal most hours of the day. <sighs> an induced hallucination, then. Another taste of my own medicine. Illusory magic, a dose of it delivered by an actual dragon. <laughs> Touché. Still, this guy could easily break me in half and half again, knowing he was a dragon clothed in the skin of a man only supported that theory. Do not presume that seawater is my only domain, impetuous whelp. Bakunawa's features were harder, making this already intimidating man seem that much more threatening. Somehow the room seemed darker, too. You know for yourself how far my influence ranges. You know the old stories, do you not, witch boy? There was a twist of distaste to those last two words, which felt very strange to hear from him indeed, considering how my friends used it as something closer to a, a pet name, a mark of their fondness. Surely an ancient dragon of my home archipelago wasn't going to be an old-fashioned grump about my unusual arcane status, right? Come now, brother, Tiamat said, laying a hand on his shoulder. Times have changed. A witch is a witch is a witch, regardless of how the human presents itself. Why does it matter that the brujas of his line birth a brujo? I'm quite sure you'll change your mind once you've tasted the sweetness of his soul. Whoa, whoa. I held my hands up, backing away. Was that what you were doing to me, Tiamat, eating bits of my soul each time I called on you to emanate? The goddess waved her talons at me dismissively. Please, it's nothing, little lion, I assure you. Simply... A figure of speech. Trust that we are not gradually nibbling away at pieces of your soul, slowly consuming it. How utterly droll. I ruffled up my hair in frustration. Well, that doesn't reassure me at all now, does it? Bakunawa sighed. He walked closer, leaving a footprint of sand under every step. Oh, good, something else to clean up. Didn't I have a mop around here somewhere? Consider this. How does it benefit us to weaken and kill a human who has willingly presented themselves as a conduit for our power? Early man could not have traversed the oceans without a seaworthy vessel. Why would we break the best vessel we've found in a long while, knowing that the rest of our kind may still want to turn on the raft? My gut was so prepared to send me running away from all sea dragons, blaring warning sirens throughout my body. But yet again, the lure of power left me standing with my feet firmly planted on this little island that the dragons had designed for me. Were they offering me a resort vacation by the sea, or secretly planning to dump me there as a lone stranded survivor? Bakunawa was right, though. Why would they break their only boat? 
Surely there were more out there, but why ruin the one vessel they'd found who already had a grasp on magic in the first place, no matter how minuscule? And again, the promise of meeting and manifesting even more dragons. <laughs> Tiamat crossed her arms and clucked her tongue. Well, human, do you accept? The sands and the hourglass, they don't stop trickling. We don't have forever. She chuckled and shook her head. <laughs> what am I saying? Of course we do. I study the faces of the sea dragons, these immortal beings of supreme power, hidden within the flimsy skin of their near-human disguises. Of course I was going to accept... <laughs> tempting me with a figure of folklore from my own homeland, from my actual childhood. I mean, even my mother would tell me to at least consider the offer. I held out my hand. I accept. Excellent, Brujo. Bakanawa smiled, taking my hand in his own, his palm and his fingers rough, his grip strong. You will not regret it. Where our skin met? I felt a crackle of electricity, the sting of quiet lightning as his powers surged into my flesh. Oh God, he said I wouldn't regret it. <laughs> Very funny. I fell to my knees, clenching my teeth as the rage of an ocean storm poured into my soul. I forgot about this part. I completely forgot about the agony. Four. Max. I rocked on my heels as I stood in line at one of my favorite bake shops in Dos Lunas. The air is sweet with the scent of sugar and delicious bread. Closing time at Batter Up was the best. That was when they discounted most anything that hadn't sold yet. 50% off some of the city's tastiest pastries. And Maximilian Drake loved him some tasty pastries. I craned my neck, hands in my pockets, as I checked out the selection still in the display cases. Not long to go now. Just three people ahead of me. Lots of this stuff would still be great with little reheating. I could split something nice with Leon at my apartment before we ran out to scoop up the relic that the gruesome twosome at Succulents wanted. Oh, sure, the pastries weren't as fresh as they could be, but I loved a bargain. I learned that I loved them, especially after separating myself from the rest of the Brillante clan understanding that I'd need to scrimp and save where I could, no longer having access to my family's wealth. Things were better this way. I wouldn't have to answer to our elders, how they sent the younger among us to do the filthiest work, sullying our hands and our souls with blood and dirt. Even more importantly, it meant I no longer had to answer to my mother, the coldest and cruelest of them all. The Brillante family had a way of following me around like that, Granted, I'd have a better chance of avoiding run-ins if I'd only move away from Dos Lunas, but the convenience of the apartment, of having my pals at unholy grounds nearby, made that such an unpleasant option. Maybe part of me still hadn't accepted the severance completely. Plus, I never would have met Leon if I hadn't stayed in Dos Lunas. Next, said the woman behind the counter. I scratched my chin as I perused the goodies behind the glass, Funny that, because it was usually a dude handling the register around this time. No matter. I pinpointed three things I wanted by sight alone. A huge, chunky chocolate chip cookie, a lemon loaf, and some buns. Then raised my head to place my order. My finger pointed at the stuff I wanted, my face wearing an automatic smile. This, this, and uh, this, please. And can you... Oh, uh, oh no... The creature behind the counter grinned at me with rows of perfect white teeth, luscious lips painted in red lipstick, hair set in enormous, swooping waves. On the outside, she resembled someone who belonged in a beauty pageant, all smiles and big, bright eyes. On the inside, she was a swirling pit of evil. I knew, because we were related. I knew because she was my cousin. Maximo, mi primo, she squealed with exaggerated enthusiasm and volume. How long has it been since I've seen you? Not long enough, I grumbled. Hello, Davina. 
Davina Brilliante was one of the first cousins I'd met. We grew up together, but most other people would use that phrase in a more, uh, positive sense. She'd always been a bully, a girl with a mean streak, hiding the sharp edges of her terrible personality behind a beautiful face, concealing her stink in clouds of powder and perfume. That was why I never noticed the smell of brimstone until it was too late. Davina Brilliante was as human as anyone else in my large and horrible family, but anyone would be forgiven for thinking she was a demoness in disguise. Honestly, Maximo, how nice of you to come and congratulate me on the day of our grand opening. I gaped at her, stammering as I tried to formulate something to say. Sorry, wait, grand opening? This place has been around forever. Batter Up is one of my favorite... Ugh! She interrupted, flapping her hand at me, enormous jewel bangles jangling. Batter Up, what a stupid name. I took over. Now, it's part of my growing culinary empire. Ta-da! Welcome to Davina Three. I blinked, too stunned to speak. Trust Davina to destroy everything I loved. Growing up, she'd forced her grotesque culinary creations on me and the rest of our cousins. I remembered being sick for a day after eating one of her cupcakes. It was green, except there was no green food coloring in sight. It was salty and tasted faintly of soap. My stomach tangled in knots at the memory. I gazed mournfully at the treats and the display cases, reminding myself that they'd been tainted by Davina's poison. No, I was better off. My appetite vanished along with my good mood. Davina 3, I repeated. Let me guess, there's also a Davina 2. She rolled her eyes. Of course there is. Three is the bakery, two is the cafe, and the first one is the jewel in my crown, only the best Mediterranean food in all of Dos Lunas. I cocked an eyebrow. Davina won. <laughs> Don't be stupid, she snapped. She stepped back, fluffed her hair, and struck a pose. The restaurant is called Divinity, of course. Isn't that just so fitting? My lips curled back as I winced. I couldn't control what my face did around Davina, but neither did I have to. She knew how I felt about her, anyway. Couldn't blame me based on how she'd treated me growing up. Not that she cared. Let me come around and talk to you, she said, earrings and ostentatious jewelry flashing as she shimmied down the space behind the counter. You can make way for the paying customers, too. I scowled. You really, really don't have to come around, and I was totally going to pay for those, and you know that. Oh, please, primo, my treat, anything you want. I'm sure your finances are in dire straits after you walked away from the family. Demina removed her apron with one hand, snapping her fingers at the rest of the staff with the other. You, what, whatever your name is, take over. My teeth clenched. A few more people were in line behind me, and I was sure they had heard everything in our exchange. I considered warning them about eating anything that came out of Davina Brilliante's kitchens, but she was already clacking excitedly toward me on stiletto heels. It helped to imagine that they were actually the clopping of demon hooves. Davina tugged me away from the queue, then wrapped me in a too tight hug. All for show, of course, perhaps a way to demonstrate to her poor underlings that she was capable of performing human emotion. My hands hovered over her back, refusing to reciprocate. I could only hold my breath for so long, forced to inhale as she squeezed the life out of me. Powder and perfume, exactly as I imagined, and remembered. But I still knew who she was on the inside. A withered lemon dusted in fine sugar. Sour, bitter, and rotten to the core. She pulled away at last, just when I thought I was about to suffocate from a combination of lack of breath and the stifling, cloying sweetness of her perfume. Something heavily laden with roses? Definitely not an Atomica signature scent. I still hated those fuckers for lying about their limited editions, but I couldn't deny that they designed great fragrances. Oh, Maximo, she said, brushing aside a lock of my hair. Forced to stand in the breadline with the other pores.
An older woman in line threw Davina a dirty look. She didn't seem to notice. I enjoy a bargain, I said, realizing that I was doing nothing to stop that kind of talk from Davina. And I enjoy the breads here. Well, used to. She held a hand to her chest as she laughed. Come now, you're going to enjoy my new line of products so much more. Actually, I don't think I will. I shoved my hands back in my pockets, heading for the exit. Oh, come on, she said with an annoyed grunt. I poisoned you with a cupcake one time, just once. I swear it was an accident. One of the people in the queue peeled away and beat me to the exit. The door chimes jingling as he left. Davina shrugged. There's just no accounting for good taste. People don't like being poisoned, Davina. Now, if that's all, I'll just be on my way. Congrats on muscling another small business out of this neighborhood. I'm sure they had very good reasons for giving up their lease and selling their equipment to me for very, very cheap. Her heels clicked again as she trotted closer, giggling as she spoke under her breath. And what were they supposed to do when big mean men came loitering near closing time? Acquisition via intimidation. Davina had clearly thrown her personal cadre of brillante thugs at the bakery, scaring the previous owners. You never changed, I said, making for the exit once more. Her hand landed on my shoulder. I glowered at it, up into her face. She never wavered, only showing me that dazzling artificial smile. Wait a moment, Maximo. I have something you might be interested in. A job, hmm? Perfect for a finder like you. I froze in place. She had hit me right in my weakest point. Davina was an insufferable snob and an overall nasty person, but my professional curiosity took precedence over everything else. She chuckled like she knew she just gained the upper hand. <laughs> I mean, as a finder, you probably should be finding all the work that you can. I honestly don't know how you do it. Imagine leaving behind a life of luxury just so you can become a gopher for a... a what do you call your masters again? Ah, yes, a spider. My nose wrinkled. I'm not a gopher. My work is challenging and important. It's the same for all finders, and the spiders aren't our masters. They're the middlemen. We're just... we're the independent contractors. She covered her mouth, stifling a fake exaggerated yawn. Oh, my God. Next, you're going to start whining to me about your health care situation. I don't care. Listen, about that job, it's very juicy and very profitable for us both. Of course, it's going to take a strong stomach, and I have my doubts. You did leave the Brillante clan behind, and... I turned to face her, frowning so hard that it made her flinch and back up a step. Good. I had my reasons for leaving. I couldn't keep doing the shit you and the rest of the clan seemed to be so proud of. Now, tell me what the job is. I stood with my legs apart, arms crossed as I stared her down, sick of the constant snipes. Tell me, or I walk. Davina sighed. Yes, walk. Your favorite thing, it seems. Very well, then. She looked to either side, making sure that no one else was listening. I raked a hand through my hair in frustration. Seriously, with all these dramatics. Finally, she leaned in, speaking in a conspiratorial whisper. Tell me, primo. Have you heard of an evil olive? Five. Leon. At the docks, they told us, those unlikely business partners at Succulents. At the docks, we'd find a warehouse, unwarded and unguarded, at least by magical means. One of the smaller ones, best to visit by night, they said, just in case. And that was when Max and I were planning to do it anyway. We met at his apartment, just as we'd discussed, though he did seem grumpier than usual, a little hungrier, too. So much so that he'd even tucked into one of the instant ramen cups I'd left at his place. Like a toothbrush, almost. 
And yes, I'd left one of those over too. That one, Max said, his breath misting in the cold night air. He pointed at himself, then at me, then at the nondescript building that looked like it had been built into the others as an afterthought. A side office, almost. In addition. I shrugged in my own jacket against the coolness of the wall at my back, frowning at him. Ah, uh, listen, this signaling with your fingers business, is this going to be a regular thing? Because I'm going to have to unsubscribe. He scoffed. <laughs> First I've heard you complain about them. You're usually pretty happy when I finger you, positively screaming with delight even. The hot flush of my cheeks melted the chill of the night. I would have smacked him one, if it wouldn't alert the night shift workers. We'd parked a fair distance from the docks, walked the rest of the way, the better to draw the least amount of attention to ourselves. In retrospect, Roscoe's little training exercise that morning had been a good thing. He'd actually helped us prepare by recreating a non-domestic setting. I hadn't exactly done a whole ton of finding jobs, but the vast majority of them had involved infiltrating homes. My finding targets could be in the living spaces of the less magically inclined. Normal folk, like the Smiths, who didn't realize that they'd come across a bag of rare and valuable quickening sand. But it was usually modern mages who kept their valuables locked tight in their studies. For the most part, that was where these magical objects belonged. Ancient grimoires, for example, tomes of magic or books of shadows that were penned by the hands of long-dead sorcerers and witches. Once it was a feathery quill pen that never ran out of ink. Very harmless, low-grade magic, but quite convenient in stationary savings over the course of a lifetime. But this? A warehouse? First time for everything. I let Max take the lead, knowing, of course, that he wouldn't have it any other way. I crept after him as he went through a series of increasingly complicated hand gestures. Good thing he didn't actually use those in most of his magic, or he could have accidentally set off a fireball or something. He did, however, cast the one spell that definitely mattered, especially as we drew closer to our target building. Obfuscate. The air glistened and sparkled with diamond dust, this strange arcane substance that Max used as an extra layer of security for blocking out security. Well, uh, cameras, that is, and systems, something about his spell functioning as electronic chaff, creating fuzz to disrupt the sensors. We reached the door, and I reached into my pocket, ready to pull out the bell, create an isolated field of silence, bash the damn thing with a hammer, and bam, who needed a key? Except Max already had his fingers pressed to his lips, signaling yet again in this foreign, convoluted way of his. Penetrate, he whispered, a pair of crystalline slivers growing out of his wrists. With a few deft twists and slides, he had already picked the lock open. I grumbled under my breath to myself, feeling all sorts of useless, and yet so hopelessly turned on by Max's ruthless, uninterrupted... Uh, efficiency. Very conflicting. Much confusion. After you, he said, letting me enter first, which I'd consider something gentlemanly in other situations, except if this place was loaded with buzzsaw traps like the ones that Guillotina favored, I'd get my head chopped off first. Eh, no worries. If I died, I'd just come back as a vengeful specter and haunt Max's penis for the rest of his days. Too dark in here. I said, reaching into my backpack for a flashlight. I couldn't see a thing. I couldn't even see Max's face, and yet, somehow I knew he was smirking. Illuminate. Light materialized from the palm of his hand, generated by a shard of crystal no bigger than a battery. Okay, that was a new one. Very cool. The crystal levitated from his palm, hovering ahead of us like a helpful little drone. Oh, fine, beyond very cool, and no way I could tell Max that I thought that. He had a big enough head as it was. We followed the glowing crystal, our surroundings glimmering as the objects in the warehouse reflected the magical light. Perfect. We'd come to the right place. Bottles. All bottles. Skinny ones, stout ones, bottles shaped like mermaids, Grecian statues, crystal balls, rows and rows of them, the shelves stacked high all in unique designs, an endless variety, infinity captured in glass. The only common denominator? Each was partly filled with liquid, 
all in the same shade of vibrant amber. I frowned. So what exactly are we looking at here? What are these bottles even for? Max shook his head. I wish I could tell you. They're all shapes and sizes. These could be for anything. His mouth hung slightly open as he gazed around him, all the wonder of a kid in a candy store. I knew that my priority was to focus on the mission, but it was too cute a moment not to capture in my memory. He pointed at one of them, a bottle with a stout base and a stopper in the shape of a crystal ball. Like that one. They could very well be a decanter for keeping cognac, brandy, all sorts of liquor. Beautiful one, too. But that one over there, the more slender one, perfect for storing and displaying olive oil. Maybe even vinegar. I clucked my tongue, still curious over his own curiosity. How do you know all this stuff? Back home, we'd just make do with whatever was on hand. He shrugged. I grew up around this kind of thing. Mama liked to keep the good stuff in fine crystal decanters. Same goes for perfume, massage oil, whatever. I shook my head. Trust rich people to buy empty bottles to store other liquids that already came in perfectly good bottles. I liked money in the sense that they could keep me fed, in bed, and mostly alive. But it seemed to me that being actually rich only meant inventing little obstacles. Well, that and moving stuff from one place to another, whether it was money between accounts or a super yacht between two disgustingly opulent vacation beach houses, or, you know, olive oil and cognac and shit. I gestured at the bottles, the racks. And how are we so sure that none of these actually contain oil or alcohol? Max thumped himself on the chest. Call it experience pouring out and stealing my mother's good liquor and trying to replace it with colored water, mainly tea. Of course, that only worked until she tried drinking some of it. I tried not to chuckle, sparing his ego. So, Max really was a bad boy, but not really in the way I'd expected. So, theoretically, I said, peering closer at some of the smaller bottles, some of these might be used for potions too, right? He nodded. I don't see why not. They'd have to be some pretty fancy potions. Generally speaking, unless it's something extremely rare, I mainly see potions in planar bottles. Chug and chuck, you know. Alchemy was an entire art within the arcane underground. The ancient practice of distilling magic into the confines of a humble bottle. A potion to grant the ability to breathe underwater, to protect the drinker from even the hellish heat of dragon fire. With the right ingredients and the right recipe, a talented alchemist, could brew an incredible variety of powerful potions. But Max was right. Most potions were meant to be consumed shortly before their intended purpose, if used for protection or function, or shortly after something dangerous or injurious. An antidote for manticore venom, for example, or a simple potion of healing to help staunch blood loss and stitch minor wounds closed. Chug and chuck, as disposable as beer or juice or bottled coffee, most alchemists wouldn't bother prettifying their potions in snazzy bottles. It didn't make economic sense. And then it hit me. I snapped my fingers. Someone's shopping. These are all samples. They're picking favorites out of a lineup. Turning the corner, Max pursed his lips and nodded. Looks like you're right. Check these out. More bottles this time set out on what could have been a display stand, or a very fancy cocktail table. Transparent. Definitely the right height for either purpose, maybe acrylic or plexiglass. On top of it sat some of the loveliest bottles we'd seen yet, their bodies sculpted like faceted crystal, palaces with delicate towers like rare and impossible fruit. That explains why they bothered filling the bottles. It's supposed to be a showcase so the customer sees what they actually look like in use. I chewed the inside of my cheek irritably. But still no aqueous elixir in sight. The essence of purest water, or so Daniel Lyon claimed, highly coveted according to Edelweiss, even in the depths of the prime hells, and very effective when used in alchemy, they claimed. Or, in its even more obvious applications, for gardening. A little bit of this perfect liquid would go a long, long way, 
A drop added to larger quantities of regular water, enough to brew up hundreds of potions to nourish hundreds of plants. The elixir was difficult and dangerous to make, allegedly, so much so that only a few really existed in the wild at any given time, traded in secret by talented alchemists, by powerful elementals. Limited edition. Really. Again, like those perfumes were meant to be over at Atomica. Sorry, still pretty bitter over the debacle. Still no sign of the elixir. A swirling, tumultuous liquid ever turbulent, a whirlpool in a bottle. But something was happening. The bottles were shuddering right on their shelves, all along the racks. I took a beat to calm myself, measure my surroundings. This wasn't an earthquake. The ground wasn't shaking. The room wasn't swaying around us. Something was affecting the bottles and only the bottles. Oh, we should get out of here, Max muttered, his hand on my wrist. I stumbled after him, still staring at the shelves at the glass files as they shivered and rattled. Something tells me we're too late for that. Sometimes I hated being right. Every bottle in the room exploded. Hundreds of them all at once, almost musical, if it wasn't so deafening. The ones lining the shelves, those selected for display, even those inside the crates, the sound of their shattering muffled. Shards of broken glass tinkled onto the ground, the air momentarily filled with sprays of misted liquid, puffs of glittering pulverized glass. It reminded me of Max's obfuscation spell, these sprinklings of diamond dust. And yet that remembrance did nothing to pacify me. My legs shook as I followed Max unsteadily, something about the senselessness of this destruction unsettling me, though I couldn't understand why. This was bad magic. Who would be attacking an entire warehouse full of regular glass bottles? They'd have no reason to unless they knew that the aqueous elixir was among them. But why go full scorched earth? And then I realized why this bizarre nuclear option left this pit of unease in my stomach. What if someone was trying to frame us? No time for thoughts, for analysis. We turned the corner back toward the door. Fuck, straight down an aisle bordered by yet more shelves of bottles on either side, all unbroken. Let's make a run for it, Max said, tugging on my arm. I knew it was going to happen, and so did Max, but we had no choice, nowhere else to run. I took a deep breath, heart racing as I anticipated the crack of glass. The first bottle shattered. I reached deep into my psyche, pulling on the fibers of the sea dragon's presence. Emanate! Bakanawa roared from the depths of my soul, answering my plea with twin walls of water. They rushed from the ground and up to the ceiling like geysers, like a series of broken pipes pouring with such force that they blocked out both the sound and the danger of breaking glass. We stumbled out onto the docks, darted into the shadows, our clothes soaked in seawater. Well, at least we were safe. Max panted, eyes huge, as he grabbed my shoulders, examined my face. A single streak of blood dripped from a cut on his cheek. Damn it, some of the glass still got him. You're okay, he said, hands cold and wet as he ran a thumb along my jaw. Good. But since when did you know how to conjure water? And with the same spell word, too? I answered with a chuckle and a nervous shrug. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm more versatile than you think? Six. Max. Ouch. Hey, I said ouch. I winced as Leon cleaned up the cut on my cheek wouldn't sting so damn much if he didn't insist on using alcohol on it, but he wasn't taking any chances, apparently. You don't know what that brownish liquid inside those bottles was. Might have been pee. Old pee. You want old pee in your bloodstream? He shook his head, so close to my face I could feel the warmth of his breath on my skin. It smelled of rich coffee, freshly brewed after he'd insisted on a cup in my apartment. Don't be so ridiculous. It wasn't pee. Why would they have a display room with bottles full of, ouch, <laughs> fuck? Leon leaned back and gave me a sheepish smile, massaging the back of my neck to counteract the sharp pain of my wound. Sorry, sorry. 
One last check to make sure we didn't leave any glass in there. I rubbed my cheek, the one without the cut on it, throwing him an accusing glare. This would have been so much easier if you just knew how to cast a healing spell. He planted his hand on my cheek, the one without the cut on it, then pushed lightly, a gentle, painless slap. I'm a witch boy, not a wizard. If you wanted someone who could stitch you up on the fly, you should have partnered up with a healer. Do you regret partnering up with me, Alcantara? I grinned as my hand went to stroke at the invisible imprint his hand left on my skin. I sense some hesitation here. He flicked me on the nose. I yelped, then burst into laughter. It came so easily around him. Hard to resist, because he was so easy to tease. For as long as we keep it professional, he grumbled, pulling a bandage out of the first aid kit. He unwrapped it, then carefully applied the sticky bandage over my cut, a bit of his tongue hanging out of the corner of his mouth as he pressed it into place. This was all so new, having someone to pamper and fuss over me. I liked it. I liked it a lot. I hissed, one final feeble attempt to wring some sympathy out of him, possibly even some cuddles. Maybe I don't want to keep it professional. Leon's frown turned into a menacing scowl. I almost flinched, remembering the image of the illusory dragon he'd used to scare my pants off the night we first met. Stop flirting with me and give those succulents goofs a call already. Why would they give us bad intel like that? I shook my head and shrugged. We had no idea how this particular aqueous elixir's bottle was supposed to be shaped, but Daniel Lyon had been very specific about one thing. If the bottle containing the turbulent liquid was unstoppered without proper supervision, all hell would break loose. The purest essence of water behaving as only water could. Those walls of water back at the warehouse? I would have assumed that they were caused by a broken bottle of aqueous elixir if I wasn't actually standing there when Leon had conjured them himself. Again, when did he learn how to do that? And was this emanate spell word he loved so much just a catch-all for all sorts of elemental witchery? Not that I could grill him about it, now that he was all pissy over me teasing him. I could tell he liked me at least as much as I liked him. Maybe this was my way of testing the water gauging his feelings. Well, mainly I really enjoyed flirting. Didn't know I was any good at it. Couldn't get enough. I don't think it's a good time to call. I glanced at my phone, at my watch. Way past midnight. I mean, I only have Daniel's number. Who knows if agriculturists even use modern technology. You think Adel has her own phone? Oh, so now we have to wait until morning before we get any answers. Leon's feet stomped heavily as he swept cotton balls and the ripped bandage packaging off the kitchen counter, off the little towel-covered area he'd designated as a sterile space. A sort of sterile space. Good enough. Could have been an honest mistake, I said, reaching for him, pawing at thin air when he dodged out of range. Couldn't get at him from where I was sitting. I got off the kitchen stool, helping him clean up. Sometimes magical detection isn't as accurate as it can be. Or maybe they got some bad intel themselves. Guess I was just hoping it'd be a one and done. He pursed his lips and sighed, neatly folding up the first aid kit, stashing it back in its home, the drawer under the knife block. Okay, honest mistake and all. Let's pretend that's true. So why the exploding bottles? Is there an aquamancer out there somewhere on the loose? Like a water wizard? Only aquamancer I see here is you. I reached for the cupboards in the mood for a cocktail, a nightcap. Very fancy elemental magic in the Alcantara line, huh? He clucked his tongue in annoyance. <laughs> fancy, yes. Deadly, too. I held my hands up. Whoa, okay, I'll back off. Don't want to wake the dragon. Leon sniffed, turning his nose up. Best not to. He trudged over to the freezer and pulled out the pint of peanut butter fudge ice cream I kept in there for him. I loved that he felt so at home. He shot me one last glower, stuck a spoonful in his mouth, then hummed with satisfaction. Cute. I deserved a treat, too. I smacked my lips, preemptively savoring the phantom flavor of a good martini. 
My hand was already reaching for the jar of brine dollars on the counter. When I stopped, my mouth went as dry as cotton. Fine. Maybe a glass of water instead. Divina Brillante. <clears throat> it wasn't just coincidence that she wanted that evil olive, right? People talked. Magical people, especially, and magical people had many ways of listening, whether through scrying, invasive telepathy, or planting a bug. A bug, in this case, could be anything from a familiar to a mage transformed into the shape of an insect, literally a fly on the wall. But I didn't have to bring this up with Leon, did I? That would just complicate matters. We'd taken the job from succulents as a team, and that was the job we were going to finish. I didn't like the idea of working for Davina anyway. I didn't care how much she was planning to pay me. Frankly, Devalina could go to hell. I spaced out around the part where she said that stealing even a single evil olive would be enough. Something about replanting the pit, pressing the eventual harvest to make the universe's most mind-blowing citrus olive oil cake. Literally mind-blowing if Ada was telling the truth about the effects of ingesting an evil olive. As if I'd ever betray a client like that. <laughs> well, no more olives then. I was in the mood for something sweeter. Not exactly ice cream. More of the boy who was presently enjoying the ice cream, shoving it in his face in huge hunks. I intercepted his hand, took his next bite in my mouth, winced at the brain freeze, rich and chocolatey with a swirl of saltiness from the peanut butter. See, this was why I tried to avoid snacking too much. A guy could get addicted to this stuff. Leon rewarded me with a swat on the back of my hand and a possessive pout. He brandished his spoon like a dagger. My ice cream, Max. Mine. He narrowed his eyes. What's gotten into you tonight? You're a lot friskier than usual. Frisky? How? This is how I am all the time. I pinned him against the counter, an arm on either side of him, my thigh lingering dangerously between his legs. Can't a guy be grateful for some TLC? He squinted harder. That implies that any of the care I gave you was tender or loving, which it wasn't. You offered me healing and comfort and sucker, or whatever. I waggled one eyebrow. I'm especially fond of the sucker. I closed my hands around his hips, pressing our bodies together. He flinched, backed against the counter, found he had nowhere to go. My thigh brushed against the bulge in his jeans. The spoon fell from his hands, clattered on the kitchen tile. My ice cream, he breathed, his voice shifting into a moan when I ground my thigh against him again. You know, maybe you're right. I'm feeling a little friskier than usual tonight. And you're grumpier than usual. That's okay. We're allowed to have moods and feelings, right? I'd rather be honest. I leaned closer, whispering into his ear. And I'd honestly love to play with your cock right now. Leon laughed, flustered and blushing, his hand raked through his hair for whatever reason, like a last-ditch attempt to make himself look presentable, which was ridiculous because he looked delectable to me. The ice cream, he stammered. I'm gonna melt. Should put it back. I didn't move a muscle, kept him locked in my embrace. Then go ahead and put it back in the freezer. No one's stopping you. The muscles in my stomach tightened as I held in my laughter, watching him struggle and twist out of my grip. He placed a hand on my arm, pushed it out of his way. That was intentional on my part, naturally, to remind him of the parts of me that he liked best. I tilted my head, studying his ass as he shuffled with the ice cream back to the freezer, so careful not to drop his precious cargo. Even more careful not to let it melt if stuff really did get hot and heavy in the kitchen. Leon had a good point, though. Why was I so horned up over him? He ran the water, washing his hands briskly as if he'd gotten them dirty somewhere along the way. And with the rush of it into the sink, it finally hit me. 
a pale, distant echo of the roaring walls of water he had summoned back at the warehouse. Leon had saved my ass yet again. How many people had ever done that for me? Well, Galatina, of course, one or two times, especially back when we were both younger. Johnny Slivers, for sure. That was one messy bar fight. But for Leon to swoop in with a save so frequently in the little time I'd known him, nothing hotter than a guy who was so competent and confident with his magic. Nothing sexier than someone who could think so quickly on his feet. I chuckled under my breath as he gingerly wiped his hands on a paper towel, standing dutifully over the trash can. These little delaying tactics. Nothing cuter than a guy who could effortlessly blast off elemental spells and yet seemed so uncertain about his talents in the bedroom. Or the kitchen, as it were. Come here, I told him, beckoning with one hand. He frowned, but came warily closer anyway. I'm not a puppy, Max. I know you aren't, I said, planting a hand on each of his shoulders. You're much noisier than that. Very mouthy, wriggly too. What are you doing? He asked, a glimmer of anger in his eyes. But the spark of interest burned brighter. I flipped our position so his back was against the counter, fencing him in again. Stay, I commanded. He said nothing, mouth hanging open, too horny to be angry. I ran my hand down his chest, tracing the hardness of his torso through his shirt, deliberately dragging the entirety of my thumb slowly against his nipple. Leon trembled like I knew he would, the friction making him shake like a leaf, like putty under my hands, soft and pliant despite the lean muscle all over his body. This squirrely, slippery strength of his that made him faster than me, more agile, but not stronger. I trapped him against the counter again, kept him firmly in place exactly where I could see him, appraise him, give him the carnal rewards he deserved. I wanted to indulge him, spoil him silly, show him new dimensions of pleasure. Not to say that I considered him inexperienced at all. Leon could suck cock like nobody's business, hard enough to make me see the gates of heaven, the edge of the universe. Still, there was a gentle, awkward naivete to him. How eagerly he wanted to please, how fully and deeply he gave of himself. Emphasis on uh, deep. But this wasn't a time for fucking. Again, I wanted to spoil him rotten, service him with the same thought and devotion he put into servicing me. And I knew just the ticket. I pulled his shirt up, gathering it near his chest, nudging his hand to make him hold it in place. Look at that fucking body. I breathed, running my fingers along the hard ridges of his abs, his navel, those tantalizing lines at his hips that dipped under his waist. Apollo's belt, some called it. Others said it was the Adonis belt. Fucking gods and beautiful boys, right? Whatever. Leon belonged right up there with them. I traced each line with my thumb, slashing past his waistband each time in a deliberate diagonal, drawing a straight line toward his bulge. I ran my hand up and under his shirt, feeling for the planes of his chest, pinching a nipple. That fucking body, I repeated. Leon gasped, quivered. The lump in his throat bobbed as he gulped. What about it? He asked, shy, indignant, hellishly aroused, all at once. It's gorgeous. It's tight. I bent in, speaking into his ear. Made for fucking. Or being fucked. Either way. A little wine escaped past Leon's lips. I kept my smile to myself. This hardly seems fair, he protested. How come you're allowed to manhandle me? Fine. I tucked the end of my shirt under my chin, keeping it in place so he could explore me, discover me. I worked damn hard on this body, and somehow the way Leon looked at me made sure I knew that he knew it too. An intense sort of appreciation, 
his sticky, sneaky glances when I changed my clothes in front of him, when I lifted my shirt to scratch my belly, when I stretched my arms to yawn in the morning, and his eyes sleepily memorized my biceps, my chest, my shoulders. While he was distracted, fingers gliding through the divots in my chest and my stomach, I set my fingers to undoing his jeans. So easy to work with, mainly because Leon liked to wear the same style of button flies. His breathing hitched as I tugged them low enough to hang on his hips. Nearly naked would be enough. I hooked a finger under the waistband of his boxers, watching as he watched me, pulled them low. His cock flopped out, bounced once, standing erect at an incredibly vulgar angle as if in salute. I smiled back. No greater honor. I ran my thumb along the head of his cock, smearing that dollop of clear, sweet honey, growling deep in my chest when he squirmed under my touch. Leon's hips bucked forward, then back in a way, like he wasn't sure if he wanted to indulge or to restrain his urges. Very cute. So fucking cute. You can play with me too, I told him, amused at his petrification, how he might have forgotten to reciprocate. That was okay. I'd planned to make this all about him initially, but holding back was growing a lot harder as this went on. Pun intended. He swallowed, fingers fumbling, trembling as he undid my pants, freed me from my briefs. I sighed, almost groaned at the sensation of going fully, completely hard. And again, when he took me in his hand. Your hands, Leon murmured. They're so rough. I tilted my head, curious but concerned. You always say that. Am I hurting you? He shook his head hard, swallowed harder. No. I like it. Fucking love it. Almost a little too much. The flush in his cheeks, on the parts of his torso I could see, like a raised red flag of warning. He was coming. And soon, too, I pressed our foreheads together, stole a deep, ravenous kiss. And then, when he wasn't looking, I pressed our cocks together, too. Oh, Leon sputtered, pulling away from my lips. Oh, no. Oh, God. With two hands, ten fingers, I wrapped both of our cocks in that rough, red-hot embrace he seemed to like so much. Stroking, pulling grinding with my hips to add even more sensation. Of all the places I could have looked, as Leon came painfully close to climax, I somehow settled on his hands. His knuckles were white, fingernails digging into the counter. Good thing they were marble or he would have chipped the varnish clean off. Come for me, I told him. Come for me, Leon. And sweetly, meekly, Obediently came the throttled cry from his wet, wailing mouth, threads and ropes of him bursting between my fingers, spattering my crotch, my belly, my cock. I stroked more, faster, harder, coming myself, soiling and streaking his stomach. I laughed hoarsely, steadied myself with one hand against his hip. By some bizarre miracle, we'd both missed hitting anything else in the kitchen. Impressive, fantastic aim all around. He rubbed at his face, satisfied, embarrassed, stifling his laughter. Max, oh God, did I just come on your, oh no. I bit my lower lip, wiping my hand off on his stomach, savoring the rock hardness of his perfect abs. Oh, so now you're afraid of a little protein, you're going to be really pissed when I tell you my secret ingredient for overnight oats. Leon laughed fully from his throat, aghast and innocent. <laughs> Max! I waggled my eyebrows. Makes it extra creamy. You're disgusting, he said, making a face. But you love it, I said, pressing our torsos and cocks together, leaning in for a kiss. All his pretense melted away as he kissed me back, smiling against my mouth. I do, he said, without words. 
with every sweep of his tongue, every glide of his perfect lips. I genuinely thought I wanted a cocktail. I should have realized I actually wanted a serving of something sweet and pretty and warm. And I wanted seconds, too. Seven. Leon. My caramel macchiato went down smooth and sweet, as perfect as every time Mr. Johnny Slivers prepared one for me. Didn't matter if it was coffee or cocktails, Johnny just nailed it. Speaking of nails, Max had once told me that that was Johnny's actual supernatural talent, an inherent ability to conjure tiny lengths of metal. Needles, in his case, which explained the tattoos and the finely tailored clothing. Personally, I was convinced that Johnny's real gift was the mixing of supernaturally delicious beverages. Ease up on that, witch boy, Johnny said, pulling up the chair at our regular table at Unholy Grounds. The morning's barely over and you're already on your second one. I slammed my paper cup of coffee on the table dramatically, wiped my mouth with the back of my hand. I'll tell you when I've had enough barkeep, Johnny chuckled. <laughs> Very cute. No skin off my back. It's Max who has to worry about dealing with you all buzzed on caffeine and sugar. Where is he, anyway? I nodded at the sidewalk where Max was speaking to the succulents people on his phone. He strutted up and down the pavement, looking all important and cool in his leather jacket and aviator sunglasses. I'd seen the man wear practically the same thing every day since I'd met him. How did he keep it so tight and sexy every time? Johnny grimaced. You boys have every right to be pissed. I hope your clients aren't leading you wrong. Wouldn't be the first time a client fucked up in a way that would put their finders in danger. A stack of books smashed onto the table, dropped there by a slightly winded Roscoe Stone. There, it was rough as hell, but I dug up everything I could find about the aqueous elixir. It's not much, but it should help. Wow, I breathed, leaning closer. Where do you even get these, Ross? <laughs> That's amazing. Small collection I keep at home, he said proudly, nudging his glasses up his nose. This adorable nerd. I ran my fingers along the spines of the books, some written in glyphs and languages I'd never seen before. He swatted my hand away. I drew it back like I was burned, looking up at him reproachfully. Sorry, he explained, pointing out two of the books. That one bites. And that one can suck you into the pages, depending on its mood. The legs of my chair scraped against the floor as I backed all the way up. You see what I have to put up with? Johnny clucked his tongue. I'm relaxing at home, pick the wrong book to read, and I could get trapped in some alternate dimension full of tentacles and razor blades. Ross took his seat at the table, but not before planting a kiss on Johnny's cheek. Sweetie, you know you have nothing to worry about. You don't read. He turned to me, smirking. I'm not sure he even can. Johnny scowled. You see what I have to put up with. Okay, Max said, pulling off his sunglasses as he strode toward us. The good news is Dandy Lion isn't trying to screw us. Not that he knows of. Last he heard, that was the correct warehouse, and the aqueous elixir was supposed to be in it. The bad news? All of the above. It's probably still in there. I thumped a hand on the table. Uh, how do we know that? Isn't that stuff supposed to be volatile? We would have known if the bottle broke and let out the elixir. See, that's the problem. Ross pulled out one of his books, opening it to a page with a very realistic drawing of an elaborate glass file. The turbulent nature of the essence means that the bottle itself must be extremely sturdy. Whatever caused all those detonations at the warehouse... It must not have affected the elixir. But we couldn't have stayed, I said, reaching for my coffee again in need of caramel and comfort. All the bottles exploding? I mean, sorry, but something truly fucked up was going on. I could feel it in my gut. Max nodded firmly. I believe you. I wasn't expecting that from him at all. But it mattered. Something warm glowed in my belly. And it wasn't just the macchiato, either. This does present a very unhappy possibility, though, Max continued. Someone else was there that night. Someone who wanted the elixir for themselves. 
They knew that the bottle would survive whatever kind of magic they used to destroy all the other glass in that warehouse. Which is obscure knowledge in itself, Roscoe said, jabbing his finger at the open pages of his book. See? Says so right here. Johnny patted the back of his hand. Yes, yes, sweetie, we're very proud of you. I thought that Roscoe might consider that sort of thing patronizing. Instead, he leaned back in his chair with a satisfied smile. A happy puppy. I bit on my lower lip, trying not to chuckle. That's the thing, Max said. Neither of our clients said anything about a super strong bottle. And we do have one issue. Since we didn't snatch this particular elixir, uh, Leon, you're not going to like this. I blinked at him, then felt my insides collapsing. Oh, man, no way. Are we fired? Are they threatening to cut our pay? The second thing. We're only lucky that there's another aqueous elixir in town. Allegedly. Daniel just needs a little time to pinpoint its location. Said something about hearing it on the grapevine. Johnny tipped back his last mouthful of coffee, hot and black, and grimaced as he swallowed it down. Heard about that. Druids and elementalists and the like, especially the ones who like earth magic. Might be an actual grapevine out there. Max nodded. Kind of like how the spiders have their own information network. I've heard some of them call it a web. I cocked an eyebrow. Is it worldwide? Max stared at me blankly. You know, like a worldwide web? The internet? You know what? Never mind. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, that's funny. And yeah, I'm sure they have an international spider network too, but... What good are we as finders if we can't even sort out a measly local job? Ross leaned his cheek on his knuckles, grinning loosely as he rested his elbow on the table. Are you saying that you're planning to take your enterprise international, Maxie? He shrugged. Who knows? But I didn't say that anyway, even though it would be super cool. Johnny shook his head. You hear that, witch boy? Rich boy over here is already thinking about scaling up his business, like he needs the money. But I do, Max said, grumbling under his breath. I reached across the table to squeeze his hand, trying my best to be sympathetic to the poor little rich kid with the thousand count thread sheets and a bathroom that almost certainly didn't have black mold in it. He smiled back. I liked seeing the softer, sweeter side of him. It still didn't explain why he was so alarmingly gabby in his kitchen last night, but hmm, who was I to complain? This scorchingly hot man wanted a piece of me. Several pieces. Best to roll with it, right? We'll be more prepared for the next one, I told him. I'm sure of it. I wish the Jade Spider could have given us a heads up about this bottle business, though. The spiders try not to make a habit of withholding useful information from their finders, I think. Roscoe closed his book, then lovingly ran his hand along the cover. It's just as likely that Vera simply doesn't have a library as robust as mine. I tipped back the rest of my coffee to hide my reaction. Easy for Roscoe to say when the Jade Spider had done exactly that on our last job, holding back what she knew about the Quartz Spider and how he liked to abuse his access to their information network. No news on that, actually. Still at large, I had to assume... It wasn't like I was subscribed to the Mask Newsletter, not that I even knew if they had one, but Brendan Shum, the quartz spider, had expended his supply of quickening sand during our fight. We just had to believe that it was too rare for him to find more. Johnny wrapped his knuckles on the table. Guess there's nothing for it, then. You boys are stuck sitting around until your client points you elsewhere. Maxie, want to help me pick out a playlist? Nothing better to do. He mumbled, following Johnny into the cafe's back room. I stayed in my seat, twiddling my thumbs, wanting to pour over Roscoe's collection, but also completely terrified of having my soul sucked into an ancient, possibly angry, magical book. I opened my mouth, meaning to ask if any of them were actually safe for perusal, when the front door burst open. Guillotina, I called out. Over here, good to see you. She stalked toward our table, face like thunder, then slammed both her hands on the surface. Roscoe and I jumped. Maximo, where is Maximo? We need to talk. Eight. 
Max. I joined Johnny in his back office, nodding approvingly at all the concert and band posters decorating the walls. We went to some of these together, got into fights at them together too. Against other people, of course. Johnny and I had always gotten along great, but especially over music. Kind of cute how he still wanted my input on stuff like this. Time was when we'd hang out in my room back at Casa Brillante, kicking back and listening to records. We each still kept our collections, but these days it was way more convenient to just build a playlist straight from a computer. That one, I said, pointing over his shoulder at his monitor, his hair smelling of his favorite pomade, the little space between his tangy with the scent of his aftershave. Man, Johnny was so cool like that. Vintage and yet modern in all the right ways. The catch was, I could never tell him that. Very uncool to tell cool people how cool they were. Cool people would know. He turned over his shoulder, frowning. Do you see the title I typed in? Global Beats? No, no classic rock for this one, Max. I flinched away when the door slammed open, hands dropping to my waist, prepared to conjure a pair of diamond daggers. It'd be better if I could figure out how to fire them as projectiles, make myself even more useful in a fight. So far, all I'd gotten them to do was manifest, then fall limply to the floor. Tina, I barked, relaxing when I saw her silhouette and her wild waves of hair filling the doorframe. What did I say about bursting into rooms like that? She jabbed her finger at me, half a room away, yet I could imagine the tip of her nail digging into my skin. Okay, but this is important. Slivers, out. Johnny scoffed. Throwing me out of my own office, Hernandez? I don't think so. He folded his hands behind his head and kicked his heels up on his desk, his swivel chair making a tiny squeak of protest. Whatever you need to say to Maxie, you can say in front of me. Right, Max? I shrugged. I mean, unless it's to tell me Mama is dead, but still, we're good enough friends that I wouldn't mind if... Oh my God. Tina. Is Mama dead? That's not it she snarled, fixing Johnny with a death glare, rolling her eyes when she realized he wouldn't budge. She pulled the door closed behind her, stalking toward us. She placed her hands on the desk, leaning in to whisper, I heard you had a run-in with Davina Brillante. I chuckled with relief. <laughs> Is that all? Yeah, I did run into her. She bought out my favorite bakery. Batter up, remember? Great croissants, great danishes. You guys have tasted them. I bring them over all the time. Oh, I remember, Johnny said, grumbling to himself. Bringing over those annoyingly superior pastries when we serve perfectly decent, lukewarm, day-old baked goods here, too. They're not even stale. Mostly. Without answering or looking, I shoved Johnny's shoes off his own desk. He stumbled as he righted himself in his chair, cursing under his breath. Gilatina brought her fist down on the table. They made the best cake donuts in town. I would kill for those crawlers. Divina Brillante will pay for this. Whoa, okay. I held my hands up to pacify her, only because I knew that some part of her was serious about that. It's okay. The owners will probably find somewhere else to open up, and we'll have our crawlers and croissants like we used to. No sweat. But I should have been more vigilant. Tina swept a tumble of curls out of her face, regaining her composure. I should have warned you that she was back in town, though you might have noticed yourself. The wind is colder. The bird song is not as beautiful. Where Divina Brillante goes, vultures follow. Hang on, I haven't been noticing any of... Oh, Johnny quirked an eyebrow as he glanced between the two of us. Oh, we hate this person. Got it, noted. Tina sneered. Davina Brillante is a viper in human skin, so evil and repugnant that even demons would run screaming from the very sight of her. I snorted. <laughs> Davina Brillante is a mean, bitter woman who takes pleasure in the pain of others. Flowers wilt when she enters a room. Tina leaned even further across the table, so much so that Johnny backed into his own chair. Every time Davina Brillante laughs, an angel dies. 
Tavina Brillante is someone who has accomplished little if not for the money she siphons out of the clan elders, and for the longest time, we thought she was happy going on her international gourmet tour. When Tina made the air quotes, I could just as well imagine her using those same fingers to scratch Davina's eyes out. I'd somehow forgotten that she'd gone on some harebrained expedition around the world. To taste it, she said. To taste the world. I could vaguely remember wishing she would swallow actual rocks. I heard that some animals would do it to aid digestion. Why not Davina? And now she's back, I said. But again, nothing to worry about. We had our usual back and forth, nothing major to report. It's very sweet that you're so worried about me. She stamped her foot, straightened her posture. It's my job, after all. I'm just looking out for your well-being. Well, my being is doing just fine, Tina. Thanks for your concern. <laughs> Seriously, I appreciate it. There was one thing she wanted from me, though. She wants me to steal something from my client. The exact client Leon and I are working for right now. Johnny grimaced. You're not going to do it, are you? Of course not. I tugged on my jacket, frowning. I'm offended you'd even think that. And for Davina, of all people? I'd caution you to be on your guard. Tina glanced to either side, as if double-checking the door in the window. You know how Davina acts when she doesn't get what she wants. Next step is to ask Daddy to do it for her. Fuck, oh fuck, you're so right. I squeezed the bridge of my nose. I wonder if I should warn the people at Succulents. How Davina even knew the evil Olive existed was anyone's guess, but most anyone would talk when presented with the right kind of money. Johnny patted me on the arm. Keep it quiet for now. No sense scaring your client if nothing's gone awry just yet. If this Davina person is as nasty as you've described, she won't go down quietly. You'll know if you need to play bodyguard. Excellent point. I clapped him on the shoulder. I knew there was a reason I kept you around, Johnny. He swatted my hand off, then beckoned for both me and Tina to help him finish that damn playlist. I lingered for a couple more minutes, at least until the two of them started passionately arguing about whether the playlist really needed another eight-minute Indian drum solo. I headed to the kitchen and packed up the garbage, pretty much full and almost overflowing, wanting to make myself useful. I gave Leon a quick, playful peck on the cheek, which was met with a wrinkled nose and a confused, Why are you so stinky, Max? Roscoe laughed and called out after me. You're a sweetheart, Maxie. Thanks for taking out the garbage. I wonder how you managed to fit Johnny in there. I shook my head and chuckled, waving over my shoulder as I exited through the back of the cafe. Good thing the place was empty. I wouldn't have to negotiate around any poor customers. I hucked the bag into the dumpster, relishing the satisfying clang as it hit the bottom, then turned to re-enter the cafe. A man stood in the way, a man wearing a white mask. Oh, great. I crossed my arms and cocked an eyebrow. This again. The nameless mask blinked, then offered me his too perfect smile. Greetings, Mr. Drake, or should I say... Mr. Brilliante. I wished I could cross my arms all over again. All I could really do was scowl harder at the slits in the man's mask, at the holes where his eyes glimmered, watching, taunting me. Could we not make a habit of calling me that? There's a reason I go by Maximilian Drake these days. Oh, but of course, the mask said. Far be it from me to deny someone the basic courtesy of using their preferred name. It's just that, well, your past is catching up with you these days, isn't it? At least your family is. The Brillantes will always be a pain in my ass for as long as I stay in Dos Lunas. That's all I'm willing to say on the matter. Is there anything you actually wanted to discuss with me, or did you just miss my face? Without words, I knew the mask was questioning why I didn't simply skip town. But he said nothing, only stared at me and grinned. Perfect eyes and perfect teeth. I hated that. I hated how much their organization knew about me, about everyone in the arcane underground. There is, in fact, something I wanted to ask you about. 
The mask raised his hand to his face, a pale glow appearing in his palm as he summoned his spiritual computer screen. Ah, here it is. There was a disturbance at the docks last night, something to do with the near simultaneous breakage of goodness of an entire warehouse's stock of glass bottles. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that now, would you? He had that information loaded and waiting on the end of his forked tongue. He didn't need to consult his stupid little palm screen at all. Just another delaying tactic. Another way to waste my time. The other possibility was that Mr. Mask here was a very lonely man, and this was all the social interaction he was getting for the day. Still didn't make me feel any better about taking his bullshit. Jerk. Lonely, friendless jerk. Okay, maybe that was too mean. We were there for a client. I began rubbing the back of my neck as I recounted to the best of my ability. I told him everything, start to finish, because I knew our case was clean. We had nothing to do with the bottles breaking. He nodded. I see. According to our files, some sort of tremor seized the building. But not an earthquake, I corrected. Only the bottles were shaking, some kind of vibration in the warehouse. The mask smiled, but this time I could see malice dripping like venom from his teeth. And you don't suppose that these vibrations had anything to do with the dragons that your, uh, partner is capable of conjuring? My forehead wrinkled, my face caving inward beyond my control. But no, I've only ever seen him do it once, and that was to terrify me back before we started working with each other. The dragons are just illusions. Curious, most curious. Then would you consider this an illusion as well, Mr. Drake? The mask held his hand flat above the crown of his head, then swept it down his body so quickly I didn't even realize that most of him had vanished. Most of him. Only his mask remained. A hovering crescent moon, an infuriating Cheshire smile. And then that disappeared too. No, I muttered to myself, alone in the alley once more. That wasn't an illusion. That's just how you teleport. So what did he really mean about Leon and his dragons? Nine. Leon. I knelt on the ground, lurking in the darkness of a great, hulking building. A warehouse, to be specific. Waves lapped at the jetty, gentle and soothing by night. The scent of salt water tickled and stung at my nostrils, a slow breeze. The docks were still. The docks were quiet. But my heart was racing. By all accounts, this was a terrible idea. Monstrously terrible. What kind of genius would go back to the scene of a crime? Not that there was any crime committed back at the bottle warehouse. Well, if you didn't count Max picking the locks and letting us in. But the broken bottle's not our fault. Still, I had to know. What if Roscoe was right? What if that stupid aqueous elixir was still inside the warehouse, sitting pretty and perfect and unblemished and unbroken because its structurally superior bottle was supposed to be all sorts of impervious to magic? And what kind of magic did they even use to explode the warehouse anyway? They, being this faceless, nebulous piece of crap who had to go and sabotage our first run at the elixir, had to be an aquamancer. Lame. I couldn't imagine dedicating my life to the study and arcane use of water, of all things. Have some respect, said a voice in the back of my head. Do not underestimate the power of water. Pipe down back there. I frowned into the darkness. Bakanawa, is that you? Do you always listen to my thoughts? He harumphed, exactly as I imagined an ancient dragon would. <laughs> Only when you say patently false things about water and the wonders and terrors it brings, it offers nourishment and vitality to every life form on this pitiful planet of yours, but it can also bring Floods, drown cities, crumble mountains. Over a long period of time, I said, holding up a finger, putting it down again. I was losing it, talking to an actual voice inside my head. 
It's a universal solvent or whatever, but that still takes time. Bakunawa grunted. You weren't complaining when I sent those walls of water to save you. I rolled my eyes. Okay, fine. Thank you for saving my hide, but especially Max's hide. I really am grateful, actually. I didn't even specify, and you offered protection anyway. After a moment's pause, he answered. Well, I like your tone much better now. You're welcome, Rujo. Now, why are we here, and what are we hoping to accomplish? Honestly? My fingers dug into smooth cement, my nails picking up grit. I have no idea. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be here. You really shouldn't. A voice growled from beside my head. A hand clapped over my mouth, the other arm restraining me by the chest. I struggled, kicked, until I recognized the voice. Calm down, Leon, Max whispered. It's just me. I slapped at his hand, pulled it off my face, hissing. What the hell are you doing scaring me like that? You were going to scream otherwise, whether in surprise or in fear. I scoffed, staring at him aghast for a quiet moment. But he was absolutely right. He smelled absolutely delectable, too, like he'd just stepped out of the shower, gotten all dolled up for the evening. Hints of tobacco and leather, and faintly of flowers. Was he wearing Diablo 69? No, pointless question. I had to ask the right one. What are you doing here, Max? Were you following me? He grimaced. <laughs> Don't flatter yourself. And I could ask you the same question. I chewed on my lip for a second, then guiltily admitted the truth. Aqueous elixir, I mumbled. Same, he said, the sea breeze catching the fog of his breath. I hate feeling as if we've left this particular stone unturned. And I was getting antsy waiting on Daniel Lyon to get back to us about a second bottle. How do you even go about tracking something like that? How indeed. Through their nebulous grapevine, maybe? I nodded at the warehouse. I know I won't sleep well until we've seen for ourselves that there isn't any aqueous elixir in there. Even in the dim light, I could sense the shadow of Max's smirk. And, uh... How were you planning on breaking in, exactly? By burning your way through? Rusting the hinges until the door fell off? Don't get too cocky now, Drake. He shrugged. Or just summon a dragon and get it to make an opening for you. I held perfectly still. What was that supposed to mean? It wasn't like I could actually manifest the dragons in our reality. Wait, could I? You know the dragons are just illusions, right, Max? I chuckled as smoothly as I could, ironing the nerves out of my voice. Don't be silly. Yeah, silly. He pressed his lips together like he wanted to say something, but he shook his head. We should get going. I followed his lead, happy to let him play captain if it meant no more odd remarks about me and the dragons. Did Max suspect something about Tiamat and Bakanawa? I could tell him, of course, except that I'd done nothing but deflect each time he brought up Tiamat's fire, Bakanawa's waves. You should probably tell him, Bakanawa's voice suggested. I clenched my teeth, mentally telling him to stay out of the conversation. When we reached the warehouse, Max and I exchanged puzzled looks. The door was wide open. Do you hear anything? He whispered. I shook my head. Max lifted his hand to his face. Illuminate. He conjured his glowing gem, sending it floating into the darkness. My pulse raced as I waited for what the diamond would reveal. Could have been anything. The aqueous elixir? A loaded bear trap? A sexy lady with a gun? Nope, none of that. Nothing, in fact. Max's spell filled the room with the cold glow of its white, and that was it. Light and shadow. The warehouse was empty. Damn it. I ground the heel of my palm against my forehead. I knew this was a bad idea. Of course they'd empty the place out. Why did we even bother? Because we're stubborn. Or we're idiots. Maybe both. Max sighed, draping an arm across my shoulder as he dismissed his glowing diamond. Come on. Let's get out of here.
I hate it, Max. I can't even figure it out. Did the owner freak out? Are they hiding the elixir somewhere else, or did someone else beat us to it? The same person who broke all those bottles. I smashed my fist into my open hand. They must have waited until we hoofed it, then plucked it from under our noses. Ugh, I'm so mad. You're cute when you're mad. He flicked my nose and chuckled softly. I rubbed my nose, glowering. How can you talk about my cuteness at a time like this? I mean, it's true, but honestly. He stretched his arms out with a groan and a relieved sigh. No point worrying about it. We lost this bottle. At least we know now. Fuck it. Let's wait for succulents to give us our next orders. Max had a point. Fuck it. We could yammer about losing the elixir all we wanted, but what was done was done. I didn't think he'd ever be the first of the two of us to go with acceptance over angry, fervent disappointment. Still, this Max was chill. I liked this Max. Don't tell him. But I liked every Max. We walked out onto the docks, our feet automatically seeking out the farthest pier. Fuck it. We couldn't get our job done, but maybe a little sightseeing would soothe our souls. Planks clunked and rattled with each of our footsteps. The wind was cool but kind and far more refreshing than I expected. Kind of nice, all things considered. The city's lights twinkling against the water, sleepy boats rocking peacefully on the waves, the distant rumble of late-night traffic, and most of all, Max by my side. This night had been a total bust in the professional department, but that didn't mean I couldn't have a little fun with my partner. He took in a deep breath, his chest expanding, a smile lighting up his face. Beautiful out here, isn't it? I take Dos Lunas for granted sometimes. I keep forgetting it's a pretty city. Ha, huh. pretty city? Look at that, I'm a poet. I chuckled, brushing the back of my hand against his. What's up with you tonight? You're awfully chirpy. I don't know. Total failure of an infiltration. Nothing to even infiltrate to begin with. He shrugged hands stuck in his jacket pockets, knocked our shoulders together. But at least I get to spend time with you. This man, this strange, often grumpy, always awfully gorgeous man. Heat flared up my chest, warmed my cheeks against the cool of the night air. I probably liked this Max the most. Max nodded at the liquid black beyond the pier the mirrored canvases of sea and sky. Look at the water, all those dos lunas lights. We don't really get to see much of the stars out here, but this is nice too. His fingers grazed against mine like they longed to interlock, only if he wasn't too afraid, too shy to touch. I almost laughed, the pair of us like two blushing idiots on a dark jetty. Only one of them had a secret that didn't really merit being kept a secret. And what was the point of keeping the dragons from him anyway? Was it pride? Did some part of me believe I was a lesser mage for calling on other supernatural powers to aid me? That would be ridiculous. Communing with spirits was supposed to be my jam. Witches of all traditions loved that shit, whether it was dragons or demons or deities. Oh my... That had come out of me in a gasping breath, very much involuntarily from the realization that Max had indeed done the thing. He'd tangled our fingers together, the rough of his palms so solid and strong against my skin. I blushed like a schoolboy, feeling my ears burning. When I first ran into Max back at the Smith house, I truly had no idea that he could be so sentimental, so sweet. His talk of partnership always made me hopeful for something a little less professional, but did I deserve even that? Weren't partnerships, regardless of their nature, supposed to be built on trust? I squeezed his hand. The planks rattled as he stepped even closer, so close I could feel the warmth of his body against me. Listen, Max, there's something I should tell you. He looked at me with liquid eyes and an open expression, eager to accept whatever I offered. I'm listening, he said, and I knew he meant it. My heart fluttered, then withered. 
How often did someone like Max learn to trust others? He had the smallest of circles, but he valued it dearly. He had Tina, Johnny, and Roscoe, strong links in his little chain. And I'd never feel right about belonging unless I told him the truth about the nature of my magic. Would he fear me for trading with entities? Or look down on me for receiving my power from the spirits? I was better off knowing either way. I shut my eyes and took a deep breath, the seawater on the pier brisk and bracing, the sea dragon within yearning to break free. And then I kept breathing in, like my body wanted to wait out the discomfort of having the talk for as long as possible. Couldn't blame myself. The air was so nice, just humid enough to help me breathe easy, as if I was standing above the rice cooker in my apartment. Oh, wait, why was it suddenly warmer, too? Max's elbow dug into my side. Um, Leon, are you seeing this? Seeing what? I opened my eyes. My jaw dropped. Instead of ocean and sky... There was only steam. 10. Max. A wall of steam so close I could almost breathe in its moisture, and so close I could imagine it cooking me alive, cooking us both alive. I grew up in the arcane underground, a world where miracles were a daily occurrence, and still, this shook me to my core. Who could transform ocean waves into steam in the blink of an eye? What spell could generate that much heat instantaneously, turn the cold of seawater into deadly vapor? We weren't up against an aquamancer, if those even existed. Some way, somehow, I was going to punch the pyromancer responsible for this right in their stupid throat. But he who dares to run away and all that... Blood pounded in my temples as I lunged blindly for Leon's arm, somehow only snagging his jacket sleeve. I yanked once, dragged harder, but his feet were rooted to the jetty. What are you doing? I screamed. We have to get out of here now! He shrugged me off like a fool, like a madman. My mouth hung open as I studied the encroaching steam, gauged how long it would take to scald our exposed skin. If I charged in, picked Leon up, and threw him over my shoulder, we would make it off the jetty and away from the water in time. I started toward him. Leon raised his arm at the rolling bank of what only looked like fog. His fingers splayed apart, a fleshy starfish. He shouted a single word. Emanate! A spiral of water rushed out of his hand, spraying ice-cold seawater in a wide circular path. I knew it was seawater because of the blowback the spatter of mist and foam on my skin salty when I licked my lips, a convenient reminder to close my mouth. The spiral whirled faster and faster until it resembled a funnel, a water spout, the base of a tornado. Stranger still, Leon's hand was no longer only a hand, but cloaked in a bizarre, transparent shape. It was as if he had put on a gauntlet made of glass or ice. No, it was flowing water somehow formed into the shape of a dragon's head. Coiled all the way down his arm was its serpentine body, a miniature form of the dragon he had once conjured to scare me. I clenched my teeth. The mask must have been telling the truth then. Leon was hiding something about his magic from me, but why? I raced toward him again, this time definitely meaning to firemen's carry him all the way to safety. But the whirlpool of water centered on his hand faded, like his supply had run out. The dragon was gone, too. Even better, the ocean was back to normal, only the soft, gentle rush of waves. No more deadly wall of steam. He countered it with his own dose of cold water and mist. Leon turned toward me, panting, his shirt wet from the salt water of his own making, maybe even some sweat. His chest rose and fell with every strained exhalation, almost tantalizing to look at how his wet shirt clung to the shape of his muscles. I steeled myself, shook my head, pulled on his arm as I led the way back. That was very risky, very dangerous. Sorry, he said, stumbling after me, but not sorry, too. The steam was coming too fast. I wasn't sure we would make it if we ran. 
Then thanks, I said, angrier than I'd intended, the grumpiest gratitude I'd ever offered to anyone. Was I pissed that he took the risk to save both our butts, or was I more annoyed about him and his secret dragon? Couldn't it be both? We stopped at the end of the pier, grabbing our thighs and panting. My breath left my body in puffs of fog. Fog, not steam, very important distinction. We were safe, for now. But who the hell was out there trying to steam us alive? What did Leon do with his fingers? No, the other thing first. I straightened up, catching my breath at last, angry at this amorphous, invisible enemy. We weren't cruciferous vegetables, for fuck's sake. No one steamed Maximilian Drake and got away with it. A burly, bearded man in a thick woolen hat stood in front of us, hands held up to either side. What the hell are you screaming for? Nothing, Leon said, a huge compensatory smile on his face. Beautiful night out, just got excited. The man narrowed his eyes. Well, keep it down, whatever it is. What are you two doing out here so late at night anyways? Leon frowned. What are you doing out here so late at night? I slapped my hand on my forehead. Bad time to get all sassy. This guy was just some dock worker trying to get his job done. If Leon's mouth got us into a scrap, we wouldn't be able to use magic to get ourselves out of it. Sorry, sir, I said, placing myself squarely in front of Leon, blocking him from view. Out of sight, out of mind except I could hear him sputtering indignantly behind me. Just out for a stroll. We'll be on our way now. Didn't mean to bother you. He gave each of us a last hard look, then lowered his head. That was a nod, apparently. Well, go on, then. Some of us have to work through the night. Leon poked his head around my shoulder, an inquisitive gopher. Too much energy for his own good. What are you guys moving? The man scowled. Drugs, dead bodies, nosy runs, take your pick. He stomped off, work boots tromping heavily on the concrete. Did you hear that? He called me a runt. Leon stepped up to my side, earnestly inspecting himself. And do you think he was serious about the other stuff? I smacked him on the shoulder. He yelped, massaging his arm, but he knew better than to fight me. The cheeky fucker was already wearing a self-satisfied grin, after all. His second favorite place was right next to me under the covers in bed. His favorite place was right under my skin. Come on, I growled. We're getting out of here. You and I need to talk. I know a diner that's so terrible it refuses to close. Ever. What? Isn't there somewhere nice we can go? Don't I have a choice? Not at this hour, I said, glancing at my watch. And no, it's what you get for being a mouthy brat. Leon sighed, plodding after me in resignation. There's no getting out of this, is there? I scoffed. <laughs> Not unless you want to walk all the way back to the city. He was about to tell me something. Just before that steam began to rise from the jetty, I could sense it. Something important. Maybe it had to do with this emanate spell he loved so much. How this time the magic actually manifested as a dragon. Nope, no way Leon was backing out of this. And if he tried, I'd only chase him down and wrestle an answer out of him. We took my car to the No Finer Diner, so ancient it was practically a Dos Lunas institution, both a landmark and the gaudy electric blemish on the cityscape. The owners had never bothered to repair most of the busted neon signage, allowing the restaurant to warn prospective customers from afar. Every night it screamed, No, in angry red letters. The diner was one of a few places to reliably get a hot meal in the city so many hours after midnight. Note that I said hot, not edible. It was also a place one might reliably expect to get food poisoning. The diner was where taste buds went to die, where food skipped the digestive tract and arrived as excrement right on the plate. See also, relic, health hazard, should be condemned. But no one could convince Leon that going there was his punishment. His eyes lit up at the sight of the waffles our server brought us, a dour woman with sunken eyes who was either having a horrible shift or was an actual zombie. He drizzled syrup over the golden brown waffles, piled on dollops of whipped cream. Clever boy. That way he might actually be able to choke the stuff down. 
My diet caffeine-free cola sweated profusely by my hand, filled with so much ice it nearly burned to touch. My club sandwich stared limply back at me from the plate. The thick-cut fries at least looked somewhat appetizing. I picked one up, bit into it, marveled at how it was blazingly hot, soggy, and partially frozen on the inside all at once. The no finer diner? Never disappointed at disappointing. But young Leonardo Alcantara here was already a good way through his first waffle, munching merrily without complaint. I glowered at his plate, at the mounds of whipped cream. Either he was much hungrier than he'd let on, or he'd somehow stumbled on the one good thing the diner had to offer. Now, I said, folding my hands together, about the thing at the docks. Leon blinked. The thing? You mean the steam? No, you know what I mean. The thing with your hand. When you cast your water magic. His shoulders rounded. Promise you won't hate me. Promise, I said slowly. I might be annoyed for a bit if you haven't been completely honest with me. But I won't hate you. I didn't think I could ever hate him. Leon drew a long, slow breath, then exhaled. <sighs> okay. So when I cast that spell, when I emanate, I'm actually calling on dragons to unleash their magic. I blinked this time. Dragons. Actual dragons. Inside you. Don't act so surprised. I'm contracted to them, bound by the laws of the cosmos or whatever. That time I scared you, that was just an illusion, but they came to me after that, asked if I could manifest their magic in the world. A way to let them relive their glory days, I guess. In return, I get a taste of draconic might. None of this sounded made up. In many traditions throughout the world, and not only in witchcraft, other worldly beings and entities played important roles in the making of great magic, negotiating with gods, currying favor from spirits. Hell, even deals with the devil. You know, standard stuff. It's just what witches do, Max. He shifted in his seat, uncomfortable, his lips in an odd combination of a frown and a pout. You've suspected for a while now, I'm sure. You have your reasons for asking. Actually, I'm mostly asking because our favorite mask came up to me again recently. In the alley behind Unholy Grounds, in fact. As for hating you, why would this make me hate you? It's kind of awesome, really. Oh, <laughs> dragons. Elemental dragons. Cool. He lowered his utensils, watching me warily. So you don't think less of me for communing with the spirits? Ancients, entities, whatever. My forehead creased. Why would I judge you for that? It's a fair exchange of power, and you've shown that you can handle everything the dragons give you. The smile returned to his lips. Leon sat a little straighter on his side of the booth. How long had he been worrying about this? Was he afraid to tell me all this time? By its very nature, that kind of magic is transactional, I continued. Only fools would consider it a shortcut. Entities would never lend their power to a mortal unless that mortal paid the price. My hand gripped the edge of the table tight. You do know what price you're paying, don't you? Leon pursed his lips, suddenly looking like a child, like his fork and knife were too big in his hands. The initial contact... You know, when we sealed the pact, it hurts like hell. Twice now. With Tiamat, it felt like flames surging through my whole body. With Bakanawa, oh God, like salt water in my blood. I winced, the very suggestion of the agony enough to make me reconsider any exploration into Leon's half of the arcane arts, I knew that contracts with supernatural beings could imbue mages with enormous power, but at that price? There's more, he mumbled. My eyes went wide open. Oh, good, there's more. He sighed. When they manifest, that is, when they emanate, the magic gets traced back to me. 
I serve as the vessel, the conduit to this world. It means that whatever uses me as a host doesn't have to catch heat from, well, you know, big brother, big mother, big other, take your pick. I snapped my fingers. That explains why the masks knew about your, um, activities. But it looks like they've sniffed out how you aren't channeling furry friends and woodland creatures when you emanate. Because even the entities fell under the watchful eye of Earth's many magical organizations, those who fought to keep our kind out of sight of regular humanity, the normals. If the general population became aware of the mages and gods that walked among them, if world governments knew, I couldn't imagine. They're just so powerful as my guess, Leon said, tucking back into his waffles. Can't hide the traces of their presence but it's not like I've been using them to do harm. The masks can't pin anything on me. They should be out there tracking down whoever's breaking bottles and turning the docks into an outdoor sauna. Or maybe the dragons wanted to make their presence felt. Maybe they longed for the glory of wreaking havoc and terror. Back at the docks, the shape of Leon's hand, that strange dragon's head. You mentioned two dragons, I said. So you can call on them anytime you like? His eyes went up to the ceiling as he gave it some thought. Well, technically, I'm pretty sure I can only carry one at a time. They take turns. Unlike a studio, but, you know, like a really sexy one. I chuckled, though I was only somewhat satisfied. I had to wonder whether these emanations weren't costing Leon anything else. I'd have to feel that out, talk to him even more delicately about it someday. How's your thing? Leon nodded at my plate, the miserable stacks of soggy bread and potatoes. You barely touched it. I shook my head. Worst thing I've ever tasted. If I smoked, this would be the kind of sandwich I'd put out a cigarette on. Why you would order a club sandwich after midnight is beyond me. You don't know how long that lettuce has been struggling in the fridge. Could be two days, could be two weeks. It's a diner thing, isn't it? A staple. Anyway... At least I'm not stuffing my face with waffles and cream. That's going to keep you up, Leon. Whatever, I'll just tire myself out by hanging out all night. He shoved another forkful into his mouth, the crispy waffle edges crunching with every bite. I shook my head again. And who has to deal with your antics? Me. You're terrible for my sleep hygiene and my diet. He chewed and swallowed, half grinning when he sent his tongue to lick at a spot of cream in the corner of his mouth. You don't complain when I wake you up with blowjobs, though. Would you? <laughs> Leon, pipe down. I leaned across the table and whispered. Someone could hear. I blinked, the horror uncoiling in my belly. Oh my God, the, the dragons? Do they hear what you hear? Do they? Oh no. Leon laughed. <laughs> don't worry, they're dormant over 90% of the time. Honestly, I only ever hear from them when I'm using their power, or close to it. I leaned back, relieved. All the filthy things we'd said and done. Wow. And besides, if they try to snoop... Leon waved his fork at me, making a point. It's their fault if they go half dead from cringing. I snorted, poking at one of my fries. Are we really that cringe-worthy? Mostly you, Leon replied, putting away even more of his waffles. Very sappy. Kind of gross. Hey, you're the one who goes all squirmy and shit when I tell you those sappy things. You like it. You love it. Hey, hey, Alcantara, stop chewing and tell me you love it. He quietly declined, masticating on his mouth full like a defiant goat. I glowered at him, then decided I had a use for my terrible meal after all. I fired the first French fry pelted him right in the forehead. Leon swallowed. Very immature of you. I thought you were bigger than that. He picked up the fry and dunked it in my drink. What? Hey, that's the only salvageable thing I ordered, and you ruined it. Next time, he said, cutting into another segment. Next time, you'll know better and order the waffles. I chewed on my lip, deciding my revenge would come later. I was going to make Leon pay. You know, literally, make him pay for his stupid, admittedly delicious-looking waffles and the world's worst club sandwich. 
maybe it wasn't so bad having this bit of downtime. That is, if downtime meant running away from supernatural banks of steam conjured, no doubt, by some asshole sorcerer. Rest. Tonight, we could eat terrible diner food, make silly jokes and sweet small talk, and rest. Tomorrow, we could find the culprit and drop kick them in the throat. 11. Leon. The clink of glass, the clatter of silverware, and the buzzing chatter of hungry diners. I didn't get to go out someplace nice very often, was able to treat myself even less, but here was dashing debonair Mr. Maximilian Drake taking me out to the fanciest feeding trough I'd been to in forever. It was the kind of place where I'd likely end up shooed away for staring in through the floor-to-ceiling windows, possibly drooling on them a little too. Soft lighting, all classy and golden, reflecting against massive mirrors and bathing the sleek white furniture in an ethereal glow. Max, however, seemed less than impressed, glancing around with hunched shoulders and a sullen expression. As much as I could see of his face anyway, under those huge aviator sunglasses. Weirdo. Aw, oh, Max, this is so sweet of you taking me to a fancy restaurant. I unfolded my napkin, gingerly laying it across my lap. Is this a date? You can tell me if it's a date. I feel so pampered, and the food isn't even here yet. He leaned closer to the table, lowering his sunglasses. No, it absolutely is not a date. I would never take you on a date to a place like this. A place where the food is terrible, I mean. I furrowed my forehead, confused and admittedly a little bit crestfallen. Then why are we here? He sank into his chair, head lowering and neck receding, except Max wasn't a turtle, and that was as far as he was going to go. Scoping things out. My cousin owns this place, and sweet, free grub. I raised one hand, menu in the other, as I grinned at the waitstaff. Waiter, I'll have the top half of this page and uh, the bottom half of the next page. Max, did you want anything? Shut up, shut up, don't call me that. He rasped, turning his face away. I flapped my hand at him. Well, don't worry about it, nobody seemed to notice me. That guy practically glided by. Busy night, maybe? I'm sure someone will come get our order soon. I flipped through the menu. Garlic, shrimp, croquettes? Oh, wow, lots of stuff here that I haven't had in ages. Wait a minute, this is mostly Spanish cuisine. Is this a Spanish restaurant? Are you trying to introduce me to your culture, Maximo? That's so cute. Max's voice dropped to a whisper. Damn it, Leon, you're not listening. Remember when I first told you about my family, and all those other times before that, when I told you about how dangerous the great magical families of Dos Lunas are? You mean when you were pretending to be someone you're not? Yeah, I remember. I tore up a piece of bread, nice and hot, dipped it into some sort of dark paste on the table, and popped it past my lips. Summer exploded in my mouth, the tart, bright flavors blending perfectly with the soft yet crusty bread. Oh my God, what is this stuff? It's amazing. Tapanana, chopped up olives and capers and probably anchovies, but that's not the point right now. The point is that my former family, they're all evil, and Davina is no exception. Also, no offense, but that tapanana can't possibly be that good. Davina couldn't cook to save her life. You know what? Give me some of that. He reached for the bread basket, slathering some of the dark stuff onto it. I put down the menu and frowned. Sounds like you're not a fan of this Davina person. Understatement of the year. The crusty bread crunched as he bit into it. Max froze mid-chew, then stared down at his appetizer. I quirked an eyebrow, watching for his reaction. Something wrong? He pulled off his sunglasses, eyes brimming with disbelief. This is delicious. That's impossible. Told you. Maybe your cousin finally learned one or two things about making good food. Again, impossible. He dropped his bread onto his plate, wiping his fingers off on his napkin. The only thing Davina is good at is worming into people's brains, using her twisted charisma to get her way. I swallowed my second piece of bread, took a sip of water. I didn't realize that was a thing. Oh God, is that for real? Yeah. Yeah, it is. There's all sorts of people with terrible magic out there. And this one happens to be a terrible person, too. A brillante at that. Max nodded, rubbing his eyelids with the heels of his palms. He glanced around and shrugged. 
Guess there's no point in staying incognito. I don't see her anywhere. The chuckle came sputtering past my lips. Hopefully it didn't sound too cruel. <laughs> Incog- Are you kidding? A- with your indoor sunglasses as big as your face? Come on, Max. Uh, let's try to enjoy this. Maybe your cousin turned over a new leaf, huh? Maybe. He grumbled, reaching for the menu himself. Not that I'll ever fully trust her, if I'm honest. Davina and I grew up together. Her gift wasn't as developed back then, but she still got me. Made me do stuff that, uh, yeah. Let's just say she had a reputation for being a bully. Got away with it every time, too. Happens when you can charm grown-ups. I'd never made the connection until Max laid it out so clearly. It didn't feel right, someone abusing their magic for the purpose of manipulating their own family. I didn't think much of her before, but my dislike for this Davina character was steadily growing. We can leave, I said. If you want, I don't mind at all. He shook his head. No, I'm okay. If we go, Davina wins. Let's actually try some of this slop and see if we just lucked out on the free bread and dip. Anything particular you want to order? Oh, fucking everything, if I'm honest, but we should definitely get some paella. Haven't had it in ages. You want the seafood one? There's another kind that's mostly meat. Chorizo, too. Yum. Actually, he said, lip turned up smugly. It's pronounced paella. More of a Y sound. <laughs> you guys colonized my country for centuries. Least you could do is let me have my consonants. That's how we pronounce it back home. So yes, we should definitely get the paella. Max sputtered and flustered, his cheeks tinged red with embarrassment. <laughs> Listen, my ancestors weren't conquistadors, okay? They were too busy staying in Spain, practicing magic, and being criminals. He glanced around the dining room, eyes narrowed. Some things don't change. Joking, I said, patting him on the arm. Maybe we could try both kinds. And the joke had caught him off guard, but now the lightest touch seemed to relax him. Max smiled, then called over a very sleepy-looking waiter. Must have been a long shift. I made a mental note to leave him a nice tip later. Rather, to ask Max to leave him a nice tip later. With our orders placed, Max's words came a little easier, his smiles looser. Fantastic that there were smiles at all, really. This was finally feeling a little more like a proper date. Well, as long as this Davina person didn't appear out of nowhere to make a fuss, it really didn't take much at all for her to sound like someone I'd love to hex into next Tuesday. But our food arrived, smelling excellent, tasting, divine. I kind of hated that the word came to mind, but it was true. Authentic Spanish tortillas, the egg moist, the potatoes perfectly cooked, piping hot croquettes with creamy ham filling, and the paella had that lovely crust of toasted rice on the bottom, a special crispy treat, the hallmark of a good paella. Sorcery, Max muttered, inspecting the omelet up close, dissecting the poor croquettes right on his plate. There's got to be some magic involved. I nodded, considering the possibility, all while stuffing my face. You know, in the Philippines, it's how you get someone to fall for you. Put something in their food, like a love potion. We call it gayuma. Max spooned up another mouthful of paella and grunted. That how you got me, Alcantara? Snuck something into my food? Caught him. I couldn't help sneering. Oh, wow. You have it bad for me, Drake. You think I've been spiking you with love potion? Operative word being love. Are you enough? He said, holding one hand up to stop me, thumping himself in the chest with the other. I couldn't tell if the coughing really was rice going down the wrong pipe or just him trying to deflect. There's only so much sass I can take. Again, with the faint tinges of red in his cheeks, that adorable blushing of his. I fully didn't know that Max could be so vulnerable. Back when we first met, I mean, he was searing hot, obviously dark and brooding and handsome, professional and put together to a fault, but this was nice, being privy to his softness, those irresistible smiles, the unexpected bashfulness that came when I said or did something to scandalize him. I liked knowing that I was allowed to tiptoe past the line, make him laugh and fluster. I loved seeing this side of him. Oh, crap, now he had me using the damn L word, too, hoisted by my own petard. 
Max dabbed at his mouth with his napkin. So proper, these shades of his wealthy upbringing rising to the surface. It shouldn't have been so hot, the softness of it against his lips, the tight hardness of his wrist, and the veins on the back of his hand. Why was that so sexy? I can't take this, he said, getting up from the table. I'm going to snoop for a bit. You stay right here. What? Now? Really? I threw my hands up. But we were having such a nice time. And we can keep having a nice time right after I come back from the, uh, the toilet. He looked around, checking for prying eyes and curious ears. I'll be right back. I wished I could be more pissed off about him pissing off to allegedly take a piss, but I couldn't deny being a little curious myself. Who was I to deny Max's nature? And mine. He was a finder, wasn't he? How could I judge him for surrendering to his nature, for living his truth? Damn it, I muttered, balling up my napkin, watching as Max scoped out the doors to the kitchen. I rose from the table, surrendering to my nature and living my truth. 12. Max. I picked out the right place to get ready for my impromptu infiltration, a large plant, a particularly monstrous monstra, those things with the heart-shaped leaves that had big old holes in them. Pretty sure I saw a couple back at succulents. Said leaves rustled menacingly as I squeezed into position then settled again. Oops, I just brushed against it. Not a secretly sentient carnivorous plant after all. But this was perfect. Nobody was watching, which meant nobody would see me disappear. Quite confusing, perhaps, but watching a man cast a camouflage spell can be pretty disconcerting, to say the least. Especially for normals. Safe behind the privacy of a potted plant, I mumbled the spell word under my breath. Dissipate. Magic thrummed throughout my body, arcane essence blossoming from within my soul, working its way through my flesh. Where the spell passed, my very being metamorphosed into a material as clear as glass. As a diamond, in fact. Everything still worked as it was supposed to, blood, muscles, organs, but to everyone else I was functionally invisible. But only for a short while. A minute, if not less. The double doors to the kitchen swung open, a waiter carrying out a tray of something that definitely smelled delicious. Damn it. What was Davina up to? I slipped in as he moved out into the dining area, holding the doors open long enough to avoid smacking myself in the head. More delicious aromas wafted through the air as I entered the kitchen, accompanied by a blast of heat, the steam and swelter of a busy restaurant. The sounds of chopping, boiling, and frying drew me in, the clatter and bang of pots and pans, yet something seemed off. The staff. Why were they so quiet? No one barking customer orders, no requests to check in storage for more of that seafood broth, please. Not a blessed peep, nor a whimper. I crept as close to the edge of the kitchen as I dared, so much steel I could pretend it was a medieval armory, an especially shiny one. Through billowing clouds of smoke and steam, the eerie silence as kitchen staff dressed in white passed each other like ghosts in the mist, I caught a better look at their faces. My jaw dropped. I knew it. I fucking knew it. Davina was up to more of her devilry, after all. Those glazed eyes, those mouths that hung open as loose as mine. She'd enthralled these people, bound them to her will, using her dark magic for the purpose of evil once again. She probably wasn't even paying any of them, dominating their minds with her twisted gift. I knew she couldn't afford to hire quality talent, but I never thought she would stoop so low. A man stirring a pot of something hot and bubbly wavered unsteadily on his feet. How long had she kept them working? What are we looking at? Said a voice behind my head. I nearly jumped out of my skin. My first impulse was to turn on my heel, throw Leon over my shoulder, and run right out of the restaurant. Instead, I smacked him a good one in the chest. Ow! He whined, but softly enough not to draw too much attention. That's smart. What the hell are you doing in here? I hissed, feeling the magic melt from my skin, my body reverting to its original appearance. And how the hell did you find me? Leon shrugged. If I squint hard enough, I can sort of see you. Like a very faint ice sculpture of yourself. Actually, the steam made it easier. And I'm here because I wanted to see your face when you found out that you were so wrong about your nasty cousin. The indignation tangled my tongue. 
I raked fingers through my hair, balled my hands into fists, but in the end, I just flung a finger deeper into the kitchen. Wait, whoa. He leaned closer, nudging me with his elbow as he stared past me. What's up with all the zombies? What happened to these people? Davina Brilliante happened, I growled. She took over their minds, enslaved their wills. I knew there was bad magic involved. No way could she have cooked anything half as good as what you ate. She's not even in here working with them, but I bet she'll take full credit anyway, probably in some back office kicking her heels up. Max, Leon pointed at the guy stirring the soup. That dude's about to topple over. Max. We sprinted as one, racing forward as the man swayed so perilously close to plunging his face in a pot of boiling liquid, the most forbidden of secret ingredients. Leon and I each took an arm, dragging the man away from the stove, guiding him down onto a nearby stack of boxes, the only thing in sight that resembled a place to sit. You shouldn't be here, he croaked, barely able to speak. His breath smelled of cigarettes, his clothes of sweat. God, how long had Davina kept this guy on his feet? How long had she trapped these people in her kitchen? Rest up for a bit, Leon told him. We'll get you out of here, sir. Another man approached, knife in hand, the tips of his fingers menacingly red from handling so very many chopped tomatoes. A woman with disheveled hair shambled closer, her meat tenderizer prepared to tenderize our poor meats. You shouldn't be here, they droned in that awful monotone. We should do something, Leon said. We should get the hell out of here. But we can't hurt them. I scanned their faces, half the kitchen closing in on us, the other half still mindlessly working at their stations. This isn't their fault. Davina wormed into their brains like the parasite she is. Make a run for it. We broke for the doors back to the restaurant, but hands grabbed at my clothes, tugged at my hair. These kitchen folk were strong as hell. I resisted, cried out when a punch landed in my gut. You were right, Max, Leon shouted, placed in a chokehold by someone wielding a heavy pot lid. Were they going to smash it in his face? Leon was a mouthy little shit, but he didn't deserve that. He was my mouthy little shit. Davina really was into some fucked up nefarious bullshit. Uh, buddy, stop choking me. I snarled and struggled, feeling very little joy in my vindication. Great alternate name for Davina, though. I could rub this in Leon's smug little face when we get out of this mess later. If we got out of this mess later. Someone, possibly multiple someones, had locked my arms behind my back. I had expected a knife in the ribs, but I was being frog-marched out of the kitchen instead, Leon alongside me. We exchanged confused glances, staring longingly at the double doors leading to divinity, and then to freedom. But no, the kitchen drones were taking us the opposite way, down to another door. An office. A horribly tacky, gaudy office, I could already tell, even without having seen inside. One of the drones threw the door open, me and Leon shoved inside unceremoniously. I almost wished I'd been knifed in the ribs instead. Tacky and gaudy didn't even cut it. A massive glass desk sat on top of a leopard print rug. Fake, fortunately, though still cut in the shape of an animal hide. Little trinkets from Davina's travels littered the desk and the mismatched pink furniture strewn around the room. An enormous and enormously flattering portrait of the devil herself hung over the desk, which also featured an expensive computer that didn't even look like it was turned on. The office chair swiveled, exactly as if Davina was preparing for this moment, her evil genius reveal, minus the genius. The effect was sorely diminished by the fact that she was in the middle of stuffing a chocolate bonbon in her face. No fluffy cat in her lap to stroke either. Amateur. Primo, she squealed in delight. How wonderful to see you again. How kind of you to patronize one of my fine establishments. I shrugged off the drones, still restraining me. They grunted and backed off. Leon did the same, slipping out of their grasp. Davina frowned at her minions, waving them out of her office. Apologies for the harsh treatment, boys. She leaned across the desk, giving Leon the once-over and a toothy simpering grin. Ah, you must be the flavor of the moment, yes? Leon sniffed, tugging on the hem of his shirt to smooth out the creases. Excuse you? Cut the crap, Davina. 
I jabbed a finger at her face, wishing I could wrap her right in the forehead. You knew we were around. You were watching through the eyes of your minions while they wrestled us in here. Whatever happened to your world tour, huh? Going around the globe to study under the greatest culinary minds. She rolled her eyes and laughed. <laughs> oh, God, how boring. Could you imagine? No. I decided, why bother studying under the greatest culinary minds when I could just, you know, enslave them? I brought them all here. My keepsakes from my travels, my souvenirs. Leon shuddered. Wow, Max, she's worse than I thought. Davina smiled. You have no idea. I had to be careful about hiring my talent, too. No one actually famous, you know. Just barely rising stars, the new nobodies. Better to start them young, you know. They can stay on their feet. They work longer, too. I shook my head, too jaded to be disappointed. You're a monster, Davina. A brilliante through and through. She leaned her elbows on her desk, cradled her chin in her hands. And you aren't. Please, Maximo. Remember all the good times growing up together, you and I? You can take the boy out of Casa Brillante, but you can't take the Brillante out of the boy. Leon stepped forward. I don't know everything that happened between the two of you, but you're better off leaving Max alone. And you have no right to keep all these people captive. I placed my hand around his wrist, wanting to pull him away, warn him, but Leon only shook me off. Davina's eyebrows were as sharp as knives, her gaze flitting between the two of us. And do you know how I keep these people here, little boy? She leered at him from the comfort of her office chair, a devilish stare to match her devilish smile. Surely Maximo has warned you. Do you know what I am capable of? I know that you take over people's heads without their permission. I know you steal their willpower without their consent. Davina stood up, her hands on her desk, fingernails digging into the surface. And knowing this, you still speak to me the way you do. Knowing I can take you and break you. I stomped toward her. Leave him alone, Davina. Go on. Leon snarled, slamming his hand on her ridiculous desk. Go on then, look in my head. See if you like what you find there. They stood there for a tense moment, glaring, breathing. I could hear my blood thundering in my temples. I couldn't tell which one of them was the bigger fool. Davina was dangerous to anyone with eyes, to anyone with a functioning brain, and while Leon could speak for himself, trying to defend me, he had no idea what she could really do. But she just had to try it. Davina started away from the desk, wincing in pain, her hands flying up to her head as she recoiled. Leon clutched his own head, wobbling unsteadily. I caught him before he could sway fully off balance. We should go, I told him. Not yet. Just one last thing. He raised his arm and breathed a single word. Emanate. A jet of water sprayed out of the palm of his hand, firing straight into Davina's face. The pressure was only a little stronger than something coming out of a common garden hose, but the stray droplets hitting my cheeks told me that the water was freezing cold. Salty, too, as if conjured straight from the sea. Davina shrieked, hands to either side of her face, fingers splayed like an eagle's talons, poised to kill, and yet helpless and blubbering, hair and makeup a dripping mess. At least the cold water was counteracting the pain of what she'd seen inside Leon's mind. But I could sense that this wasn't just some prank on his part. I started to pull him away, the stream of water spritzing harder to compensate for the distance. And still Davina screamed and spluttered. Leon finally ran out of juice, chuckling to himself as he followed me back out of the office. There, in the corridor, were the kitchen staffers who'd captured us for Davina. But their eyes weren't glassy anymore, their mouths no longer hanging open and loose. Some looked confused. A few stared around themselves in fright. One man kneaded the center of his brow with his thumb, fighting off the mother of all migraines. 
Davina stumbled out of her office, soaking wet, hobbling on one half-worn stiletto, a set of false eyelashes hanging on to her cheek for dear life. We could have worked together for once, Maximo. All you had to do was get me that stupid evil olive. Leon shot me a suspicious glance, his forehead wrinkled, his mouth already forming a question. No time for that right now, I told him. We can talk later. You were going to get her an evil olive? Leon threw his hands up. Dude, why would you even hide that from me? That's so weird. I rubbed my shoulder awkwardly. No, she tried to make me fetch her one, but like fuck was I going to do that for her of all people? I don't know, man. Didn't tell you because I didn't think it was important at the time. He folded his arms. Seems hella important now, doesn't it? Davina clapped her hands frantically in a desperate bid for attention. I am standing right here. Don't talk about me like I'm not here. Notice me. The mounting chorus of anger and accusation from the gathered chefs drowned out Davina's protest. In a multitude of accents and languages, they pointed and cursed at her, the one person in the hallway that they all recognized. You, said a woman, I threw you out of my bistro. What is going on? Why am I here? Asked a man. Where have you taken me? Why am I wearing this hideous uniform? Davina stamped her foot and cried out in frustration. Leon tugged on my jacket. We should probably leave before this gets any uglier. Okay, but one thing first, I said, hand shaking as I pulled up a contact on my phone. I can't believe I'm doing this. I held it up to my ear, praying that the ringer would stop, that someone would pick up on the other end. Between the raucous anger of the newly awakened chefs and Davina's wailing, it was a wonder I could hear anything over the phone at all. Finally, a click. Someone answered. I spoke into the mic at the top of my voice. Hello, mask guy. I'm calling to report a magical crime. 13. Leon. Max massaged his forehead with the tips of his fingers, the perfect sphere of ice in his whiskey making a melancholic clink each time he raised the glass to his lips. He looked like someone who'd lost a bet, or more accurately, someone who thought he'd lost the last shreds of his dignity. He raked at his hair, mussing it as he pushed it out of his face, tousling the locks and somehow making himself even sexier. Was I hallucinating or did I just have a weakness for sad broody boys? Eh, maybe it was both. I feel so dirty, he grumbled. We're finders. We're the guys who go in and steal the artifacts, in and out like shadows, get the job done, no muss, no fuss. What have I become? You didn't become anything, I told him, hands cupped around the warm glow of a fresh caramel macchiato. You've always been a decent guy, and you did what any decent guy would do. Those poor people were abducted. This way, the masks can help them go home. A cadre of masks had popped in, almost literally, in fact, teleporting to our location, a full-on arcane raid. A handful of them cast a mass sleeping spell over the dining room, knocking out the normals and making sure we had no mundane witnesses. Some careful psychic manipulation helped them convince Davina's captives that they had, in fact, made the terrible choice to come work for her. Divinity was shut down on the spot. There was, however, no sign of Divina Brillante. She'd somehow made herself scarce in the process. But still, we helped all those people, freed them from her tyranny. Looking at Max, you'd think we'd left them for dead instead. He rubbed at his hair again, his face almost gaunt, his eyes haunted. In his leather jacket, his hair messed just so I imagined him sitting on a concrete sidewalk, broken and beautiful and despondent in the evening rain. Wow, I really had problems. And, well, sure, kind of weird that he didn't bother to tell me about this possible deal with the Vina and the Olive. Kind of important for a work partnership, especially in a business as potentially dangerous as finding. What else could he be hiding? But, uh, hey, I didn't tell him about the dragons either. We were even, probably. Hopefully. Seriously, it's okay. I felt for the back of his hand, traced the length of his fingers, the strong peaks of his knuckles, 
and squeezed once. I still think you're a bad boy, Max. That's not what this is about. He pressed his lips together tightly, rubbing his shoulder as he glanced up at me through his dark lashes. So raw, you'd think he had just been roughed up in a bare-knuckle fight. But you really think so? I grin, giving in. I know so. You're a good bad boy. The best bad boy. Leather jacket and all. Beside us, sitting at the same table, Tina stuck her tongue out and retched. The two of you are disgusting. Max shook his head. Very close-minded of you, Tina. Disc, disc. Oh, please. Tina rolled her eyes, reaching for a cocktail peanut. I'm literally bisexual, as if you needed reminding, and I was there when you sucked your first dick, standing guard, outside the door. I didn't tell you to, Max said loud enough for heads to turn. From behind the bar, Johnny threw the pair of them dirty looks. Over on one of the leather sofa sets, Roscoe nudged up his glasses, chuckled, and returned to his book. Max wagged a finger at her. And no more of that. You're not supposed to be my bodyguard anymore. She popped the peanut in her mouth, made a face, and spat it into a napkin. Not like I have a choice. I'm still on the payroll. He blinked. You mean Mama is still paying you to watch my back? More like they forgot to cut me off. I mean, I still show up at Casa Brillante sometimes, shuffle my feet, pretend I'm earning my keep. That's time theft, Max said. You're... Tina, I can't believe you. That's unethical. I forced myself to sip on my coffee before I started laughing out loud. Max really couldn't help it. I, sure, he liked to look all gruff and edgy on the outside, but he couldn't deny that he was a soft, sweet, goody two-shoes on the inside. Part of why I liked him so much, probably. Tina wagged her finger back at him. Ah, uh ah, -uh, I'm stealing from baddies, which makes me the good guy. Also, I'm flattered that you think I'm a thief. Gives me more street cred than you with your direct line to the magical cops, narc. Max sprang to his feet. I am not a narc. Heads turned again. Johnny loudly cleared his throat. Max glanced around and leaned in to whisper, I am not a narc, Gelatina. He stormed off, huffing and puffing. I might have burned my lips sucking down half my coffee, but at least I didn't choke myself to death trying to fight the laughter. I set my cup down and nudged Tina with my elbow. So, uh, first blowjob, huh? You probably heard everything, huh? She looked pointedly away and sniffled. Psh, classified information. Before I could start whining to chip away at her armor, she glanced at me out of the corner of her eye and winked. Too much teeth. All that. I sat back in my chair, sighing as I placed both my hands behind my head. Yeah, he got better. Way better. You guys are so disgusting. I shook my head. Very closed-minded of you, Tina. Tisk tisk. You two were made for each other, she growled. I hate you both. I tugged on my collar. Clearly she hadn't meant that as something sweet, but it made bits of me fluttery and buttery anyway. Max came stomping back, the color of his drink different now, the whiskey finished and replaced with clear liquid. Didn't want the ice to go to waste, he explained, but I also don't want to overdo it. Vodka? I asked. Strange choice of a chaser, but okay. It's water. And speaking of which, we really should be thinking about tracking that second bottle ourselves. No word from succulents as it is. What are we talking about? Roscoe asked, pulling up a chair. The aqueous elixir again. Johnny hovered behind him, drink in hand. I could help you know. Bakunawa. The dragon's voice reverberated from deep within my psyche. I frowned at the middle distance. And what would you know about the aqueous elixir exactly? The others stared at me. Oh God, I didn't realize I'd said that out loud. Johnny clucked his tongue. I don't know who that was meant for, which boy, but hurtful, very hurtful. We're all just trying to help here. No, no, I said frantically, shaking my hands. I'm sorry, I wasn't talking to you guys. Ha, huh, silly brujo. Serves you right for being so rude when I only wanted to offer my expertise. 
an arm draped across my back. Max squeezed my shoulder, massaging the muscle. Everything okay there, big guy? The stress getting to you, maybe? I shook my head. It's, um, it's Bakunawa. You know, the dragon? He says he can help. Tina perked up. Johnny turned his hands up, glancing at the others for an answer. Roscoe, as always, was ready to provide one. Bakunawa, the sea dragon of Philippine myth? What on earth is a sea dragon doing inside your head, Leon? It's a long story. And so I told them the long story. Tiamat and all. This is wild, Tina murmured, staring at the side of my head. An actual entity from our folklore, hiding inside you, lending you their power. She poked at a spot on my scalp, not hard enough to hurt. Still annoying, though. Hey, I barked, swatting her hand away. Doesn't matter how much you poke my skull, it's not like you're going to get him to come out that way. I blinked, suddenly doubtful. Uh, at least I don't think that's how it works. But there were two of them, Johnny said, scratching at his scruff, all but stroking his chin. You say you can only hear one of them now? I shrugged. It's as if I only have enough room to hold one of them at a time, which is just as well. I don't like the idea of even more voices in my head. What if they start arguing with each other? Very rude, said Bakunawa. I'm sorry, I said out loud. Oh, sorry, guys, that was for Bakunawa. This is all super interesting, but also very confusing, Roscoe said. I know, right? Max swirled the slowly melting ball of ice in his glass. Isn't it so hot? Tina winced. That's not what Ross said at all, but okay, gross. Warmth spread across my cheeks. I shifted in my chair, staring pointedly into my coffee, avoiding Max's sticky, sweet, and presumably adoring gaze. Okay, so let's get started already. An empty glass, Bakunawa said, and a handful of ice. Apparently, that was all we needed for this little spell. Johnny very kindly fetched the reagents from the bar. This all seemed very familiar, actually, using common objects and household implements to make magic. It reminded me of my mom, of my many mothers, the old Alcantara witchcraft. Very good for finding bodies of water, big or small, the dragon's voice thundered inside my head. If this thing you're looking for is indeed a great concentration of elemental water, then it should work the same. Now, Brujo, raise your hand above the glass and call on my power. Okay, I said, doing as he instructed, but not too hard now. Emanate. A slow trickle of water drizzled from my palm, covering the four or five ice cubes Johnny had placed there. The others looked on in what I hoped was amazement. Johnny cleared his throat. I could totally install you at the bar. Free water on tap? Might save me a bunch, too. Well, only if you think your customers would enjoy... seawater. I stirred the ice with my finger, waiting on Bakanawa's word. Now, Brujo, take a knife and cut the tip of your finger. Any finger. A single drop of blood in the water will do. Ah, uh, I'm not so sure about that, B. Roscoe's forehead furrowed. What's the matter? He says we need a drop of blood. Oh, is that all? Ross shrugged. Pretty standard for rituals. You're lucky it's only a drop. To be fair, I'd done it once or twice back with my many mothers. Roscoe was right. He was being kind, in fact. A witch, of all people, shouldn't be afraid of a little bloodshed in matters of ceremonial magic. Maybe some part of me still distrusted the dragons in general, but Bakunawa was my people, wasn't he? And he never steered me wrong before. I accepted the knife Tina offered me, produced seemingly from out of nowhere, but I wouldn't have been surprised to learn that she kept one in her boot, and another in her bra, and a third in her hair. I pricked my finger, hissing at the momentary pain as blood welled in a single perfect bead. I squeezed the blood into the glass, expecting it to color the water. Instead, it hissed as it struck the ice, as if I'd added basically nothing to this curious dragon cocktail. 
The ice melted, then immediately reformed again into the shape of a dagger or a needle. It spun in a frenetic circle, round and round again until it stopped. We closed in on the glass, staring in wonder as the slenderest tip of the ice fragment pointed in a single direction. I moved the glass a few inches to the left, then to the right, watching as the ice swiveled, keeping its tip pointed at that same destination. It's a compass, Roscoe muttered. Hot, Max breathed. I frowned. But it looks like we'll have to carry this glass to actually get there. See where it takes us. From inside my skull, or possibly my soul, Bakunawa scoffed. <laughs> Nobody said it was going to be easy, now did they, little through hole? A man with a short, shorn haircut and a thick black beard sidled up to us, beer in hand. A regular, Johnny had once told me, a nice werewolf who liked to keep to himself and come in for a beer after his day job. Uh, excuse me, you gents look busy, but thought I should let you know. There's a man with a brick outside. Oh, Ross said, craning his neck. Did he say what he wanted? The werewolf scratched the end of his nose. Probably to put the brick through a window. Not on my watch. Tina sprang to her feet, making a beeline for the front door. Hey, Johnny followed her, still holding his drink. Not on my watch either. The werewolf went back to his spot at the bar. Roscoe shrugged and followed the others. I glanced at Max, who similarly shrugged and headed for the door, too curious to be left out. A sweaty, fidgety man was standing on the sidewalk, the brick almost too heavy for him, his arms dangling near his waist as he shuffled from one foot to the other. Said brick, predictably, had a note tied to it. Can we help you, sir? Roscoe asked, polite as anything. The man said nothing, eyes wide with terror. I mean, he was up against five of us, any of whom would likely take him down before he could even think about using his brick. Hey, I said, pointing at his neck. He's got one of those diamond tattoos, too. A brilliante goon, Tina snarled. Max groaned and smacked himself on the forehead. Oh, one of Davina's. Looks like she wants revenge. Sorry, guys, this one's on me. The man yelped, dropped his brick, and took off running. Tina sprinted after him, boots slapping against the concrete as she gave chase. But while the man was totally inept at hurling warnings through plate glass windows, he was actually very, very talented at running at top speed. Good for him. I didn't want to know what Tina had planned for when she caught him. Roscoe freed the note from the twine still attaching it to the brick, unwrapping it and smoothing out the creases. We crowded around him, peering over his shoulder to look. Roscoe wrinkled his nose. They can't even spell you are correctly. You're in trouble now. It's pitiful. Who's teaching these thugs about grammar? Bottom of the barrel, Davina's goons. Max shook his head. We're not dealing with the Brillante family's best and brightest here. Johnny sighed and rolled his eyes. Guess we should get ready for a scrap. Any guesses whether they'll try to put a Molotov cocktail through the window next? I looked between their faces, impressed at how unbothered they seemed. I'd expect someone who owned a bar to be a bit more worried about some crime family threatening to potentially firebomb said bar, but Johnny was acting like this was just some annoying utility letter warning about a power outage. Max had already lost interest. Huh, let them come, Roscoe said, crumpling the letter in his hands. Plumes of fire licked between his fingers, turning the sloppily written warning into a twist of blackened paper. He dusted his hands off, letting the charred bits drift onto the sidewalk, then turned to the rest of us with a bright smile. Nightcap, anybody? 14. Max. Tina never did catch the Brillante goon, unfortunately. Sorry, the Davina Brillante goon, to be specific. She'd hardly broken a sweat by the time she made it back to unholy grounds, muttering something about taking her aggression out at the late night gym. She quickly downed her drink and left again. Good thing Davina hired cowards, or perhaps they were all she could afford to ensorcel. For all the years I hadn't seen her, she'd refined the power, but not the range of her talent. 
Her magnetism didn't reach far enough, diminishing or cutting off completely like a radio signal. Her lackey was scared, not a shambling zombie like the others. It must have been nice to have lackeys at all, though giving in to one facet of the family business meant giving in to all of it. I wasn't bred to be a mob boss, didn't have the stomach for it. Besides, I had plenty of help around me already. My old Dos Lunas crew would always be there for me, and I could definitely count on my new partner, too. My new partner, who went tottering out onto the unholy ground sidewalk with a glass of iced water in his hand. Sure, the dragon had made him a compass that would supposedly lead us straight to the second elixir, but that didn't mean we had to go on foot. I tried not to watch Leon too closely as I guided him to my car by hand. Distressingly cute, the way that a bit of his tongue stuck out of the corner of his mouth as he concentrated on keeping all the water inside the cup. Johnny had made us promise to bring it back, too, the damn sour puss. Way too grumpy about it, wasn't he? I asked Leon, who was still focusing very hard on his glass in the passenger seat. I mean, it's just a glass. It's not just a glass, Max. It's our ticket to the second elixir and finishing the job request and eventually getting that paycheck. He sniffed, wrinkling his nose as he stared at the shard of ice, how it slowly rotated as we turned corners, followed side streets. Besides, it's a very nice glass. Leon sniffled again, his nose and his lips doing this odd wobbly sort of thing. I kept my eyes on the road, but reached over and scratched the end of his nose with my fingernails. He sighed in relief, his shoulders relaxing just the slightest. Oh, wow, thank you. Feels like it's been itching forever now. I'm sure you can hold the glass in one hand just fine. I mean, the compass, whatever. He patted me on the shoulder. I don't think I'll have to for much longer. Down that way. Yep, there we go. We'd found ourselves in a residential area. Big, beautiful houses. The kind that the Dos Lunas elite like to live in. Driving past the mansions and hillside houses, a small, nervous fire burned in my belly, wondering if one of them might belong to one of the great magical families. I didn't recognize any of the properties, though. Not the large, ornate, golden letter N that the Nurs liked to blazon everywhere, nor the lion's head that the lions used to mark their territory. And certainly no diamonds, either. There, Leon said, pointing through the windshield at one house in particular. It should be in there. I tilted my head, almost leaning across the dashboard as I studied the cube built out of concrete and glass. Very modern. Very expensive. How do you know exactly? He didn't answer, only raising the glass in response. It made a rhythmic chinking sound, the shard of ice poking the edge of the glass repeatedly like a bouncing arrow on a digital map. You have reached your destination, the seawater compass seemed to say. We parked a couple blocks away, just to be sure. Even after circling a couple times, the compass kept pointing in the same direction. At least that confirmed our target. I almost asked Leon to carry it with him as we infiltrated the house, but he gave me a look as if he already knew what I was thinking. There is no way I am creeping around the house carrying a salty cocktail. Besides, that clinking is only going to give us away. We don't even know if anyone's home. Leon was right. A few lights were on in the garden, but the interiors themselves were dark. It was reasonably late enough that the occupants might have been asleep, but there was no way to really tell. As we got out of the car, he patted down his knapsack, then his pockets, cursing. Rats. Find time for me to go around without any sleeping salt. Would have been useful for tonight, too. I should remember to grind up some more. We approached slowly. Leon had told me about his small magics, the little spells he'd learned from his many mothers in the Alcantara line. I could relate closely to that sort of magic, all the preparation involved in mixing the right ingredients and bringing the right tools for the job, like that clever brass bell of his, the one without the clapper. On most nights, I would have been far more cautious about an infiltration, taking more time to prepare, but time was of the essence here. Someone had already snatched the first aqueous elixir from under our noses. We couldn't afford to lose the second one, and the paycheck to boot. We'll just have to play it careful, I told him, reassuring myself as much as I was reassuring him. Not that he needed any telling. Something about Leon's attitude had rubbed off on me, his willingness to improvise, to take risks with his magic. I never thought I'd be totally fine with the idea of breaking into someone's house sight unseen, but Leon's very presence was like a shot in the arm, 
a confidence booster. He was just as good at running headlong into danger as he was running away from it. There was almost something impressive about it, how strong-willed and slippery he could be, how there was order to his chaos. And if worse came to worst, he could always count on one of those dragons. Obfuscate, I whispered, blowing a cloud of diamond dust toward the house, watching as the glittering chaff faded and settled into our surroundings. No movement from inside, and no sign of pets either. Penetrate, I added, producing my diamond lock picks, easily working the front door open. We entered. In the gloom of that odd cubic house, my sense of smell seemed heightened, mostly because its interiors did smell exceptionally good. None of that artificial air freshener with the chemical tang that assaulted the nostrils. No, whoever lived here knew how to appreciate fine fragrances. Faint, clean scents. Citrus wafting from the foyer bathroom. Something woodsy and spicy from a center table as we headed deeper into the main hall. Sandalwood, maybe, with a touch of amber. And deeper in the house, perhaps from a distant room, the unmistakable smell of roses. Leon pointed up the stairs. He was the last one to check the saltwater compass, so I was more than happy to follow his lead. Something in his hand gleamed with the gold of brass. His clapperless bell, a spell of silence already cast on the soles of our feet. I smiled to myself, again reminded of how I felt more secure with him at my side. Stronger. Safer. We reached the top of the stairs. The air was sweetest here. This delicious mingling of something earthy, something smoky. Something wet, like moss, like strolling through a cool evening forest. I almost lost myself in the darkness, following the beckoning trail of fragrance. Hold it right there, boys. I froze. Leon froze. My balls receded into my body. Fuck me and my hubris. Why didn't I activate my invisibility spell? It'd only take me out for 30 seconds, a minute tops, but it was always an important precaution. As for Leon, well, again, dragon. A shape glided out of the darkness, a slinky, feminine silhouette. A sliver of moonlight illuminated her face, this oddly familiar woman, her and her silky nightgown, her beaded braids of hair held back with the silk bandana. Something about those doe eyes, those high cheekbones, where did I know her from? The woman wrinkled her nose. I thought I smelled poverty. Whoa, Leon said, holding his hands up. That is way out of line, lady. He thrust a finger at me. This guy's pretty rich. I'm not. But we are not smelly. Her gaze flitted between the two of us, stinging with suspicion. When he thought she wasn't looking, Leon pinched a bit of his shirt and gave himself a cursory sniff. You really picked the wrong house to burgle, boys. Unless this was a targeted effort, you're here for something specific. She clicked her fingers. The second floor lit up, revealing a tastefully decorated room, very minimalist to go with her house's modern architecture. But two things stood out to me highlighted by the sudden brightness, their intricate glass sparkling like gemstones. First was the egg-shaped bottle of something in the woman's hand. Second was the very thing we'd come for, the aqueous elixir. There it sat on a shelf, the glass crystal clear, the essence of water swirling within, turbulent, constantly in motion. It gleamed from the lights meticulously installed under over, hell, all around the shelf as if on display, and around it was a veritable army of smaller bottles. Perfume bottles. Oh, shit. My jaw dropped. You're Flora Devere, the owner of Atomica. Leon gasped. <sighs> the perfume store. Oh, snap. She rolled her eyes but the very slight shimmy of her shoulders, the faintest shadow of a smile, told us she was perfectly happy to be recognized, even in the middle of being robbed. Perfumery, Flora corrected. Get it right. And if you think that the two of you can just sachet in here and take the aqueous elixir, then you can forget about it. I need it for my research. 
maybe for future formulations, too. Wait a minute, I pointed at the elixir. If you know what that thing is, then you're clearly magical, too. You're part of the arcane underground. Flora shrugged with just one shoulder. Fair play to her, it was a very lovely shoulder. Surprise. Why? Is it a crime to infuse my fragrances with just a touch of magic? This, though, she circled her finger around the both of us. This right here, definitely a crime. I studied the perfume bottle that she held in loose fingers, clutching it as delicately as a grenade. It was sort of shaped like one, too, or maybe a pineapple. This explains so much. Atomica was so successful because it was run by an actual alchemist. Now that we knew she was as magical as any of us, I dreaded to think what was inside that bottle. Poison? Acid? Something that could turn us into rats? I watched as her finger rested gently on the atomizer, prepared to push. To a casual shopper in a department store, Flora was just a menace waiting to forcibly spritz the latest fragrance in your face. But an alchemist? That finger might as well have been lingering on the trigger of a gun. We're just finders, lady, Leon said. We're not looking for any trouble. We're just filling an order. I can't believe it, I grumbled. The one time I didn't fully research a target and it turns out like shit. Yeah, Leon squawked. Why didn't you fully research the target? I could have wrung his neck. It was a matter of time. We didn't have any choice. I could have drawn on any of a number of reasonable explanations, but it was far more important for us to distract Flora, make sure she didn't call the cops, or worse, the masks. So, about Diablo 69, I raised my chin at her. I was on the waiting list, you know. Never got a chance to snag one of the limited editions, even though you sold a thousand bottles. Flora stopped breathing for the briefest moment. We sold a hundred bottles. That was the first run. Limited edition. Aha! Uh -huh. Leon snapped his fingers. Caught you, lady. We knew there were a thousand bottles. You totally lied. That's illegal. Probably. The look of frosty uncertainty on Flora's lips slowly turned into a predatory leer. Honestly, I really could have wrung Leon's neck. Aha! Uh -huh, she said, pointing in his face triumphantly. And you couldn't have known that if you didn't go snooping around my office. How did that even happen? Fucking Bettina never paying attention, always with her stupid podcasts. I should have fired her ass a long time ago. I jabbed an accusing finger back. But you claimed up and down and everywhere that there were only a hundred bottles in the first run. False advertising. Flora adjusted her bandana. It was a typo. Honest. Bettina's fault, I bet. Leon took half a step forward, emboldened. That wasn't a typo, and you know it. Prove it. Flora lifted her nose and smirked. Here's something I can prove, though. That you two unwashed idiots broke into my perfumery like a pair of common thugs. I don't care if you do have your bullshit armistice with the masks. I'm filing a complaint. Get your asses ready for magic jail. We are not smelly, I barked. Wow, I was getting superheated over missing out on this stupid perfume. Even Guillotina got one, and she made sure I knew it too. And you can't prove shit. You've got nothing on us, lady. We scrambled your cameras, like we were never there. Leon stood on the balls of his feet and stabbed his finger at the air with every sentence, a kid trying to make himself look bigger, less afraid. He leaned toward me voice dropping to a whisper. It did work, didn't it? Oh, you won't have problems with non-magical law enforcement. I have nothing that proves your presence in my shop, after all. Nothing that regular police would take as evidence anyway. But the masks, on the other hand? Maybe I had detection wards and glyphs all over the shop. Did you stop to think about that? My stomach turned in knots, cold sweat breaking out across my forehead. I turned to Leon, leaning in to whisper, She's bluffing. My obfuscate spell should have taken care of magical detection, too. 
Flora examined her nails. And then there's the question of you breaking into a warehouse and breaking every last bottle. Good thing I'd already examined the goods. Leon's mouth fell open. That was you? That was your warehouse? You sell perfume, not liquor. What was up with all that colored liquid? Of course it was me. And you shattered everything. I snuck the aqueous elixir in there, thinking no one would be crazy enough to sift through hundreds of bottles just to find it. But I never expected someone to burn down a haystack just to find a needle. She flipped her hair and sniffed. <laughs> Very clever. Very costly for me, too. I glanced at Leon, never saying a word. We still didn't know who had actually done the damage, and neither did Flora. She would have babbled about it already. As for the color, my next signature scent is supposed to resemble a decanter of liquor. That's why I had them filled up that way. Very eclectic, very original. I'm calling it tequila vanilla. Leon wrinkled his nose. Sounds awful. I said nothing, but a small twinging gurgle in my stomach agreed. What would you know about fragrances? Flora stamped her feet. You're just a common finder. And anyway, you're missing the headline here. I know that you were at the warehouse that night. My wards singled the two of you out. It doesn't matter that you didn't break the bottles, now does it? I can easily convince the authorities. I know a guy. I pursed my lips in anger. Even in the arcane underground, sometimes it wasn't what you knew that mattered, but who you knew. Was it our friendly neighborhood mask by any chance? Flora grazed her chin with the backs of her fingers, tilting her head with a smile. But we can forget all about this, hmm? I can make it all go away. You, the one with the angry face and the leather jacket, I want you to get me something from someone you know quite well. Divina Brillante. I want you to bring me the ultimate being. There really was no escaping my terrible family. A shiver ran down my spine. I'd heard of homunculi before in hushed whispers about forbidden alchemy. The dark art of growing a simulacrum of a human being in a bottle. What had Davina discovered in her travels? Was divinity just a front for something far more sinister? Cautiously, slowly, I phrased my question. And... What would you offer us in exchange for this, uh, this ultimate being? Leon elbowed me hard. Max, whatever happened to work ethic? They were our clients first. It was just a question. I grunted, clutching my stomach. But hey, an opportunity to screw Davina Brillante over? I might have done it for free. Flora cocked an eyebrow, then busted out in laughter. <laughs> the ultimate bean. I said the ultimate bean. It's the most perfect vanilla bean in existence, you see, taken from the rarest of plants. And if I extract its essence, fuck this, I yelled. Damina could keep her goddamn bean. Leon, you want to help her with her makeup? His forehead wrinkled as he stared at me in momentary confusion, but his eyes went wide with understanding quickly enough. What's wrong with my makeup? Flora patted at her cheek self-consciously, her confident veneer crumbling. I spent even longer getting dolled up today, and I swear that new foundation makes my skin glow better than... Emanate! A jet of water rushed from the palm of Leon's hand, blasting Flora right in the face. She blubbered and screamed, flapping her hands as if it would somehow get the stream to stop. Leon had been kind enough to put the dragon on a lower setting, just enough to disorient and distract her. Perfect enough for me to swoop in and steal the aqueous elixir. Fifteen. Leon. This was exhilarating unleashing a torrent of purest seawater from the palm of my hand, fully face-blasting the perfume lady with the big threats and the even bigger ego. 
the froth at my fingers, the spray and smell of salt in the air. It felt like being by the ocean of my native land. It felt like home. And yet I couldn't help feeling like a glorified squirt gun, all at the same time. As pleasurable as this was, this cathartic release of elemental draconic might, how was I any different than a water cannon shooting into a clown's mouth at a fairground? I took one look at Flora's smeared makeup, her bedraggled head of hair. It only made the comparison starker. I could also feel Bakunawa chomping at the bit, eager to turn up the pressure. I gritted my teeth, fighting him with everything I had. This was only meant to confuse Flora, not blast the skin right off her face. But the dragon wrenched at my insides, talons clawing harder. Would a time come when I'd lose control of a dragon completely? Experience the true definition of unleashing? I hated to think it. I would fucking dread the possibility, and yet, what if that was what the dragons truly wanted? Got it, Max shouted, aqueous elixir in hand, grabbing at my jacket as he ran past me. Let's get out of here. I'd never really bothered to check what running helter-skelter meant, but I must have done the thing as we hightailed it out of Flora's concrete mansion. Droplets of salt water fell from my fingers as I followed Max back to his car. I shook my hands off, heart pounding, blood still humming with draconic magic. Was it weird that I was channeling Bakunawa's might mainly with the aim of turning myself into a human water pistol? A little bit. I mean, but was I proud of using that power for good? Most definitely. Releasing the Venus hold on her captives was undoubtedly a good thing. Absconding with the aqueous elixir? Eh, someone of a gray area. Flora clearly wasn't a saint, but uh, come on, we didn't even end up hurting anyone unless you counted their egos. Now, spraying someone in the face with Tiamat's dragon fire, a oh, totally different ball game. Not something I was super excited about doing, but if push ever came to shove. Get in, Max shouted. He slipped into the driver's seat, turned over the engine, and zipped us away from a presumably very angry Flora, somehow making it all look so damn sexy. Something about a guy who is an infiltrator, bruiser, and getaway driver all in one just got me all hot and bothered. The leather jacket didn't hurt either. Max drove like the devil himself was chasing us. Or Davina, maybe. I couldn't be expected to know what the boy was thinking of all the time. Safe bet, too, since we were essentially playing hot potato with the aqueous elixir. The sooner we got this out of our hands, the sooner we got paid. And then this would be a problem between succulents and atomica, and the job would just be something to leave in our dust, a distant sign in the rearview mirror. I did, in fact, check the rearview mirror. No sign of Flora or a car giving chase, whether distant or near. Good. Wait a minute. I said, fingers clinging to the dashboard for dear life. Shouldn't we call Daniel first? You're taking us to succulents. What if he's not there? Max scoffed, knuckles white as he gripped the steering wheel. Then he's just going to have to make a trip down to his precious shop. He can ghost all the messages I send him, but he's not going to ignore one or two pictures of succulents taken from the inside. I turned away from Max, grinning at the road, trying not to show him how much I enjoyed his naughty streak obfuscate, penetrate, dissipate, the right chain of spells, custom-tailored spells too, mine, and my boy could get us behind any locked door in Dos Lunas. And what was Daniel going to do? <laughs> Have us arrested by the magic cops? We were only coming in to deliver the goods. Succulence was predictably dark when we got there, from the in-store lighting to the signage. But as Max released his diamond dust into the air, scrambling the cameras, as he summoned his crystalline lock picks, I noticed something slightly off. Hey, isn't that the back room? There's some light under the door. Max fiddled with the lock, squinting where I pointed like he didn't even need to look at what he was doing. Nicely spotted. Danny boy is probably back there right now. A click and we had access. We slipped in, careful to be quiet. I pulled out my little bell, casting a quick silence spell around our shoes as an extra precaution. It wouldn't last all that long, but it didn't need to anyway. I held a finger against my lips as I pushed the door open. I gasped. Silence spell ruined. I'd expected incandescent lighting, not a spinning yellow oval the size of a doorway. 
The plants in the back room glowed in the soft gold of the shimmering disc. What is it, Max? Some kind of sunlight spell? He shook his head. It's a portal, and something tells me we're going to find Daniel on the other end of it. Wordlessly, he took my hand. I nodded. Despite the hiccups, I knew I could trust Max in something like this. My first traversal through a portal? <laughs> Damn. I took a deep breath as we stepped through the portal together. A pleasant warmth washed over me, my skin tingling with the welcome sensation of being bathed in sunlight. I blinked, quickly understanding that it wasn't the portal's effect. We actually were standing in sunlight, in a grove filled with olive trees. No concrete underfoot, but the softest grass. Were we in Greece? A secluded grove? Fucking hell, were the great families really so wealthy that they could afford not just plantations in other countries, but portals to travel there too? They were still behind us, spinning in golden yellow, tethered to a pair of particularly twisty olive trees. Before I could say anything, a familiar face peered out from behind one of the trees. Dandelion gave a horrified shriek. You! How did you two get in here? Adel shuffled out from behind another tree, pruning shears in hand. She smiled at the sight of us. Ah, oh, hello, boys. What a pleasant visit. I like her greeting better, Max grunted. He held out the bottle we'd lovingly rescued from Flora. Here's your aqueous elixir. You found one? You actually found one? Daniel examined his fingernails, suddenly smug. Not that it matters. I was going to talk to the Jade Spider again, you know. Tell her how disappointed I was in your failure to acquire the first elixir. Actually cut your fee in half this time. Max took one threatening step forward, glowering and growling. You wouldn't dare. Adel cackled. Hmm, well, this just got interesting. My arm thrust out before I could stop myself. Pay up, Daniel. I can soak this entire place in under a minute. Overwater your evil olives. See how you like it. Oh, please. He prodded an olive, eyes flitting toward me, then away again. Nice try. I could tell he was nervous. I'm really gonna do it. I shouted, one hand raised. I swear I've had a lot of practice. Daniel pushed his glasses up and laughed, feeling every bit like a supervillain, one who got off on not paying his contractors. <laughs> Are you serious? Every single plant has been imbued with decades worth of lion magical research. Combine that with Adel's agriculture? Forget about it. They're resistant to drought, fire, you name it. What's a little water going to do to our collection? It's salt water, I said, eyes wild, waving my palm around like it was a loaded weapon. Bet you didn't think of that, did you? Daniel gasped. Ugh, you wouldn't dare, Adel cackled. <laughs> well now, this is getting interesting. You can't do it, please, Daniel took a step forward. We never once considered making our plants resistant to... What kind of monster are you that you would salt the very earth? I chuckled softly, leveraging my advantage. <laughs> you know, I've heard that salt water can be good for some plants. Want to test that theory out? All mostly marine plants, I'd say, Adel said, her eyes on the sky as she counted things out on her fingers. Mangroves do best in them. Algae, I suppose. And can everyone just focus, please? Daniel's voice filled the grove, and so did the swell of his panic. I'll pay you already, the price we agreed on. I pushed my luck, lifting my chin. Well, looks like the price just went up. What? Daniel had turned as red as a tomato, as the tips of Adel's fingers. Or I could douse everything in a light spray of delicious salt water, I suggested. I do what he wants you to do. Adel said, nodding wisely. Whose side are you on, anyway? Daniel screeched. Max brushed his knuckles against mine, leaning in to whisper, I've never been more attracted to you. Something inside me shuddered. 
I tried not to let Max's wildly inappropriate but very welcome compliment distract me. We were conducting business, after all. I had a loaded dragon, and I wasn't afraid to use it. Here, damn it, Daniel said, hands shaking as he gathered several of the olives, plucking them straight from the nearest tree. Take them, just don't do anything to hurt my babies. Adel grinned, her teeth tipped with blood red. Oh, I'd take those if I were you. I swiveled my hand toward him, staring cautiously in case he tried any funny business, then accepting some of the olives with my other hand. Max collected the rest, stuffing them in his pockets, maybe about two to three dozen of the things between us. Who the hell even knew what we were supposed to do with them? We could sell them on, oh, maybe, uh... Daniel took the bottle, then raked his hands through his hair, absolutely hating what he'd just done, but hating us even more. And I'll send you the promised payment as soon as possible. Vera knows I'm good for it. You'd better, I barked. We know how to get here, and you don't want to know what we'll do if you try and scam us. Very sexy, Max muttered. Yeah, this is doing it for me. We backed slowly toward the portal. I blinked against the bright morning light, readying my eyes to adjust to the darkness of the shop's back room. Adel raised a finger, a doting grandmother about to offer her sage advice. Very familiar to me, especially. Very comforting. About those olives. Press them, juice them, squeeze out the oil. A single drop on the tongue may well be enough for a truly enlightening experience. I waved at her lowering my dragon hand at last. Sweet. Thanks, Adel. You need to stop that, Daniel said, his voice high-pitched and whiny as we stepped backward through the portal. But the last thing I actually heard was Adel cackling with delight. What a chaotic demon grandma. Sure, she was working with Dandelion, but in the end, Adelweiss was in it for her own amusement. Max and I stumbled out of the back room, ran all the way back to the front door. My heart was still thumping against my chest. <sighs> that was wild, I breathed. Max clenched his fists, nearly knocking his knuckles together like a bodybuilder hitting a pose. Woo! That was nuts. Oh, wow. Oh, God. That could have gone so much worse, but, uh, hey, we delivered what we were asked to, and... We're getting paid. That's all that matters. I wagged a finger in his face, despite none of this actually being his fault. Nobody betrays us, Max. Anyone who tries will rue the day that they crossed. My words cut off mid-sentence as he pushed his lips against mine, locking me in a kiss so deep and hungry it made me completely forget what the hell I was supposed to say. He grabbed the back of my head, possessive, protective, delirious with nervous laughter. He breathed in deep like he was trying to suck away the remaining traces of jitters in my system, yet also like he was trying to breathe in my scent and my soul. I pulled away, sputtering and laughing as I wiped my mouth with the back of my hand. His eyes darted all over my face. Then he pumped his fists in the air. Woohoo! <sighs> oh, man. I can't decide if I want to make out with you or make out with a bucket of fried chicken. Maybe we'll do both. I'll go grab the car. Max's footsteps rang across the parking lot as he raced to his car. I pushed my hair back out of my face, shaking my head in confusion. Adrenaline could certainly explain some of that behavior, and maybe the sheer exhilaration of surviving what could have been a very deadly encounter... A little odd that I was on the same level as a chicken wing, though. Not that I really minded. Fuck, I muttered, hitting the sidewalk. I could really go for some fried chicken, actually. Something glimmered in the air before me, not far from where I stood. I paused mid-step, fingers curled as I considered another application of Bakunawa's power. Would he get pissed about being summoned again so soon? Hardly likely. I could almost taste his joy every time he emanated, the same as Tiamat. They lived for it. They loved it. A white shape blinked out of nothing, staring me straight in the face, reminiscent of a sort of crescent moon or maybe a croissant. A croissant would have been nice, 
This was no delightful puff pastry, but another unfortunate and terribly timed visit from our favorite mask. Two eyes opened in the middle of the crescent, the mask's mask, of course, and within moments, the rest of the man's body manifested, came into view. I'd never paid much attention to what he wore, but it was easy to tell that it was always the same guy, based on his taunting, deliberately over-friendly smile. Also, his taunting, deliberately over-friendly voice, and his overly formal manner of speaking, too. In a manner of speaking, he sounded like a pretentious asshat. Greetings and salutations, Mr. Alcantara. Honestly, seriously, I waved my hands at myself, at our surroundings, painfully conscious of the olives I was smuggling in my pocket like so much contraband. Well, can I help you with something? And do we get a name from you this time? The mask tilted his head at an angle that only made his infuriating smile gleam brighter. Of course, he wasn't about to reveal his identity. Anonymous enforcement was the entire point of their organization. He inspected his fingers. Nothing there, but he rolled the tips of them together, flicked something invisible off anyway. The theatrics. So annoying. Oh, it's nothing really. I do find it so interesting, however, how there's been quite an alarming quantity of anomalies occurring around Dos Lunas. All those shattered bottles at the docks, have you heard? Soon followed by the manifestation of a wall of steam also at said docks. Potentially very dangerous for the normals, I'm sure you'll agree. Right. And you do realize that Max and I had nothing to do with either of those incidents, right? Someone else catalyzed those anomalies. That's what you should find interesting. How you have another anomalist on the loose? I showed him a finger, then quickly supplemented it with another. Two, uh, maybe two. The mask pursed his lips with distaste. I'd barely flipped in the bird, but he obviously got the message. You know what I do find interesting, Mr. Alcantara? I've inspected the dossier we have on you, and prior to very recently, nowhere does it indicate that you are capable of wielding flames of a bluish-green variety. One might describe the colors more accurately as, now, um, let me see if I recall this correctly, emerald and sapphire. I stood perfectly still, perhaps overly vigilant about allowing nothing on my face to betray my thoughts. Not that these rat bastard masks needed any help digging up dirt on me to begin with. How the hell did he know about Tiamat emanating through my body the color of her flames and scales? Okay, and I started slowly, mainly to ensure that my mouth wouldn't go faster than my mind could process. It's not like mages aren't capable of picking up new spells. You of all people should know. Maybe I wanted to diversify, you know, grow beyond the brujo magic of my lineage. Absolutely. Yes, that in itself is not at all unusual, except, well... It seems as though you've also picked up a talent for projecting streams of water, but only salt water. How very specific and strange. The mask stared at me with curious, mocking eyes, daring me to ask how he knew all this about me. I didn't want to give him the satisfaction, and yet walking away from this encounter knowing that he held this knowledge of me and my talents was going to frustrate me to no end. More importantly, was this a glancing accusation about the anomalies? He was totally pointing the finger. I shrugged, again playing it off as nothing. Act cool, crisp, like a nonchalant cucumber. Maybe I'm curious about the merits of elemental magic. Maybe I want to do honor the islands I came from by using salt water when I conjure it. Is that a crime, officer? He smiled somehow without showing any humor in his eyes. Fuck. He knew he had the upper hand, that he was getting under my skin. Certainly not a crime, Mr. Alcantara, though it might serve you best to acknowledge where your power actually comes from. So nice of you to have this little chat with me. Perhaps in future you'll consider being more forthcoming with your answers, hmm? This arrogant prick, wielding his authority and his information over me. 
I knew I'd felt it at least once before, but the temptation to reach for his face and rip his mask right off was almost overpowering. In the end, I didn't answer. The mask sighed. Very well, then, Mr. Alcantara. Until we meet again, do send my regards to your partner. Did he mean Max or one of the dragons? Still, I said nothing. The mask clicked his fingers. His body seemed to roll up into his mask, this bizarre two-dimensional illusion, his magic of smoke and mirrors. His limbs, his torso, even his smile disappeared, leaving only the familiar crescent of his alabaster mask. Bye, I guess, I said, absently scratching the edge of my cheekbone with my middle finger, angling my face slightly toward him. I saw that, the mouthless disembodied mask grumbled. Yeah, I thought, biting back a happy little smirk. You were supposed to. Prick. 16. Max. I studied the faces of the others as they in turn studied the little jar of olives. To a mundane, non-magical observer, these were just tasty things for throwing in a salad, garnishing a cocktail. If Dandelion and Edelweiss were telling the truth, these tart little fruits held the secrets to unlocking untold knowledge, accessing new heights of consciousness. Provided your brain didn't explode from receiving so much new wisdom in one go, of course talk about mind-blowing. We'd gathered around our regular table at unholy grounds, ice cubes thawing in our drinks. Johnny squinted as he quietly examined the jar from a safe distance. Roscoe adjusted his glasses and tilted his head. Leon's eyes flitted from one face to another as he nibbled on the side of his thumb. Cute. Annoyingly cute. Guillotina was there too, arms crossed and leaning against a nearby wall, pretending not to care. I could tell she was rubbernecking, just as curious as any of us. She liked to be in on things, even if she liked to act too cool for it all. You sure those are the real deal? She asked, carefully flipping her hair with a huff. Sounds like a case of magic beans to me. If that's true, Leon said, then we totally made out like bandits. I beanstalk, giant's castle, golden goose eggs, sign me up. We did, in fact, make out like bandits. In the car in the parking lot for a few intense moments. Something about flipping Daniel Lyon the proverbial bird and earning a bonus on top of our paycheck had gotten me all amped up. Part of it was seeing Leon handle the situation like a pro. I didn't know why it was such a turn-on. Confidence and confidence together in the same guy? A deadly combination. Maybe it was the acknowledgement that we had done something borderline naughty, too. We had basically intimidated a client, never mind that Daniel was being a dick. I wasn't supposed to be in the business of threatening clients, except that none of my clients had ever tried to screw me like that before. It was exciting. Delinquent. Bandit shit. Yeah, kind of hot. And then, finally, movement. Johnny, still silently eyeing the olives, reached forward and poked at the jar with his fingernail. He licked his lips. Don't you dare, Roscoe drew himself up, fixing Johnny with a glare. Don't you even think about it, Jonathan Slivers. Hands up, eyes wide, Johnny backed away. I didn't do anything, but you were thinking it. No, you are not, under any circumstances, putting one of those things in a martini. But I will have one, thank you very much. Hold the evil olive, please. Johnny scowled as he lumbered out of his chair, grumbling to himself as he passed me on the way to the bar. He knows me too well, damn it. We should keep these somewhere safe. I pointed at the jar, then held up a single finger. Just the one olive might be enough to drive anyone insane, honestly. The agriculturist who helped breed them says you can get plenty of mileage out of a single drop of oil. Leon nodded solemnly. You could make a wicked tapenade out of these things, but best believe what Edelweiss says. Edelweiss, Tina scoffed. Are you serious? You got these from someone named Edelweiss? I shot her a smirk. Oh, I'm sorry, Guillotina. I didn't realize Edelweiss was such an unbelievable name. She seems cool, actually. 
It's the other guy who's dubious, the one from the Lion family. That dandelion is a piece of work, Leon said. Well, now you guys are just shitting me, Tina huffed again as she peeled herself from the wall. Gonna go make Johnny make me a drink. Tell him to hurry up with mine, Roscoe called out, his voice overly sweet. From behind the counter came Johnny's gruff response. It's coming already, damn. I was about to add insult to injury, ask him to make me something nice with a cherry in it. But then I noticed the group of men standing just outside the front entrance. Now, I wasn't in the food and beverage business, but it was easy enough to see from body language alone whether a small gang of burly gentlemen was considering patronizing your fine establishment or smashing it up with some baseball bats. The baseball bats, in their hands, certainly helped me arrive at that conclusion. Oh, and the balaclavas fully concealing their faces, too. I pushed my chair back and rose to my feet. We've got company, people. From the bar, Guillotina's head whipped toward the entrance. Her eyes narrowed, a wildcat assessing her prey. Roscoe rolled up his sleeves. Leon, wiry and limber, automatically came to my side, equal parts nervous and excited for a scrap. And good old Jonathan Slivers rang the old-fashioned bell above the bar. Someplace else, it might have been used to announce the beginning or the unhappy end of happy hour. But at unholy grounds, it was a warning. Heads turned from all around the room, customers dutifully getting up and gathering their things. Out the back, folks, Johnny announced. We'll settle your tabs later. For your safety, please leave the establishment in an orderly fashion. Thanks, yes, thank you. What Johnny really meant was that they should leave for the safety of the thugs up front. There was no trace of panic in his posture, nor in his expression. If anything, he welcomed the opportunity to ethically beat someone's face in. This was just standard procedure at the bar for when the locals decided to act up. Only a shame that these particular locals belong to our community, too. Nobody ever said the Arcane Underground was a utopian society. The lenses of Roscoe's glasses flashed as he scanned the sidewalk. Mundanes, hired thugs... Guess who they were hired by? I rolled my eyes. Oh, great. Davina Brilliante, still at large. Sorry again, you guys. This is all on me. Oh, don't worry about it, Johnny said, circling around the bar counter. Still, she would have found out that you seated the capital for the bar, for which we are eternally grateful, of course. But it still links it to you which is to say that, yes, this really would be your fault either way, but, uh, eh, that's cool. Gee, thanks, I grumbled. Leon chuckled, trying to keep things light, both for my sake and the sake of his nerves. <laughs> He's just joking. I smiled at him brightly as the five of us fell easily into place, fast friends, and a solid line of defense. Good luck getting past our wall. Don't worry, I said. I know he's messing around. Those fuckers look pretty serious, though. Look alive, people. But one last resort, just to give them an out, if they were smart about it. Tina and I exchanged glances and nodded. We raised our hands toward the thugs, shaping our fingers into that familiar brillante configuration, our clan mark. The diamonds glowed white-hot within our hands. Hey, Tina shouted, face bathed in the magical light. Last chance, fuckers. You know who we are, and we know who you are. You sure you want to settle it this way? The goons looked uncertainly at each other. Kind of hard to tell what with the full masks, but again, body language. One of them scratched his neck, flashing the diamond tattooed on his arm. The muscles in his forearm flexed as he gripped his bat with renewed resolve. <sighs> I sighed. Hey, at least we tried. They yelled as they charged into the bar. A ragged battle cry, some small, sad attempt to intimidate us. I did a quick head count. Seven of them, all big and beefy, too. And hardly a fair fight. For them, of course. Penetrate, I whispered, savoring the familiar tinkle and clink of the crystalline slivers that manifested between my fingers. One of the thugs flinched and backed up a step, but didn't run. That was fine. Everybody makes mistakes. The men closed in. Roscoe snapped his fingers. Pink light erupted from the floor, a circle etched with intricate sigils. 
I never would have known the glyph was there if he hadn't activated it. The Brilliante thugs looked down, too surprised to move away in time. A wave of air pulsed out of the circle as the magic activated, a dull, forceful thump that blew the thugs on their asses. One scrambled back to his feet and bolted right out of the bar. Wow, very bad quality control at Casa Brilliante these days. Total cowards they were hiring. Really, Roscoe? Johnny shouted, slugging his first thug in the face. You couldn't have inscribed something more violent? Jonathan Slivers, he shouted back, retreating into a corner of the shop. You're the one who told me to stop using fire traps. Another thug followed him into the corner, over by a potted plant. He should have known better. Roscoe smirked, then clicked his fingers again. Another circle exploded from the ground, instantly igniting the thug's jeans. This one went screaming out the front door. Except for that one, Roscoe called out gleefully. I kept that one. I dashed toward the closest man. I slashed with the diamond daggers, going for exposed skin, gritting my teeth as I avoided hitting any major arteries. Draw just enough blood to make it hurt to terrify. These were low-level brilliante grunts. It wasn't too late to turn them away from a life of crime and regret. Leon did one better, fingers splayed as he palmed his opponent's mask. Well, mask or no mask, his Alcantara witchery worked. The thug was screaming his head off, huge white eyes staring above Leon's head. Thinking back, the image of the dragon he'd used to frighten me, it wasn't actually all that scary. It was his fear hex at work, filling my blood with a cold terror that made me want to clamor out of my own skin. One guy was already on the ground, Gilatina straddling his chest. Contrary to her name, she didn't actually make a habit of decapitating everyone around her. She didn't need to. Her fists and her feet worked well enough. She grabbed a handful of the thug shirt, slamming him against the floor again and again as she repeated her question. Who sent you? She yelled never really waiting for an answer. Who sent you? Never mind that we already knew. I knew that she was just itching for an excuse for wanton violence. I stepped in to drag her off before she killed him. Gilatina growled and kicked at the air. The lady definitely lived up to her name. Johnny stepped forward, his arm thrust out. The air around him glimmered as little pinpricks of light stretched and grew into actual little pins, or needles, rather. He motioned with his fingers. A dozen or so of the needles zipped toward the closest thug's face. The FYI, it doesn't matter that you're wearing that stupid thing on your head. The needles will make it through to your face just fine. And heads up, there's a dozen more behind you. Uh, and above you. And no worries, guys. There's plenty for everybody. Johnny gestured again. The needles flew in closer. I suggest you get the fuck out of my bar. Now. The goons went scattering, racing out of the entrance and into the night. Even Leon's guy, who had stopped screaming, but now had a new telltale blotch of wetness on his jeans. I swept my hand across my forehead, catching my breath. You know, that won't be the last of them. Tina flipped her hair, still so stunning after roughing up our tough customers. Well, they can keep coming if they want to. The flush of red in her cheeks made her even lovelier, in fact. Actually, telling her that would likely earn me a jab in the throat. Easy for you to say. Johnny kicked at some stray debris, what used to be a perfectly nice wooden chair. We're the ones you have to clean up. Leon thumped his chest. I'll help. I smiled to myself, as if there was any doubt. Roscoe slipped his arm around Johnny's waist. And don't worry, you know how much I love reinscribing the glyphs and wards. Keeps me in practice. Helps me be more creative. Johnny flung his hand at a puddle of blood on the ground. If you can find creative ways to keep that from happening, that'd be great too. We don't need this place getting shut down for biohazards. I tuned them out unintentionally as Leon jumped in, helping Roscoe pacify a very prickly Johnny Slivers. Tina and I exchanged knowing looks, because she was right. Davina only needed some time to handpick hardier thugs to send after us. She was a cornered animal, lashing out 
because we wounded her ego. That was also her biggest failing. Davina couldn't help herself. The exact kind of person who was prone to making long, villainous speeches. I knew we'd be hearing from her again. And very likely seeing her, too. Very, very soon. 17. Leon. I shucked my street clothes, sighing with relief. Nothing like stripping off after an exhausting day, and what a day it had been. Max had the same idea, his voice reverberating from his beautiful bathroom as he hummed something indistinct. Knowing him, it was something cool and eclectic that only cool and eclectic dudes like him listened to. These sleepovers were becoming a pretty frequent thing. Couldn't complain. Max had the better apartment, and it tended not to attract cockroaches, or, you know, demanding sea dragons. I trotted into the bathroom and slipped into the shower buck naked, my fingers already trailing down his torso. Whoa, wait. He held me back, hand pressing against my stomach, a rare moment of hesitation or perhaps uncertainty. It's been a long day. I'm all dirty. No, I replied, pushing back, clenching my muscles so they ground hard against his hand. I pressed a slow kiss against his collarbone thrilled when he shuddered. I like you like this. I breathed in the smell of his skin, the patch of expensive faded fragrance in the crook of his neck, the scent of his chest under his arms. I breathed in the smell of a hard day's work, the not unpleasant register of labor and sweat layered over his pampered, perfumed body. Still, it wasn't right to think of Max as someone spoiled, as just another rich kid. That was one of the things I loved about him, how these two halves of him coexisted. In his professional life, Max was gruff, ruthless, efficient. In private, especially between us both, he was well-mannered, well-groomed, sensual, and most of all, hungry. But I was hungry, too. I bowed my head, sweeping my tongue out against his nipple, tasting the faint salt, the whisper of soap and scent. Max hissed, head lolling back. I knew his eyes were shut, knew that this was one of his tenderest spots. His hand slammed against the wall to keep steady. With his other hand, he grabbed the frame of the shower stall, holding on for dear life. Fuck, Leon, he said, voice shaky, torso quaking with little tremors. Nobody ever pays attention to me there. Their loss. I glanced up at him studied the beautiful dark fan of his lashes, knew that his eyes were rolling behind those lids. I licked again, watched as he clenched his teeth, not quite wincing, not quite grinning either. They didn't know what they were missing. You're like putty in my hands right now. His chin lowered like he was about to address me, his lashes fluttering, eyes never opening because his body was on fire. <sighs> get over yourself, he muttered unconvincingly. I tweaked his other nipple with my free hand, even as I licked blazing circles around the one already hard and budding in my mouth. A tortured groan ripped out of Max's throat, the shower stall clattering as he fought to stay on his feet. I smiled to myself and chalked it up as a win. I needed to move on before Max brought the entire bathroom crumbling down on our heads. One last long lick, and my lips finally left his skin. His eyes finally opened, too, confused, wet with indignation. Not five seconds, and he already wanted more. I laved my tongue along the vein that traveled up the bulge of his bicep, followed it over the curve of his shoulder where it veered toward his collarbone, his powerful neck. Fuck, oh, fuck. Max sank against the wall and moaned. I might taste better if you let me shower first. I sucked wetly on the side of his throat, pressed a kiss against his jaw. I like how you taste now. He stared me full in the face, eyes clouded with want, the smile of hopeful disbelief on his lips. You're a dirty boy, aren't you? You have no idea. I moistened my lips as I looked down at him, 
wondering where else I could taste, allowing my eyes to travel down the length of his perfect body. And down there, sprouting thick and long from his dark bush, his cock stared back at me, practically upright in attention. The hugeness of him should have made the angle impossible. I couldn't feel more flattered. Max placed one foot forward, his cock wavering temptingly, threateningly between us. You see how hard you made me. With a delighted grin, my teeth biting into my lower lip, I reached forward. That's fucking incredible. I ran the tip of my finger along the seam of his cock, spreading and at once smearing that beautiful thick bead of fluid over his head. Max gritted his teeth, holding back a moan that nearly sounded like a strangled cry. I brought my finger to my mouth, sucked on the slick wetness. So dirty. He wrinkled his nose, but when he shook his head, all I could see was his barely concealed awe. Fucking filthy. I leaned in for a kiss. His lips parted, eyes shut before I even made contact. It took all I had not to laugh fully into his mouth. I traded the taste of him against his tongue, nipped at his lip, pulled away again. He lunged after me, still thirsty and breathless. I held him back with one hand, marveling at the iron hard strain of his muscles. Do you like how you taste? I asked. In a hoarse, breathless rasp, he answered. I do. Not a lot of men I'd been with would have let me explore them like this, examine their bodies with worshipful intent. To be fair, not a lot of men I'd been with seemed worthy of the honor. It tickled me deep inside, knowing that Max was being so generous, letting me have my wicked way with his body. But I knew his patience was running thin. The shower knob squeaked. Cold water blasted my body. I yelped. What the? Max, I wasn't finished. Oh, he said, elbowing me into a corner of the shower, taking the spray of water for himself. You're finished. You got me super hard. You keep teasing me any longer, I'll bust so hard that we're both going to drown in here. And I knew you were going to try and suck me off, too. No, bad Leon. Not when I'm all grubby like this. I bit the inside of my cheek, staring at him sullenly. Well, maybe next time. But this was fantastic, too, watching the water travel in rivulets down the curve of his spine to that alarmingly perky ass, his soapy hand parting those luscious cheeks as he washed himself. Max was already a specimen with his clothes off, but soaking wet? Mercy. It wasn't only the water getting hotter in there. He plodded in a circle, letting the shower wash off his back as he soaked his crotch under his arms, the dip in his chest, the important parts mainly. He sighed in pleasure, water dripping from the end of his chin. He blinked his eyes hard, squeezing away the water before fixing me with a steely gaze. Well, are you just going to stand there with your dick in your hand? <laughs> Fuck, I actually was doing exactly that, stroking myself slowly. I was jerking off to the sight of Max and his glistening perfection. This was hotter than any fantasy, than any porn I could imagine. My cheeks and my chest had the nerve to flare up with heat, as if there could be anything more embarrassing. He pulled on my arm gently, the two of us under the water this time, but not so close that I couldn't admire his body. Sculpted like a Greek god, broad shoulders and narrow waist, a strong chest, insane washboard abs, and that cock. Oh God, that cock. You're allowed to touch me, you know. I didn't answer, running my hand over and under the obscene nooks and crannies of his body, savoring the way my fingers and palm glided across the smoothness of his wet skin. And with the other hand, I kept stroking, unafraid, unashamed to let Max know that he was the ideal subject in all of my deepest, darkest fantasies. You could be an underwear model, I told him just before I realized it was a mistake. I know, he replied, one eyebrow raised as if offended that I ever had any doubt. Wow, look who's suddenly very cocky again. His lips drew back, 
a derisive, dominant sneer, his strong, rough hands closing around my waist. I know. The confidence, that intoxicating arrogance. It was all rushing back into his body like the heat of the water was bringing the most aggressive, most entitled parts of him back to life. I did often like how Max would take the lead, take control, how he would take what he wanted, pin me down, spread me open, fill me. I liked that a lot, actually. It was nice to give in sometimes. Okay, often. His hands took over for me, lathering my skin, rubbing the soreness out of my muscles, cleansing and anointing me with the perfect, silky wet roughness of his touch. A soapy hand dipped down the small of my back, probed at the crack of my ass. I gasped. You ready to take this cock? He asked matter of fact, a mere formality because he already knew the answer. Please, I whimpered. Fuck yes, please. He chuckled, hands still maddeningly resting on the curve of my ass. <laughs> Not yet. Max leaned in and kissed me like I was something to consume, to devour, to take into himself bit by bit every deep press of his mouth, the long and luscious sweeps of his tongue, the sharp inhalation of breath through his nose as his lips refused to part from mine. His hand gripped the back of my head in place, perfectly poised so he could enjoy me the way he enjoyed his favorite dish, his favorite fruit. Good thing he couldn't run out of me. I was more than fucking happy to offer a lifetime supply. The shower knob squeaked. The water stopped. I would have swooned heavily backward if not for Max's support. The water was so nice that I must have been leaning into it without even realizing. He grabbed me, chuckled softly, then reached for a towel. I stared at him in confusion, and then in irritation when he dragged the towel across my face. What the? What's going on? Are we done? But we haven't. His finger pressed against my lips. That almost made me angrier, but Max was quick to explain himself. Can't fuck in here, slippery and dangerous. I mean, I want to rail you to death, but not literally. But, I protested, pawing at his torso. Can't wait, want more, want it now. Oh, you're going to get it. We barely made it out of the shower stall, both dripping wet, desperately wiping just enough so we wouldn't make puddles and slip to our deaths instead. Max grabbed handfuls of my still damp hair, kissing me hard as we stumbled out of the bathroom, the bedroom barely a dozen feet away. But the dresser was closer. He guided me there, breaking the kiss at last, twisting me roughly around, bending me over the surface. I planted my hands there, ass raised and exposed for the taking. I studied myself in the mirror, red from the hot water, from the excitement, hair stuck to my forehead in wet swirls. I saw Max reflected there too, his eyes boring holes through my body as he stared at my ass, slid his cock between my cheeks, slapped one for good measure. I cried out at the stinging sensation, loving it, craving more of him, more of his touch, his cock. A drawer slid open. Max rummaged for a moment, uncapping something I couldn't see. He rubbed his hands together. Something warm and wet dribbled down the very base of my back, down into my ass crack. A finger slipped in, probing me the way he knew I liked, gentle at first, then stronger, harder. The finger went away, replaced by something bigger, thicker, harder. Max slid his cock in, all the way in, chuckling under his breath as he entered me to the hilt. The hair at his crotch, still damp, feathered at my ass as he plumbed his cock deeper, faster, one hand on my hip, the other digging fingers into my shoulder like talons. In the mirror, Max's reflection groaned, his eyes rolling into the back of his head as he built to a steady, almost violent rhythm. In the mirror, he licked his lips, swiped his hand across his mouth, anything to keep him from drooling on my back. Wetness dripped there anyway, from the ends of his hair, from the point of his chin. Oh, fuck. I gasped, my nails digging into the dresser as I watched him enter me, take me again and again, I'd never seen Max as he fucked me. 
His arms were taut from gripping me tight like an object, yet delicately enough to remind me I was something he cherished. A favorite toy, and at once a favorite playmate. The muscles in his torso rippled as he thrust back and forth, in and out, teeth gleaming as he leered at me, at his reflection. He removed his hand from my hip, raised that arm. He flexed fully into the mirror, his bicep bulging obscenely as he admired himself, indulged in the perfection of his physical form and performance, even as he brought me to the brink with every last one of his full, penetrative strokes. Max grinned like he knew what I was thinking, how much I enjoyed the view. You like what you see? He asked, bicep still curled, never missing a beat. The dresser clattered with every pump of his hips. Always oh, did, I gasped. Oh, fucking love it. I reached a hand behind me, feeling for his torso, his stomach, his godlike body, his muscles like components in a well-oiled machine made for fucking. I didn't know if the moisture on his skin was water from the shower or new fresh sweat. Max grabbed that hand, locked it against my back, restraining me, telling me without words that he wanted to have his way with me. I moaned against the mirror, barely balancing myself with one hand. He bent in close, breath hot against my ear, torso like a living statue against my back. Show me, he whispered. Show me how much you love it. He bit into my neck. I whined like an animal. A few final slams of his hips rocked against me, shook me to my core, as if he knew that I was so close to coming. And I was. And I did, nearly screaming as I came on the dresser and slashes across the mirror. I'd never shot so far, so hard. Max braced himself against me, arms embracing my ribs, burying himself, shooting thick, blazing ropes deep inside me. Fucking hell, I muttered, aware that the wetness all over my skin was definitely sweat. Some of it was his sweat, too. Best shower sex ever. Worst shower, though. <laughs> we barely got clean at all. Technically, the best part of it happened outside the shower. Max pressed a burning kiss against the crook of my neck, wagging a finger in the mirror. But we should go back in, you know, do it right this time. I nodded, dragging my hand across my brow. Yeah, just to be sure. Yeah, just to be sure, he echoed, a gleaming Grecian god in the mirror, my gorgeous Spanish bull. I ground my hips back against him, only meaning to tease. He pulled back slightly, then rocked forward again, still hard inside me, still ready to go. He licked his lips, staring at my ass. We never did make it back to the shower. 18. Max. After a couple more rounds of incredibly filthy lovemaking, Leon and I finally did get cleaned up then decided to head out for a nightcap, over to Silk, for a change of scenery, the Jade Spider's home bar. Part of it was to check on whether Dandelion had initiated his promised transfer, too. Driving to the bar, I kept replaying how Leon had all but threatened to salt Daniel's entire evil olive grove earlier that night. They took everything I had not to reach over and grope him in the passenger seat all over again. He sat there, tapping his foot to something on the radio, hand in his chin, as he gazed contentedly out of the window. The boy truly had no idea how horned up he got me with that little display. Maybe I was in my naughty phase in terms of both being bad myself and in seeing Leon misbehave himself. It felt like finally letting my hair down after keeping it gelled up for years. <laughs> Decades. This is nice. I mumbled. Hmm? Leon said, turning toward me just as a splash of streetlight illuminated his face. It made his eyes sparkle. So pretty. It's nothing, I said, smiling to myself, bopping my head to the same music. We arrived at a relatively quiet silk, only a smattering of customers. The bouncer didn't even give us a business either, when they'd normally harass Leon for some ID. 
It was Haruko at the door, though, and she really was sweet on him, the most lenient of the bar's lineup of nondescript and yet very dangerous women. The most dangerous of them all, or so I had to assume, was sitting at a bar stool. Her legs crossed, exposed under the deep slit in her gown, the jade spider wore a rich crimson chipal, the mandarin collar accentuating the slenderness of her neck. Golden dragons flew across the red sky of her dress, tracing elegant shapes with their serpentine bodies, claws reaching out as they chased after pearls. Real ones, in this case, stitched right onto the garment. Vera turned to us melodramatically, sallow, lighting up at the sight of our faces as if only just surfacing from the pits of despair. Leonardo, Maximilian, come and kiss your poor Auntie Vera. I rolled my eyes and smirked. Leon was already rubbing his cheek, smiling bashfully even though Vera hadn't bust him yet. I couldn't tell if this all oh, shucks thing was just a performance or him actually being a bit embarrassed. But again, it was really doing it for me. <laughs> Too cute. Very annoying. We traded kisses with Vera, who had already produced her phone from somewhere on her person. I know you're only here about money, so you can forget about pretending otherwise. Such a sordid topic. But I hear it makes the world go round. Now, let's see. Hmm. Why? That's strange. Still no word from Daniel. That's right, shouted a voice from behind us. Still no word from Daniel because these bastards stole the elixir right back from me. Vera clutched her chest. Daniel, don't be so crude. I turned in shock. It was him, Dan D. Lyon, in the flesh. Next to him was Edelweiss, the agriculturist, grinning her bright red grin, always just happy to be included. Hey, man, Leon stabbed his finger at the air. We would never steal something back from a client. Why would we tarnish our reputation like that? People talk, and we'd totally love to have repeat customers. Not that we'd ever work for your sorry ass again. I glanced between the two of them, gaping as I reached for something else to add, but no, Leon had covered everything, and pretty succinctly, too. So I added the only thing I could. Yeah, what he said. We delivered your aqueous elixir fair and square. Why would we steal it back? Even in the gloomy light of silk, it was easy to tell that Daniel's face had gone beet red. How the hell should I know? We were just finishing up for the night. I set the bottle on the counter, went to look for my car keys, and wham, no more aqueous elixir. My aqueous elixir, announced another voice. And I want it back. Flora DeVere stormed toward us, the owner of Atomica, someone I should have recognized from the very start. I'd seen her face enough times in their email newsletter anyway. She jabbed her finger against my chest. I stared down at it, then back up into her face. Leon stepped in, menacing and frowning. You get your hands off him, lady. My hero. I knew I'd find you two idiots in here. Flora said, backing up only a single step. I was prepared to scour every last spider web in the city. Vera made a flourish with her arms, gesturing at the expansive bar. And you won't find a better spider hole in all of Dos Lunas. Welcome. Flora gave Vera an incredulous once over, glaring at her head to toe, then back again. Vera gave her the same withering treatment, in not so many words, rescinding Flora's welcome to Silk. Hello, Daniel clapped his hands for attention. We still haven't dealt with my missing elixir. Sorry, and just who the fuck are you supposed to be? Flora snapped, rounding on him. Oh my, Adel said, hands clasped in delight as she backed up to give the two more room or perhaps to get a better view of the show. This is getting quite exciting. And it's about to get worse, announced a third voice, one that made my blood curdle. I turned toward the entrance with a glower. Already stomping toward us in her stiletto heels was one Davina Brilliante. She'd come alone. 
Either she'd run out of goons to sacrifice to the wood chipper, or she really was far more arrogant than I thought. Well, well, would you look at this? I find you here, Maximo, commiserating with the very person who grows those ridiculous olives. And yet you couldn't spare a single one to give to me for my own experimentation. You should be behind bars, I told her. I'm shocked the masks haven't locked you up yet. They should throw away the key, too. Daniel's mouth fell open. I knew it. You stole the aqueous elixir back the way you were plotting to steal my evil olives from me. Wasn't it enough that I gave you dozens? I pressed my finger against my lips, shushing him desperately. But Davina definitely heard every last word. You what? You gave him dozens of those stupid olives? Maximo, you selfish, oafish brat. You've always been a little turd. He is not a shitty person, Leon yelled. You take that back right now, Davina. Davina, Flora DeVere's face lit up with interest. Davina Brillante of Divinity. Then you have the ultimate bean. I'll trade you for it. A hand on her hip, Davina gestured at Flora, waving her fingers from head to toe. And... Just who the fuck are you supposed to be? Enough! Vera Long's voice filled the bar, stunning the room into silence. There was magic behind that single word, a wisp of something smoky and green curling past her lips. I could swear I felt the air shift when she bellowed her command, her very voice conjuring its own gust of power. I can see that this grand misunderstanding of yours is going to lead to a violent confrontation. One of the magical sort, if I had to guess. We're not taking orders from you, Davina said, pointing right in Vera's face. Big mistake. Huge. Vera's eyes flashed. A moment of tense, agonizing silence. I suggest you settle this outside. She smiled, showing many teeth, but no joy. Outside the bounds of this reality, that is. The jade spider waved her hand, specks of emerald energy flying from her fingertips. Brilliant lines connected the dots, drawing the familiar shape of a spider web in midair. It grew larger and larger, finally big enough to cover the squawking gaggle of misbehaving bar patrons. Apparently, that included both me and Leon. I shut my eyes and winced, waiting for the sizzling agony of electrocution. It must have been some sort of shock spell, a magical form of tasing. Why did I just stand there like a gawping idiot? Why did all of us? We were too transfixed by all the pretty lights and colors, but the electricity never came. This wasn't a variant of lightning magic, no entrapment either, the constriction and restraint of an enchanted net. I stood up straight, opened my eyes, and blinked into the darkness. Goosebumps rose all over my skin. It was colder, much colder than the air-conditioned interiors of the bar. And the light was all wrong, a distant pale green that came from the far edges of this room, if it could even be called that. There were no walls, for one thing. The same ghostly light emanated from the ceiling. And yet this place had no ceiling either. I raised my head and kept raising it, my eyes going wider, my mouth falling open as I tried to find the source of the jade light. Dangling from the unseen ceiling, were great streamers of billowing cloth and threads, like sheets and lengths of silk. Everywhere, from the darkest corners, from all around us, came a constant, quiet skittering. A hand tugged on the sleeve of my jacket. Um, Max? Leon asked. Where are we? The Jade Spider? had hurled us into another dimension. 19.
Leon. The dark dimension slowly filled with the murmur of confusion. No one wanted to be in this place, but no one knew how to get back out either. Davina, of course, was the loudest of all. She spun in a circle, glaring around the chamber frantically. Let me out of here! I demand that you let me out of here! Max shook his head and tutted. That was why Vera sent us here in the first place. A pocket dimension, a safe space for doing not-so-safe things. Someone was about to blow a gasket back at the bar. He cracked his knuckles, a threat he could easily back up, but one meant to nip the aggression in the bud. Is anyone still feeling up for a scrap? Davina's heels clicked as she stumbled toward him. You shut up, Maximo. You shut up right now. Okay, so the bud nipping clearly didn't work. I slid between them, shielding him with my body. I could feel his gaze burning through the back of my head. You lay a single finger on him, I told her, and you'll regret it. Go ahead and try. You've seen inside my head. You know what I can do. She stumbled backward, eyes darting. Then I'll just command one of these others. Davina waved vaguely at said others. These, uh, uh, whoever you are. Ado wrapped the side of her head with her knuckles, making a wooden knock. Good luck getting in there. <laughs> Flora pulled a perfume bottle out of her purse. This one cylindrical. For some reason, it reminded me of a can of pepper spray. It was probably something much worse. You get within spitting distance. Flora shook the bottle, raised it to face level. I will put you into a coma. Oh, yeah, much worse. Then him. Davina said, pointing at Daniel. He's the most malleable of all of you. Daniel opened his mouth to protest, then shrugged in agreement. At least he knew his own weaknesses. Please, Davina, enough of this. Max stepped up to my side, kneading his forehead with the tips of his fingers. Before you end up hurting someone, or yourself. Or what about him? Davina pointed at yet another man, my muscles tensed, my blood turning cold. What other man? I did a quick head count, scanning the strange chamber. Oh, fuck. Oh, no. Max looped his fingers around my wrist, pulling me back. The quartz spider. Brendan Shum, I growled. He was outfitted in the stealthy, shimmery blacks he wore to help him move unseen in the shadows. The head of salt and pepper hair was unmistakable, so prematurely grayed for such a young face. But how did he get here? And what was he smiling about? I destroyed his mask and goggles the last time we encountered him, using the might of Tiamat's dragon fire. But Brendan Shum struck me as someone who was uh, resourceful, who could easily steal replacements for his gear if not purchase them outright. <laughs> he probably had a perfectly functional set sitting around somewhere. There was a reason he came to us barefaced. He wanted us to see that it was him. He wanted us to know. The court spider still had the look of a haunted man, the lines in his face deep set and grim, but he looked even worse now. The circles under his eyes were more sunken, his hair and his beard even more unkempt. I could see the fragility of this man, both his body and his mind. Max approached the court spider carefully. We don't have to go through all of this again, Brendan. Wordlessly, his ghost of a smile never faltering, Brendan raised his hands. Two intricate glass bottles gleamed in the eerie green light. My elixir, Daniel said. Flora elbowed him out of the way. No, my elixirs, both of them. The court spider's shoulders trembled but only once, a mirthless, hollow chuckle. <laughs> you can have them both back. He unstoppered both of the bottles, then tipped them onto the ground. The turbulent waters swirled and frothed as they met, spinning and surging. Within mere seconds, it wasn't a puddle any longer. The pure liquid essence of water combined, divided, combined again, until there was enough to reach past the soles of our shoes, a beach at low tide. I tugged on Max's arm and backed away foolishly as if there was anywhere to run. The water's rising. Everyone get to higher ground. 
except there was no higher ground. We had to improvise. Max and I sped toward the closest of the silky threads and curtains that reached up into the pocket dimension's impossible ceiling, testing it for strength. Tattered and ripped, but sturdy, and kind of sticky, too. Max climbed up first. I followed, the water nearly up to my ankles. Adel pulled what looked like a handful of beans out of one pocket, casting them onto the ground. A beanstalk sprung up instantly, reaching high above, thick enough to climb. I marveled as she clambered up like a squirrel, limbs a blur as she ascended to safety. Daniel clumsily followed suit, with Flora shimmying up the other side. It was him all along, Max shouted. What? I yelled back, my pulse racing, my heart in my throat. The breaking bottles, the steam, all him. It was the court spider. Yeah, okay, I answered, not sure I could grasp what he meant, too focused on grasping our literal lifeline. My brain barely had the power to process the connection with the quartz spider, and I barely had the strength to keep holding on to Max and the great strand we were hanging from. Good thing the fabric or whatever it was happened to be just tacky enough to help keep me suspended. I suspected I knew what these long, sticky, silky strands actually were. I did not want to think about how they were made. I did not want to think about what had made them. Plus, there was the pressing matter of the waters still churning and steadily rising from below. Davina blubbered as she paddled to keep her head above the surface, spun around by the force of the whirlpool. Twin elixirs. Fucking Brendan Shum and his bullshit. Where did he even go? The court spider was already gone. We can't keep this up forever, Max. I kicked at the air, fighting to shimmy up the length of silk. How far up did it go? What would we find at the end? The water keeps coming. The elixirs are interacting with each other. I don't know. Something, different sources maybe, different climates, like ocean currents meeting but more violent and... Leon, look out! Something was pulling me down. I should have been looking down. Wicked acrylic nails dug into my ankle... It was Davina Brillante, practically snarling as she bared her teeth at me. The look in her eyes, the angry splashing. She wasn't trying to save herself. She only wanted to take me down with her. Max's hand clamped like iron around mine, his thighs trying to lock me into place. But the stirring of the waves only added more weight and force to Davina's grip, tugging me ever lower. I kicked, gasped, struggled to hold on. My arms were tired, my ankle burning with pain, the muscles in my legs straining to their limit. I thought Davina would rip it right out of the socket. She roared as she threw out another hand, her full weight dragging on my ankle. Too much? My fingers slipped from Max's grasp. Leon! I fell, hair and skin and clothes immediately soaked in ice-cold water, and still... Davina didn't let go, clawing at me, scrabbling like she meant to use me as a life raft, like I was just a piece of driftwood. How the fuck was I supposed to fight her like this? I choked on a mouthful of water, suffered through the sting when it went up my nose. If I could get a clear shot, swim close enough and touch her by the neck, the face, I could infuse her blood with an overwhelming dose of terror, a fear hex to buy me some time, but would it save my life? Would it save the day? I could still drown. The waves pummeled at my body, threatening to pull me under. Davina grabbed at my hair, my clothes. She wanted me dead. From somewhere above us, Max bellowed his fury, his voice like thunder. And in my head, another voice. Not yet, little one. This isn't where your story ends. Plenty of water fit for a sea dragon. but. Too much, perhaps, for a tiny human. The world roiled and raged around me, the water whirling even harder, hard enough to separate me and Davina, the current pulling her screaming and sputtering away from me. And then it began, the sharp stinging of my skin, as if a million tiny needles were forcing their way into my body all at once. I looked down at myself in horror and screamed. The water, all of it, was flowing 
toward me, as if a sudden depression had appeared in the exact space that my body occupied. I was taking it in through my skin. In order to drain this place and save the others, to save Max, I needed to swallow the sea. And so we drink, Brujo, both you and I. We drink deeply to preserve life, undeserved as it may be. Tears fell streaming from my cheeks. I wailed as I willed more of them to fall, to counter the horrifying quantity of water forcing its way through my skin. Where was it all going? How long until I burst at the seams? Would the agony ever stop? And then, it did. No more pain, no more wetness, only the welcome, tranquil silence of a dead ocean. I stared through my trembling lashes as I tried to focus on the faded, ghoulish stars of this strange, endless sky. I was so light, floating on my back. But how? All the water was gone. My head lolled to the side, falling onto the strong, sturdy cushion that was Max's shoulder. He was carrying me. Somehow, even horizontal with my body full of water and my brain soaked like a sponge, I managed to swoon. My hero, I muttered. He smiled, leaned in, kissed me on the corner of my mouth. Davina sat on the ground with her legs splayed, coughing up water. Daniel whimpered as he shakily descended the beanstalk. Flora climbed down opposite him, slapping at his fingers, antagonizing him the whole way down. And Ada was taking a shortcut, holding something in one hand to slow her fall, floating languidly like a witchier Mary Poppins. It was a giant red flower, her own version of a magical umbrella. Everyone's fine, Max said, mostly. But no sign of the court spider. I groaned, clutching my stomach. Man, fuck the court spider. Fuck him and the ugly horse he rode in on. Max chuckled. My insides were still raw. It was insane. I couldn't have possibly absorbed all that water into my body, and yet it was exactly what had happened. Bakunawa spoke again, his voice reverberating in my skull. I am fool, Brujo. My belly is heavy with the ocean. I must slumber. Thank you, I told Bakunawa, both him and Max all at once. I owe you one. A flare of brilliant color lit up in my mind's eye. Bakunawa chuckled. <laughs> I shall remember that. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. And now, the dragon rumbled, sleep. It was as much a declaration of what he intended to do as it was a subtle suggestion made to my body. My eyes felt heavy, my muscles gone limp. Maybe this was the dragon's way of assimilating all the water and still ensuring that the host, that I, didn't die. My eyelids fell shut. As I drifted into soft, silent sleep, I noticed something strange. Despite almost drowning in the torrent, my clothes were perfectly dry. 20. Max. Leon stared at the ceiling as he whimpered, laid out on one of Silk's buttery black leather sofas. Very popular on busy nights, the preferred lounging spots for the bar's patrons. But after the events with the court spider, the place had understandably cleared out. His hand settled above his belly, rubbing in little circles as his eyes flitted toward me, then away again. Interesting observation. Each time he noticed I was looking at him directly, the mewling got a little louder. Very interesting indeed. Max, he croaked. I think I'm dying. I grimaced as I swished my drink in a little circle, rum on the rocks, because what a night it had been. You're not dying. If you were really dying, you would know. And I would know, too. He clutched a handful of his shirt as he jerked upward as if rocked by a spasm. But it hurts. What does? Your body? 
Your blood? Your ego? He squinted at me in annoyance, his voice reverting to normal. Would it kill you to baby me a little? Geez, I only saved the day after all. Vera swept in between us, a wisp of a woman, but her presence taking up so much space. You did indeed, Leonardo, and what a feat that was. She smashed her palm dramatically against his forehead. Leon yelped as his body bucked upward because that was the only actual pain he'd felt in the past couple of minutes. I tried not to smirk. You see, Leonardo, you're perfectly fine. Your temperature is cooler than usual, but that's only because you've been working with so much water magic. She prodded at his chest and stomach, fingers pressing with surgical clinical curiosity. Leon squirmed and thrashed, yowling as she palpated his internal organs from the outside, or whatever the hell it was the jade spider was actually doing. I clapped a hand over my mouth, the laughter threatening to break. Ah, uh, as I suspected, you've simply absorbed an unusual amount of sorcerous water. To a normal human, that might even be fatal. You see? Leon glared at me accusingly. Potentially fatal, she says. Vera jabbed him between the ribs with her finger, eliciting an especially mournful howl. Two drama queens, a match made in heaven, or my own personal hell. But to you, someone who has presumable familiarity with aquamancy, why, this is simply a minor setback. I expect you'll be urinating several times an hour, you know, as your body rids itself of the excess fluid. Leon blinked, forehead already creasing with worry. Uh, but uh, for how long? Vera inspected her nails. Oh, a few days, give or take. What? Leon swung his legs across the couch, finally finding a reason to sit up straight. Actual days of constantly pissing? Oh, I whispered, setting my drink down. Poor little piss baby. I memorized the look of pure offended horror on Leon's face, knowing I'd be able to enjoy it for days on end, or as long as it took him to eliminate his uh, <laughs> excess fluid. I didn't really relish his suffering, though. Hey, he knew I was more than happy to help. Don't worry about it so much. I sat next to him on the sofa, slinging one reassuring arm across his shoulders. This clothes he still smelled like seawater, a day at the beach. I can always hold it for you. Leon's glower slashed my soul to ribbons, if looks could kill. The others who'd been trapped in the webbed dimension, Daniel Lyon, Edelweiss, Flora Devere, even Divina Brillante, had reappeared in silk along with me and Leon, just as soon as Vera's spell expired. Without Leon's effort, without Bakunawa, the sea dragon, we might have drowned in there. Returning with the waters intact would have drowned everyone in silk, too. But no trace of the quartz spider. Still, Vera was nothing if not prepared. A squad of masks already waiting with her to sort out the web of utter chaos we had all been entangled in. Shocking that the masks decided in our favor at all. They reminded Flora that her tiny miscommunication about the thousand or was it actually a hundred bottles of perfume, would result in a public relations scandal for her company that straddled both the magical and the mundane world. I wasn't a lawyer, but it would probably create problems for her in other areas, too. She backed down quickly after that, but not before throwing daggered looks at me, and Leon, and the succulents people. Daniel Lyon had to walk away empty-handed, which meant that we wouldn't be paid our finder's fee either. Adel was chill about the whole thing once again, only there for the ride. Leon and I would have been more disappointed, except that we did walk away with our lives and our limbs intact. To her credit, Vera did say that she'd make sure our next job was extra juicy, which could mean anything, really. It wasn't often that I could look forward to something and at once experience a deep and abiding dread. That left a waterlogged Divina Brillante who hissed, kicked, and spat as the masks led her away. And by that I meant they teleported her straight out of silk and back to wherever they held people for questioning. The last look she gave me was one of venomous hatred. The last look I gave her, a satisfied smile. But again, that still left the court spider at large. Maybe his former sister spider had some answers. Vera, that place you threw us into, that pocket dimension... Where was that exactly? 
How? She wrinkled her nose, looking at me down the length of it. You have your secrets, gentlemen, and I have mine. Like your dragons, eh, witch boy? Leon's eyes flitted away, his gaze falling on the floor, his lips pursed. Aw, I wrapped my arm around his waist, hugging him tight, trying to squeeze all the guilt out of him. Vera sighed. But we all have our reasons, yes. You would find out eventually. May as well hear it from me now. I called in a favor from a patron entity. I suppose you might call her a matron, then? Like I said, Leonardo has his dragons. Some of us spiders have our own packs and bargains. My lips parted, but I found I had nothing to say, my mind still racing through the many options. Leon asked for us both. Is she a goddess, Vera? Not in the exact sense of the word, no. But with what she's amassed in the modern world, one that trades in knowledge and information, she may as well be. She leaned in closer, a greenish wisp of smoke escaping from her mouth as she pressed a finger against her lips. I am devoted to Arachne, our mother spider. She is a huge part of why I know as much as I do. The mother has her brood secreted all over the world, looking in their cobwebs, skulking in their darkest corners, watching, waiting, listening. I mean actual spiders, of course, eight legs and all. Hot damn, the entities really did live among us. And when we, her devotees, the ones with two legs, tell her things that may please her, we are rewarded in turn. So, to protect my ability to continue trading in secrets, I delivered you to a pocket dimension that resembles her own, to let you duke it out in a way that wouldn't end up destroying our beloved bar. You do understand, don't you, gentlemen? You aren't angry with old Auntie Vera, are you? Not at all, Leon said, again answering for us both. All's well that ends well, mostly. I really think I, uh, need to pee, though. Vera raised her eyebrows, her eyes widening. Ah, how exciting! And so it begins. She strode off, perhaps in search of a drink. It was spiders, Leon told me, his gaze on mine and then unfocusing like he was looking through my head. Spiders all along. Everywhere. Don't let it creep you out too much. I pressed my forehead against his. So you're okay, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Mostly uh, squishy and bloated. I kissed him, a quick one, short and sweet. I like squishy and bloated. We can fix. Leon grinned as he swept his hair out of his eyes. I'm gonna go see what's up at the bar. No more drinks for me, though. Possibly forever. Cool. Okay, I'm just gonna step out for a breather. I nodded at the bouncer, pushing past the front door. I gathered my jacket closer around me as the cool of night settled on my skin. We had had a hell of a night, and I needed the space to decompress. After the risk of almost drowning, I very much appreciated the freedom of breathing, too. I groaned as I sat down on the sidewalk. Somehow I hadn't noticed that I'd just sat myself next to Edelweiss, agriculturist extraordinaire. Tunnel vision, maybe the single-mindedness of fight and flight survival. Weird how the adrenaline of magical battle could linger. She gave me her same toothy, witchy grin, the tips of her teeth tinged blood red, just like her fingers. Adel held up her hands. Back in the prime hells, we had to work with crimson plants, you know. Beautiful crimson gardens, deadly as heck, too. I'm sorry. I really didn't mean to stare. This was odd, but not unpleasant, being all friendly with one half of the partnership that tried to screw us. Despite technically being a demon, Adel really was the nicer half of succulents. A lot nicer. Oh, it's fine. I like it up here. The fresh air, all these fancy earth plants I never got to really study. Very strange that they're all green. I smiled, her story resonating for me, reminding me of Leon and how he had set down roots in Dos Lunas himself. A strange new world, one that he was happy to conquer. 
New home, new workplace, she continued. And a new name, too. I thought it was appropriate. My true name is actually Hagatha. Risky telling people that sort of thing, but you're a nice boy. You won't use it against me. I smiled harder when she patted me on the back of the hand, this initially terrifying but grandmotherly demon gardener. I think Hagatha is a lovely name, uh, but it's your choice, of course. Edelweiss is cool, too. Oh, yes. I really like the name Edelweiss. <laughs> she placed her hands under her chin like a model, grinning. It uh, softens me, humanizes me. I'm really glad I didn't go with my second choice, which was a uh, hazelnut. I wrinkled my nose. Uh, good first choice, then. Well, I'm glad you think so. She reached into a robe, then offered me her open hand. Care for a snack? My heart leapt up my throat. A pair of evil olives stared up at me from her palm, shiny and black and ripe with knowledge. Maybe I shouldn't have been too hasty about finding hags all that friendly. <laughs> you should see your face. There are only regular olives. Ado slapped her thigh, cackling as she popped one in her mouth. Just a little bit of hag humor. Oh, Vera trilled. We do like to have a little bit of fun. Maybe I never noticed before, but the jade spider had a talent for sashaying into the conversation. It didn't hurt that she was clutching a pair of unusual cocktail glasses, possibly meant for me and my new friend, Hagatha. Here, we're trying something new for Silk. Have a taste and tell us what you think. Before anything, I wanted to have a closer look, too. The cocktail was bright red, its glass resembling a bottle, with a slender neck that tapered to a wide base, very much like the conical flasks they used in laboratories. The glass was cool to the touch, but the cocktails themselves roiled and bubbled, as if made with especially effervescent soda water. Or maybe champagne? I lifted my glass at Vera. So are uh, these like magical mimosas? She chuckled. <laughs> Close enough. We want to do honor our arcane roots, especially the alchemical traditions. Charming, is it not? It reminds me of a potion one might acquire from a master brewer, or, you know, wherever fine potions are sold. Delightful, Adel said, inspecting the bottle as she held it up to the light. Thank you, madam. It looks delicious. She lifted the bottle to her lips and tipped the whole thing down the hatch, never questioning whether the jade spider might be offering us a sleeping draft or some tasty-looking toxin. Adel was a woman who wasn't afraid of being poisoned because she probably knew how to make antidotes, and even stronger poisons, too. I peered at my bottle, shrugged, then tilted it at Vera again. Bottoms up. Not that I needed any help getting it down. The stuff was delicious. The faint blush of raspberry, a quiet sweetness, and there, among the fizz of the bubbles, the tang of a fruity liquor base. Before I knew it, I'd finished the entire thing. My throat tickled, a party in my stomach. Adel turned her bottle upside down, ensuring she had drained every last drop. Absolutely delicious. This is incredible, Vera. It goes down so smooth, too, almost like a soft drink. She flipped her hair. To be perfectly honest, we did have an alchemist on hand to help with the formulation, and no, it's only designed to taste that way. Expect a prompt betrayal within the next ten minutes or so. The thing definitely has a kick. We're still workshopping the name, but for now we're thinking of calling it Bloody Murder. Ah, yes. Adel nodded wisely. Very good name. I peered into the bottle and smacked my lips. That really was good, though. What's in it, anyway? Vera crossed her arms. Well, I tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I dragged the back of my hand across my mouth and chuckled. Vera never faltered. You know, I'm not joking. Adel reached for my empty bottle. I shrugged and handed it over. She glanced between the two of them, then looked up at Vera. Do you know what's interesting? When you walked out here, clutching both of these beverages, you very much resembled that fellow with the watery bottles. She means the court spider, I explained to Vera. 
Funny coincidence, that. He was holding both of the aqueous elixirs. Well, shortly before he dumped them out into your pocket dimension. I just don't get it. Why would he follow us all the way in there just to pour out the elixirs? He's had plenty of opportunities to strike. Hmm. Perhaps he has other designs for them and thought he'd eliminate both you and the elixirs in one fell swoop. The bottles are enchanted, after all, potentially useful in other forms of magic. Remember, the court spider only ever seems interested in time magic these days. Vera reached for one of the two empty bottles. Adel, if you'd be so kind, please hold your bottle up for me. Adel squinted, seeing something I hadn't quite made out yet. Ah, yes, I believe I can see where you're going with this. Vera turned the glass she was holding upside down, pressing the mouths of the two bottles together, forming a single, familiar structure. A shiver ran down my spine. An hourglass, I breathed. This entire time, Brendan Shom was trying to build his own enchanted hourglass. All he needed now was more quickening sand. With the right tools in hand, his time magic could be taken to even more powerful and destructive heights. What did the court spider have in store for Dos Lunas? 21. Leon. My mouth fell open wider and wider as Max helped me piece the events at Silk back together. Our time in the web dimension had been such a blur, and the thing with Bakunawa drinking all that water didn't help. Totally scrambled my brain parts. Utter chaos. At least I'd stopped peeing so damn much. And no word from Bakunawa yet, apparently still slumbering somewhere in the depths of my psyche. But sometimes, no news was good news. What we'd thought of as anomalies, the breaking bottles at the warehouse, the steam at the docks, we hadn't been wrong about that. Where we were totally thrown off, though, was the presumed involvement of an aquamancer and a pyromancer when no water or fire magic had even been involved. Everything was actually another manifestation of time magic, another manifestation of the quartz spider's growing arcane might. These were the memories of water, awakened by the ebb and flow of chronomancy, of all things. Max had figured it out. Only he was trying to tell me while dangling from what was essentially a strand of spider silk. Like an action hero, but like, you know, a super smart one. I might have been too distracted hanging on for dear life to listen to him at the time, but wow, brains and brawn in one package and, oh, that face, how could I resist him? The court spider simply told the water that it had once flowed in rage and turbulence, coursing and whirling so violently that the bottles stood no chance. The steam at the docks? Same thing, reminding the lapping waves that they had once lived in this world as vapor, scalding hot vapor, no less. And again with that business when we finally ran into him again, Max said. Two stolen elixirs, fuck's sake. Honestly, I'm only relieved that Brendan Shum guy didn't do much worse. Although, with the hourglass, it seems like he's planning much worse. I nodded. I wish I could say what was up with him. He had multiple solid opportunities to kill us outright. Some broken glass in the face sucks, and so does a third-degree burn from steam, but he could have thrown down a time distortion field, trapped us outright. Why bother with the theatrics? Who knows, really. Looking back, they felt more like warnings than earnest attacks. Those steam burns aren't a joke by any stretch. Max sighed. <sighs> Maybe he likes us. Maybe he wants to be caught. I sighed in return. <sighs> Maybe. Or maybe he's trying to show us a sign. I just wish we could see what it was exactly. I wish I could see it all. Max grunted. Nice try. The blindfold stays on. I told you it's supposed to be a surprise. The car slowed to a halt as he gently hit the brakes. Another traffic light, maybe? I grumbled under my breath, saying nothing in particular, but steadily getting more impatient. It smelled nice, at least. Always smelled nice in there. That new car smell blended with hints of Max's own beautifully manly fragrance. Didn't help make me any less antsy. We'd been in the car for 20 minutes, at least. Was Max just driving me around in circles? 
Were poor Johnny and Roscoe and Tina hanging up streamer somewhere, preparing a surprise party for, well, for who knew what exactly? And damn, was I supposed to dress all nice for something? Max, I barked. Was I supposed to dress nice? I swear, if you're taking me somewhere swanky and all I have on is a denim jacket, absolutely not. Wherever it is we're going, I promise it's not nearly as pretentious as divinity. I shrugged. I mean, it wasn't that pretentious. You got to wear that ridiculous thing that you... The car came to an abrupt stop. I grunted as the force bumped me forward, then again when Max's hand shot out to nudge me back against the car seat. Hey, would you look at that? We're here. The engine turned over. I stumbled as Max guided me out of the passenger seat, a hand on my hip. Very chivalrous, very gentlemanly, but I was about a minute away from shoving him off me and ripping off the blindfold. Not that I didn't like surprises, they were cool, but this was taking forever. We had to go up an elevator, for one thing, the ringing silence of it adding to how stifling the blindfold was. A door opened. We stepped into somewhere nice and warm that smelled clean and yet somehow also delicious? A restaurant? Way too quiet for a restaurant, though. Another door clicked open, slid to my left. Glass this time, heavy. A patio? Strong hands set me in place on the ground of wherever the hell we were, and those same strong hands untied my blindfold. I blinked hard, my eyes adjusting to the darkness of night, to the hanging garlands of lights strewn around us, and to the many, many more lights of the city scattered out before us. But it's your balcony, I muttered. Only it's, well, different. I bit my tongue, trying my very hardest not to look so damn impressed, but this was so romantic, too damn romantic. We came here sometimes to chill, to cool down with drinks and enjoy some music, maybe take in the sun, if it was nice out. The simple patio furniture suddenly looked classier with that clean white tablecloth, the chairs similarly dressed. And again, did I mention the lights? Wrapped around the railings, nestled among the plants. A cool night overlooking Dos Lunas, warmed by so very many lights. If I squinted enough, up here in the high darkness, I can imagine us nestled among the stars. I had a sneaking suspicion that Max had done that on purpose. He wrapped an arm around my shoulder, squeezed with his hand. We decorated it special just for you. What's the occasion? I asked, rubbing my cheek, wishing I could stave off the flattered, flustered blush I knew was forming there. Why special? He pressed a kiss against my cheek, making my skin blaze even warmer. You kind of saved the day. Again. Pretty dangerous stuff we keep running into. But you and your dragons. Honestly, I can't believe you felt self-conscious about them enough to keep your pact a secret. I chuckled nervously. <laughs> what? But we didn't save the day, not permanently at least. The court spider is still out there. We'll find him, Max said, his eyes steely with unwavering confidence. And then we'll kick his ass. It'll be amazing. But right now, let's just have a little fun, you and me. A man stepped onto the balcony from the apartment, handsome and smartly dressed in white. He flashed us a charming smile and swept his arm toward the table. If the gentlemen would like to take their seats. Still literally dazzled by the lights, I followed as Max led us to the table. Simply appointed, no major frills, just the tablecloth with stylish modern silverware a goblet for water, another for wine, cute little centerpiece too, tiny little flowers on dark green leaves, their petals white and waxy in their scent. Familiar, nostalgic. Jasmine, we had these everywhere back home in the Philippines. Had I ever told him or did Max look it up on his own? I leaned in to take a whiff, breathed in the sweetness and the memories, as if Max could make me blush any harder. The waiter held my chair for me, then pushed it in as I sat down, like a lady. <laughs> Snazzy. I knew it wasn't polite, but I stared up into his face as he assumed his post precisely between the two of us, an arm tucked behind his back. I squinted. Wait a minute, don't I know you from somewhere? He only smiled and bowed his head. I believe I am wanted in the kitchen. Allow me to fetch the first of your courses. In the meantime... Please enjoy some freshly baked bread. There it was again. Something about his accent was vaguely... Well, I couldn't place it exactly. 
European? I craned my neck as he re-entered Max's apartment, trying to make out the kitchen from where I was sitting. Dude, how much are you paying these people? My stomach grumbled as I reached for the bread basket, my hands automatically tearing one of the slices in half. I reached for the closest of the dips, something dark and chunky. Hold up, is that the stuff I liked back at Divinity? That's a uh, tapenada, isn't it? I glanced around the balcony, back toward the open sliding door, then back at Max. I blinked. My eyes went as wide as my dinner plate. Max, no you didn't. These are the people from Divinity. Haven't they suffered enough? Now they have to be private chefs for our dinner, too? Max tilted his head, staring past me. About uh, six private chefs, actually. They're going all out tonight. Stop bragging! I grabbed the sides of the table and leaned in, lowering my voice to a harsh whisper. This is very sweet, but did you really coerce these poor people into- He held up a hand and smiled. They volunteered, actually. One of them got in touch after the masks cleared them out of Davina's clutches. He was so happy to be rescued. I glowered at him. And by that, I mean he was so happy to be rescued by us, Max stammered. You and me, together, like- Davina actually didn't destroy their passports. Can you imagine? She's in enough trouble as it is anyway. Most of them are booked to fly home next week. Just, um, feels a little awkward, I guess. I popped some of the tapenada into my mouth, savoring the combination of crusty bread and tart olives. It was almost enough to get me to give in and relax. Almost. I reached for my water to wash it down. Don't worry about it. Max reached across the table, his hand closing around the back of mine. They're rested and recuperated, none the worse for wear. Besides, I told them I was seeing this guy who kept whining about not getting a proper dinner date, so, uh, you know. I almost choked on my drink. I grabbed my napkin, dabbed it against my chin. A, a, a date? <laughs> you said a date. This is a date. Now why is it so bad for me to treat the guy I'm seeing to a nice proper dinner? Sorry, the guy you're seeing? I pursed my lips, telling my smile to wait its turn. Oh, so we're seeing each other now, are we? Max raised his hands to his face, framing his fingers over his eye in the shape of a diamond. He winked, and I glowed from the inside. It'd hardly be fair if it was just me seeing you now, would it? <laughs> you're such a dork. I shook my head, thoroughly unable to hide my grin. Cutest fucking dork in Dos Lunas. Well, you know, I did have an ulterior motive. This finder business can get pretty messy. Can't hurt to have some backup. And you know, actually, I think I really do enjoy working with you. Only you. Alone. Exclusively. Is that right? I leveled him with my gaze, curbing my enthusiasm. An exclusive partnership. Max nodded, obviously holding back a smile. If you want, just you and me. I calmly, steadily held my hand out, offering it for him to shake. Then I look forward to maintaining a professional and most profitable relationship with you. Totally professional. He returned my handshake with a grip as loose as his grin, fingers rubbing rough circles along the back of my hand, thumb pressing and massaging powerfully into my palm. He licked his lips, stirring warmth in my nethers. This boy knew exactly what he was doing to me. Most profitable. I pulled my hand back, perfectly happy to play the role of the tease. But I don't like all this talk of you needing backup. I think it's patently clear that you're the sidekick in this situation. He sat up, spine suddenly ramrod straight. Nuh-uh, he fired back, directly channeling the voice of his wounded inner bad boy. This is supposed to be an equal thing, equal partnership. And I agree, I said, tapping my glass with the edge of my fingernail. I do think I should get a bigger cut of the proceeds, since you know, I do most of the heavy lifting. I pay for all the meals... And the gas for your car, too. None of that is true. Max's hands covered his face in a defiant X. He slashed his arms emphatically to his sides. None of it. 
especially the gas part. I leaned my arm back on my chair, almost tempted to kick my feet up on the table. And since I have majority control of this, you know, whatever this is, I get to name it too. We are not under any circumstances calling it Swindle Unlimited. The base of Max's neck went as red as a tomato. God, I loved ripping into him like this, pushing every last one of his soft, vulnerable buttons. He was such an easy and impressionable target, too. He wagged his finger at me as he heard my ridiculous demands, each one obviously an exaggerated joke. Maybe some part of him really enjoyed getting riled up. My phone buzzed in my pocket. Max's anger rushed out of him as he reached into his own pocket. I didn't need two guesses to know who the message was from. I pulled out my phone and scanned the screen quickly. We'd just finished one job for the Jade Spider, albeit somewhat sloppily, and here she was proposing another one. That burning electrical sensation of excitement in my spine tingled even as I put my phone away. A new job, a new relic, a new adventure, or misadventure. Sure, our last one had been an absolute clusterfuck, but... At least we made it out with our lives intact. I nodded at Max as he stuffed his phone back in his pocket, his eyes alight with a familiar fire, the same excitement I sometimes caught in my own eyes in the mirror. He cleared his throat. So, new mission from the Jade Spider. I nodded. Same. Max shifted in his seat, cracked the knuckles of one hand. Looks intriguing. Oh, for sure. I reached for another piece of bread. We can relax for now, talk about it after dinner. No, after dessert? He smiled, grabbing some bread for himself. Whatever you want, partner. Max could flirt and divert all he wanted. Both his words and his body language clearly spelled that he longed for much more than just a professional collaboration. But he'd figure that out on his own. Unless I got impatient and spelled it out for him, of course. We talked and laughed as if we had all the time in the world. And we didn't, even if it felt that way. The pair of us overlooking the stars twinkling in the concrete sky of Dos Lunas. We ate, we drank, we toasted our new partnership. Dinner was fabulous, even though it was clear that both of us were itching to look closer into the Jade Spider's new mission. As different as we were, Max and I still had similar appetites, risk and reward quest and consequence. No matter how dangerous things could get, my mind couldn't unfocus on the potential of it all. How fun the ride would be. Just me, my dragons, and Maximilian Drake. This has been Elixir of Strife, Stolen Hearts Book 2, written by Nasri Noor, narrated by John Solo. Copyright 2023 by Nasri Noor. Production copyright by Nasri Noor. Ta da! Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.